All right, guys, I want to thank today's sponsor, Element. I'm having fun with ads now instead of just trying to like read through all the talking points and so forth. But there's a talking point here I have to read through. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything that you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt and no sugar. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. I've had and have been in the habit of drinking a half a pack before every leg training session and all my cramping issues that I had went away because I've always had cramping issues on heavy leg days and leg days especially. Head into our description box and click the link that's there for Element or if you're listening to the audio of this, it's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash table talk. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH First. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code tabletalk10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. Find the fucking thing, right? Because <laughs> it's a strap, like all other straps. And it, I know it's in a corner somewhere. Yeah. Nah, I got it there. Was well, like, well, not there yet, but it's gonna go there. <laughs> I like so the we're rules. live. Yep. All right, guys. I got Anthony Oliveira and Dave Hoff back. There's no need for introductions. We're just gonna continue the conversation that we're having run it. before we got on. So we uh, <laughs> we are talking about the lockers that we put in here to store shit. So basically, that's all they do is store shit. And but before that, Dave was talking about wanting to bring back the denim bench shirt. So I want to jump off with that. Yeah, because I'm very intrigued. I don't. So like, I went in my garage and you know people are like i need a bench shirt everybody always needs another fucking bench shirt so i went in my garage and you know everybody you know any old power lifter that's been around more than 10 years has a garage full of you know power lifting gear so I was like i think i got some shirts in there so i'm i'm in there looking around and i'm pulling shirts up i'm like when the, where the fuck's this thing been like i'm finding <laughs> shirts that i used to use from like 2008 you know like pre pre like phenom stuff and i'm like well I guess we'll try these. So I start, I got a big handful of them out and I took them in the gym and started slapping them on some people. And then I started like thinking, uh, like there seems to be so much finick shit with, with powerlifting shirts today. Like, Oh, the shirt's too big. The shirt's too small. You know, like, and I remember, um, we were talking about Karen, Karen's extreme. Mm -hmm. Like she was a lady here in Ohio that, uh, made, made denim bench primarily for a lot of people at West side. She, we, that mm -hmm. was like our go-to. If you came to West side, the first thing you did is they Louie yeah. would drive you over to Karen's or, and you'd get fitted for a bench shirt. So there's like, uh, there's a lot of reasons why everybody at West side had big benches we were always kind of on the, you know, uh, cutting edge of the next thing. And at the time, the, they were denim bench shirts and primarily the ones Karen would make. 
And uh, I remember when I went in there, I got fitted for one. I'm, I think I was 14, you know, 14 or 15. And and back, you know, the denim bed shirts, they weren't like, you know, phenoms today where you had to, like, get help in them. You literally just kind of pulled them on. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was, in, uh, long story short, I was looking in my garage, and I was like, I think I'm going to have to bring these things back. I think there's, like, the denim bed shirts, because so many people, like, started in them, like, or when I kind of first started. It's like, that's kind of a, that's like, doesn't exist anymore today. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there's some kind of, like, root and strength to that. So, yeah, I think we're, I was actually going to put him in one today. I'm excited about it. I Listen, this dude tells me to do something, I'm going to fucking do it. I don't care. You know what I mean? And I've, I've heard horror stories about the denim shirts, and but, like, he's never steered me wrong, so I'll try it. And to me, it's like, I remember when I was at Westside and, um, in the morning, and, uh, like, Coker was, like, obsessed with the Ray Jack shirts, and he made me get in one, and... Lou told me that story, but was it Halpert that was in a bench shirt for, or Fry that was in a bench shirt for like 23 weeks yeah. in a row or something crazy. Yeah. So he put me in a, a rage for, it was like eight weeks in a row, trying to touch. Every week, going and try and touch, try and touch, try and touch. And I finally got one. I wore it for one meet. Didn't PR. Got a bench in. Didn't PR. Said, fuck this. Went to a Phenom. And it was much easier the next meet in the Phenom. So like him saying that going from the denim and learning something difficult to to get it was more it's out like it. It it's makes like, sense. It, I think it just develops strength in a different way. I think the pressures are different. It, like it's a more of a leverage shirt, you know. Like um, when you when you're putting uh, phenoms on, it's it's like a real strict groove. Like you know, like denim's dudes are like dumping them on their belt. You know, mm-hmm. it's just like it, it, Crawford would be a, a good one to compare that to, where you just come kind of like dump it in on your belly and leverage lift it. So um, I think it teaches a lot of stuff that are just kind of like missed in shirts today. Um, if I'm if I'm to guess, thinking through this, is because the shirts got the denim shirts got crazy after like France and Karen, and then and it was layers. Then it became like dog collars were being sewn in. Dude, the they collars. were putting lampshade material. In. Yeah, so I mean that's when it got <laughs> crazy. But before that, if I'm to guess, what I think that you're talking about is. I remember I couldn't get a France single ploy, whatever it was, the ones that stretched a little bit better, kind of like the Karen, the same thing. I couldn't get them to work for shit. And there was a meet that Kenny and Joe McCoy, I missed my opener and it was 585 or whatever was the next one. And I remember them saying, just don't do shit until we tell you to do it. Just do exactly what we fucking say. And I was so mad and frustrated yeah. because the fucking shirts are make you mad and frustrated. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. And I remember I took it out and then Joe saying, just hold it there. Don't do shit. Just fucking hold it. And I held it for way longer than what I normally would. You know, normally just, you know, I fuck, I, I held it and I hear him hold, hold. And then Kenny or some one of them said, now kick your elbows out. Yeah. Right. Weird. And then out. And then I felt the chest panel pull. Okay. Yeah. And then they said, "Now tuck." And then it came down in there and and bring it down under control. Right. So I think it taught you know to break out, tuck to feel the shirt and to eccentrically learn how to lower it and think what's going on. I think a lot of cool things that denim did is the grooves weren't like super hard to learn. They were really, you could, you could move in a groove. It wasn't like a Rage X where it feels like you're on a fishing line. Mm-hmm. You know, that's kind of like, it feels like Rage X to me always felt like they had a piece of fucking fishing line around the back of my tricep, you know? And uh, if you got rid of it, you were dumping it. And if, you know, if you were a little too, too forward or backwards, you couldn't touch anything with them. Or if, the, you know, if you gained a pound of body weight, Rage X's to me were always super finicky. And I always didn't see a lot of, you know, I mean, Ryan, I think Canelli benched 9, 903 or 909 in a, in a Rage X, but he switched to Phenom after that. But Rage X is, from my, from my perspective, they, they always work for smaller guys, like dudes under 242 pounds. Like Grandic made him work a lot when he was a 242. He's like one of the first guys to bench 800 in a full power meet. But um, outside of Rage X is like, um, at that time it was, you know, they were – we were getting out of those denim shirts into like rage X's and shortly after that phenoms, because that's kind of like when Canelli, cause even Canelli and even Mendelssohn. So like, if you look at all the, all the really great benchers, Canelli, he benched 800 and they all started in denim shirts. I mean, it was just more, I think it was, it's not like they chose to do that. I think those, they was just at the time. That's just what the best thing was. 
Yeah. And they got really proficient at those things. And then like, at, you know, cuts and, and plies and types of material started changing. But, um, you know, like I said, you know, Mendelssohn, he benched 1,008 in those black Inzer denims. So Inzer had some really great denims coming up. Like, uh, he, like I said, uh, Mendelssohn did. He, he's kind of like an outlier. That guy is probably one of the strongest humans on the planet um, from his 716 raw bench. You know, um, I remember he told me, I was like, dude, why didn't you take more? And he's like, because they only paid me for one. <laughs> like, like it, it was like this meet, this raw bench meet. If you ever watch that crazy raw bench meet on uh, YouTube, um, uh, he has this big, this big IFBB pro bodybuilder. Yeah. seems Mo handing out to him, and it was one of his good buddies. So he had this big jack dude handing out to him, and uh, he blistered seven sixteen raw. And I was like, I, like I said, I said, why didn't you take any more? And I guess the, the, to win money at the meet, you if you bench the world record, they would give you money, but if that was it. You only got paid one time. Yeah, so, so you didn't get paid per world record. Correct. Yeah. And I, 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 I've actually seen the video. I, I asked him, I was like, what do you think you could have benched raw? And he's like, oh, he's like, I did seven fifty, seven fifty five off a of one board. He flipped around, and showed me him benching seven fifty five raw off one board. So, I think Mendelssohn is probably one of those ones that. Uh, could have done a whole lot more, uh, but that's yeah. he neither here nor there. But back to the denim bench shirt, like he went from a black Inzer denim, then he was in rages, benched a thousand. I think he benched a, a oh, he did a thousand eight in the the Inzer denims, and then he switched to phenoms, and he benched like ten twenty fours and the ten thirty ten thirty sixes and stuff like that. And then if you flip back to Kennelly, who was another one, he started in like Inzer. Uh, denims, and then he was in the Rage X's around the, you know, I want to say this was around 04, 05, 06, maybe, something like that, and then then all of a sudden that dude switches to those Phenoms, and then he went from 950, and then that, and then he's out in the Ukraine hitting 1036 back when, like, 900 was unheard of, so I just, looking back at some of those things, I was like, what made these dudes jump? Like, get in these other shirts. Obviously, these other shirts are really good in their own right, but, like, what made them switch to that and then all of a sudden have this gigantic just jump and it's and you know all, all fingers kind of pointed back to a denim bench shirt so. i think I, if i'm understanding what you're saying in the squat world you learn how to use brace before you can really figure yeah. the suit out right almost, so there's like a in like a gateway like an in-between correct mm -hmm. and now the in-between with the shirt's not there so the question would correct. be what are the guys missing now in what you see with them without having that gateway. They're, they're gaining options, I think, is what it is. So I'm sitting here thinking, I'm listening to this, right? So you always say, like, part of the thing with Westside was, like, there was no other option, so you had to make it work. You yeah. couldn't, like, right? And so that made you have to figure certain shit out. Like, right now, it's like, you can get on the internet, I can get... Uh, you know, I can get a used metal shirt. I could get a custom Titan shirt. I could get one of those other weird rubber band things. I can get a Inzer thing. I could, whatever. Back then, it's like... Here's your denim bench shirt. Figure it the fuck out. And then as it progressed, right, if I'm catching you right, like yeah. they progressed. So it's like they had to learn how to be good with that because there wasn't any other options. Correct. And now we Is can just... Is it a technique thing? A we strength can just thing or both? Well, you know? I think it's a little bit of everything. And when you... And I think it's time in the shirt. Like I was telling you, I have my I have the shirt out in the car when we're done. I'll, I'll bring it in and show it to you. But it's it's my very first bench shirt. I, I remember I remember that it was my I did a Circleville bench press meet in Circleville. I benched four twenty five, or that was the first lift I ever did in it. And the last lift was eight twenty five. So I went from four twenty five to eight twenty five in the same bench press shirt. I didn't get a new one in between. I hit every number. I wrote because I remember like when after every meet, me and Bob would set the shirt down and I'd write the new number in it, like as if it was my own board because it wasn't yeah, you know yeah, yeah so like i that was kind of like my motivation i'd want to that was like changing the board for me at Westside until the the numbers became the actual board so um so long story short i i went 425 i think when when karen fit me for that shirt i was like 215 pounds you know what i mean mm -hmm. and i started benching through it and, I, and as you get stronger you grow and as you lift weights and you spend time on things you grow and you put muscle on you put size on you 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 you, you, you gain strength um and you know after i don't know let's think it's maybe maybe five or six years of benching in the same shirt making slow progress you know that all of a sudden there's 825 at the bottom and then i'm up i think i was 257 pounds so the shirt's tighter too correct so it's like as you grow the shirt kind of like throws you a bone you know you don't have to you don't have to get a new shirt and get it new sized that's what that's one thing i mm -hmm. liked about the denim shirt as you grew you, you you strength came with it you know 
and you, you, you started in, and you had to be proficient. I think that's one of the things that really made me a good bench presser, like as far as like technique, like where to drop a bar, like, or just to know, like when it gets to a spot, you got to be patient. Um, I think those just starting off in something like denim is what really made me a really good bench presser. And just, I just think you guys are making a real good point. I think back on it because you're talking about the options and when <clears throat> we were selling metal, that was, and we had the sponsors, that's all they could use. Yeah. Right. So there was no options. And none of their totals went down. They all went up, but they had to learn how to tailor what, so they had one piece. Now, sometimes they tailored the fuck out of it. Right? Jeremy Frey. Yeah, I mean, they tailored the shit out of it. So it wasn't, maybe the only the torso is the same. Right, yeah. But because they had, oh, you ha here's what you have, you have to make it work. Here's the people you can send it to for alterations. <clears throat> but they weren't allowed to jump to this brand, jump to this brand, jump to this brand. Yeah. And then they end up, that's what I think happens. They, they, they get mad and, and they then quit. think the answer is in another <laughs> shirt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, that is true. And it's, it's not, it's not brand specific because if you look through Brian Carroll's career, he was sponsored by everybody at one point. And every time he went with a different brand, he got PRs, but he figured out how to, you know, alter yeah. the shit out of everything that he was in with that and was smart enough to know. The answer is in what I have here. Let's figure out how to make it work. Survivor yeah, day. it's introspective. Yeah. It's like, it's not the shirt's fault. It's like, okay, well, this is what I have. I'm going to figure it out and do the thing, do what you got to do to make it work. And I think like what you said, like back then there just wasn't options. So you had to make these things work. Well, and what I, I'm thinking that you're saying though, too, though, if, if, the, if the gear's too gangster, there's a gap. Yes. Like, yeah. what are you going to do? It's kind of like you yeah. get people that, I'll give you another thing. So, uh, bone, building bone density. Like, you get people and you put them in these tight-ass fucking poly shirts or something like that, and you, you, you opal that you're just going to need some more weight to touch, and they put quarters on, plates on. Before you know it, you have this dude who can't bench 600, and you're trying to give him 700 just to get him to touch a one board, you know, and all it's figuring the shirt out, and it's like, but... This person didn't have any years prior to that of uh, building bone. I think mm -hmm. that's why you see a lot of broken. I mean, I, you've always seen broken arms and shit like that. But like, you know, in the last five, you know, 10 years, I've seen a lot more than I usually have ever seen. Like if I think back, um, I think, you know, specifically talking about like a denim shirt, I think since it's such that if I could describe it as. uh I don't want to call it dull, but it's like very direct pressure. And I think over time, something that's like, I guess the feel of it is, it always feels like it's on you where like, if I put a, like a phenom on or some of these poly shirts, it feels springy, you know, like you come, you see people come down, they're all bouncing like this in the denim, in a denim shirt, you, it wasn't real, a lot of that stuff, but so <clears throat> I think things like denim bench shirts, um, and pr and if I don't even want to say sh denim shirts, if you just say somebody that you know starting out, you don't put them in tight ass shirts. And I think yeah. denims they just weren't super tight shirts; they weren't fitted to be super tight. And I think it gave you room to grow, room to room to handle weight. And I think that's missed today. You know, people they just put a shirt on and they keep trying to throw weight on to get to this number they want to do, rather than just okay, you haven't benched three hundred. We're going to do three. You, know, you just go through and hit all the numbers. I, you know, some of the other podcasts talking like you got to conquer. You know, you got to conquer land on your way through. You know, mm -hmm. conquest. You just don't. You just don't run through, and not conquer anything because. If you've conquered this number, but nothing behind you, you have no like base or grounds to continue forward. And Especially that, in multiply, because you can yeah. accidentally do something cool once. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're like, now your ego's you, in you the game. Benched seven, <sighs> like you tried to bench seven hundred ten times, and you got yeah. it on the tenth and one, killed it, and and you're like, Broop, and the gear did it, like you did it yeah, perfect, yeah. so it helped you. And then it's like, all right, well, sick. Now what happens? Because you never bench six ten. So yeah. now you have to open with 700 and you're just going to bomb out of meats forever. Well, the, the, the question back day. there is how do you manage your training from them? Because what I've seen it's such a big gap. is they just start missing 90% of every time they put the shirt <laughs> the, on. Everything gets, everything revolves around that one instance. So yeah. That one, you, you don't look at, so your training up to that instance was like one, was like one thing or you were, you were like down a tier, you know what I mean? Yeah. You had a really good training session in this lower tier of training and then you hit this big number. And instead of you just being, Hey, that was just a great day. All the planets aligned, you know, everything was clicking that day.
rather than taking that mentality and then just going back to like, see, I base a lot of stuff off like second attempts, not really third attempts, because mm-hmm. second attempts will kind of like really tell you where you're at, like, you know, because third attempts, that's the most you've ever done. And usually those the results, not typical, you know, you have to have the best of everything to really get the, yeah. to get a PR. So, um, yeah, I just think people lose sight of that sometimes they well, i think with shirts it's a huge thing and i and i especially now you know if, if you go with a band shirt it happens more frequently so leave the band shirt out but the band shirt makes that happens a lot they'll have one day where it's like oh shit and it's 200 pounds more well it's a it's a to me it's like this like you had this make-believe moment he, something he said to me was um one time was like you you haven't you haven't done that you've done this number before but you haven't done it yet today so you have to like do everything right leading up to it. So don't take all these other jumps for granted, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, and it's, it's easier for me with a squat because I'm better at that. But it's like that last warm up with no knee wraps, 875. Like I have to take that serious because I haven't done it yet today. Because it doesn't seem like shit to me in my brain, but it's it's a lot of weight. It can still fuck me up. So and then, you know, 975, like last warm up in knee wraps right before my opener, like I haven't done it yet today. And so if you have this like inflated thought of what you could do, if I went and had some crazy meet where I like accidentally squatted 1175 and then you're forgetting about all of the stuff in between there, you're just going to fuck yourself up constantly because there's that huge. How do you back it off a meet though? So say you have that meet and now you're 12 weeks out of the meet. Every day, every heavy day needs to be traded just well, like what well, you just I've said. D- well, I've done that before where I've had the big meat. Yeah. Like I went 23, 64, 25, fucked myself up a little bit in training and totaled like 23, 20 or something like that. I went backwards. And then, so what I started doing with my meats, what the thing that made me successful recently was instead of chasing the best I ever did, I started chasing, you said it on, a, on an Instagram post, I think, I started chasing like what to do better than I did the last time. So it's like, fuck the 2,500 pound total, the 2,510 that I want. Right? It's, 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 I got to do like, 2,450 because the last time I did 2,440. I know when you say last time though, are you speaking the week before the last heavy day before the last week? Well, I'm speaking in terms of meats, but yeah, yeah, even, yeah, with yeah. The, even in the training, right? So I fucked my pec up last year. I've had some injuries, back stuff in New Hampshire and all this stuff since I went out there. And I've got all these crazy numbers from when I was training out here with them, different environment, you you know, getting a handout from Dave is just, there's like an element to it that makes lifting weights easier. Right. And so I'm looking, so like for my three board, let's just say three board raw, right. I did 570 when I was out here. Right. And I haven't hit that since I came back because I hurt my pec, whatever. But what I do is I just say, okay, so last time I did a three board, what did I get? I got 510. Cool. Let's make all the jumps get 515. If it's easy, I'll make another jump based on feel. But I think the reason that I'm able to do that is because like I'm almost 38 and I don't have, I'm not like this, this young dude who's like so focused on this, this number. If we're talking about just training, like who gives a fuck if I, f- if I three board raw 575, I don't give a fuck. I want to get stronger than I was the last time I did this. So I'm healthy. So when I put my shirt in, I can bench a PR when it matters. I don't give a fuck about the training really. Like it's more so as long as like, you know, it's like, you know, those memes that are like success, what people think it looks like, what it actually looks Mm -hmm. like. Right. So as long as your snaky pattern is inside of two lines, getting better, you're in the same you're doing better. Like, are you better now than you were a year ago? Yes. Okay. Let's keep chipping away at it instead of like, especially since I'm on, I hate saying it, but you're like on the tail end, right? Like I'm, I'm almost 38, whatever. So it's like, uh, it's more important for me to just do more than I did a couple months ago in this variation. Stop, coach my guys, do my accessories, feel, feel safe, feel in one piece so that I can train again next week and like keep building towards like, the actual big day, not the like whoopsie daisy. I accidentally did this number. Like, you know, quote the, the quote, quote the big guy. If you do it twice, it's not an accident, right? Mm-hmm. You got to make that happen through smart decisions. So my, I told him this before and I can kind of sum it up like this. I, I, I said it to him. You have to, you have to raise your overall average. Yes. I remember okay. that. Yeah. yeah. So like, you're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. And but that average number that you're always hitting that you know there's something that you should always be able to hit if that you want to raise that's the number 
that I base everything off of. Like the is second that, attempts, like you just said. The yeah. overall average. Yeah. And so, and I and I was going to say that I think this is what what why the high why West Side had a high turnover ratio. Like why dudes were just in and out of there so much. Louis would would ramrod these dudes, get them super fucking strong. They'd have that day of all days, and they couldn't fucking they couldn't fucking do it again. And uh, well, you just can't do it. You don't know how to train. You just get fuck out. You know, you know. <laughs> what, really, what it was was they hit this number, and then all their training all of a sudden just changed to percentages of this huge number they hit that one time. And yeah, you should always go off of your one rep maxes and stuff. But like, um. Everything for me is based off of a second attempt, and usually those second attempt numbers are something that I know without a shadow of a doubt that you should be able to hit no matter what, and that's the overall average. And that's where I look to see if if I'm getting stronger. Not necessarily can I lift the most I've ever done. It's um, how what the frequency at which you hit these these numbers um, kind of matters. Um, that's where it goes. To, when I say conquering weights, uh, you got to you conquer them you just don't visit them so then it goes back to the point of where do you base stuff so like if i'll give you an example so if i if i told if i squatted 1273 um or 1275 what do you want to call it my best squat's 1273 um that's the best i ever did that in a meet you know i've squatted more than that in the gym but that's not a meet uh it's taken you know so what I, i i guess i can just say it like this when i hit that number it wasn't hard and it was a great day. And I'm like, man, I'm, that's where I'm at. And I just started switching all my training to revolve around squatting 1300 or, or bettering that. But it, it just so happens that was just a really good day. And I need to, and, and I started skipping like the 1230s, the 40s, the 50s, just jump into the 70s, 80s, the 13s. And I kind of like got ahead of myself. Like I might have been strong enough to do it, but I, I, the strength endurance wasn't wasn't there, so to say. I didn't have it wasn't sustainable. Um, so I think numbers leading up to that big weight that you want to do are more important than actually the big one. I think setting things up, uh, setting yourself up for success, has a lot to you know. No, I think you make a big point because it's it's like the movie Caddyshack. You know, the guy has the best golf. <laughs> then he ends up getting fucking whacked by yeah. lightning and yeah. dead, right? <laughs> Where the, we all have those days or have had those days in the gym. You're like, what the fuck? I mean, they're awesome, but you got to pause and kind of think, okay, now wait a minute. This was like a gift from God. You know, I don't know where it came from. It's cool. But what you're saying is don't base your training on that one specific thing. It, you should, it, can, it can play into the average. It should. Right? But it shouldn't be the defining number it, you, it should be something that you know like this is my best um can i try it can i try pr today you know what i mean that's kind of like how i look at prs like um that might sound very vague but like you just don't i don't know you said that shit that like if you could get to a jump of it right if you yeah my whole thing is if it. i'm within 50 pounds of like you know my best like you know when i was pulling deadlifts the other day like i haven't pulled a dead i haven't pulled a fucking deadlift since the meat last year mm-hmm. and it was like so i just started pulling deadlifts and i got up to this number and it was moving great and i probably could have taken another one but it's like you know what like this is this is kind of the number that matters like the next time it's always it's something bob always told me leaving something in the tank yeah you get up um so this kind of brings me around to like the west side high turnover ratio i think uh you can't base percentages your working percentages in this this newly acquired number until this newly acquired number establishes some uh i always i always try to hit three times you know mm-hmm. what I mean? so if i you know squat in 1230 i might go 40 and a 50 and then you know once you kind of conquer that little range of numbers then you can make a jump you know it makes like jumping to 13 not seem so insurmountable and i think one thing that louis like me louis would always ask me things like um Cause I would, I would, I would do a meet and I would, I would come off and I wouldn't, you know, I would squat 12, 12, 12, whatever, 1200 or something. And, uh, instead of, you know, Louis's whole thing, you know, 50, 55, 60% with box squat waves, you know, typical, you would take, you know, so if you're taking 1200 pound squat of 50% of that 600 and I wouldn't, I'd come back and I'd start with like 500, you know, the first week I just wouldn't kill myself. I wouldn't start with those. Uh, newly acquired percentages week one and Louis was like kind of confused like why don't you do that and I was like well dude I'm you know that was the meat that I, I peaked I trained however many months to get to that one point 
you know, what goes up must come down. That's not, I can't stay up there and just all of a sudden train at these percentages. You, you'll burn yourself out, you'll get hurt, and everything will come to an end. So, like, you know, after I acquired those new numbers, I kind of went back and, you know, we would always say, you know, I would squat. That's what I might have said it in some of the other lives that we did, but it, sometimes when I come back from a meet, I would do, I would do, you know, 50% of 1100, you know, then I'd do 50% of 1200 and then 50% of 1300. And then like the, that would be my three week wave. So I would like step myself kind of like back into the, the greater percentages and it's done over a period of time rather than I got this number, everything just changes. And I think that's kind of what Louis would do. He would, and it was a mental thing. A lot of people, a lot of guys just couldn't handle it. You know, they would, they didn't understand that when you do more, more is required and then more is expected. And when you do this thing, that doesn't matter anymore. And like Louis always said, it never, nobody cares what you did. They only care about what you're going to do. So one thing I think gets overlooked a lot with meets is, and this even happens in conjugate, but to a lesser degree is let's say your last heavy deadlifts three weeks out, last heavy squats two weeks out, bench one week out, but you're slowly kind of dropping accessories, not totally, but you're dropping them a little bit. So three weeks before the meet, your volume, the total number of reps that you've done is decreased. You know, actually, the week before, the volume might be like 10, like 10 total reps, if, if, if that. Yeah. Then the week after the meet, usually it's kind of low, too. So if you look, you got a whole block of like four weeks where you average less than 100 total reps <sighs> per week. And then people yeah. want to come back after the meet and go full steam yeah. at 500%. You've geared the you've yeah. geared the engine different. Like when when you're starting <laughs> yeah, a training yeah, yeah. cycle, the engine isn't isn't pumped in prime and and tuned the same way as it is when you're 3 weeks out. That's the whole point of training and peaking training. Yeah. Like you don't the me me 13 weeks out isn't me 8 weeks out isn't me 4 weeks out. Like that's the whole point of the training cycle is to walk you through these steps of being in shape, handling weights, putting them all together to allow you to yeah. perform the lift at the meet so it's like it's always a i always say it's always a process of going up and down and when people are going when people and sometimes you have downs more than you have ups and you know bob always told me you can't suck all the time you know you're bound to get one just like you're bound to miss one yeah and so getting back into shape to train is a thing and <sighs> people say that people say like the the question that i get asked one of the most the biggest ones that i get is like what's the difference between training under dave and training under louis and he just touched on both of them. And one of them is something I give my lifters that I coach. It's like <clears throat> after a meet, like you just said, you peaked, right? You're up here, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens if, if it's not a peak, if it just you just stay up there, it's a fucking line. You, like yeah. you have to come down or it doesn't make the peak, right? Yep. So you, <laughs> the, the mountain doesn't you have, form. You have to have the point, right? Yeah, you got to have the backside. So, so Lou said, you know, Lou would always say like, we train at 90% or whatever. We're always at 90%. And it's like, well, you can't go to 105% and then right to 90. Well, you can't go from 105 to zero for a week to mm -hmm. 90, right? So I have my, how I come back from things a little different than what he does is, you know, like after a meet, I'll take the week off. Then my first week back, I'll go like bow bar, three chains. I'll put on loose single ply briefs and do sets of five. It's nothing. I could bench it, mm -hmm. but, but it, it gets me like moving. And then I slowly, I'll do that for like two weeks and then I'll get into the like five, five plates and four chains, like after a while. Right. But like, at Westside, it was more expected of you to just go, go, go. And then the other thing that he touched on was, like, with his deadlift the other night, right? So, like, he probably had another one. You definitely – I've seen you training it. Like, he, he could have pulled his PR, right? But he didn't because he didn't have to. And the, that The is, meet's not till November. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's the biggest difference between the two is, like, you know, like, floor press is something that I kind of gauge my – bench on and that's my one of my better raw movements but it's how i got fucked up and hurt so my best is 520 or 525 right and i hurt my pec with 530 or 430 i was it was like a freak weird thing i was down to weight whatever and so going into meets i like to take a floor press like kind of close to the meat not the 10 days out really sometimes but i like to do that so I just try to beat what I did last time. So as soon as I touched five plates again, I was like, fuck yeah, I'm back to 500. But it was fucking hard. This was before Supers uh, in April or whatever, mm -hmm. right? It was like one of those ones where you're kind of doing one of these. So then when we came back around before semifinals, I did 515 or 510. And it was empty bar, right? And all of my training partners were like, yes, let's go. Go to the PR. And I'm like, fucking Why? So I can tweak my pec 
two weeks out from the meet, I know I'm stronger. I look at that video. I look at the other video. The other video, if someone had, you know, if a, if a mouse had pissed on the bar, I would have missed yeah. it. This one, I threw it through the fucking roof. I'm stronger. I'm not taking a fucking chance. There's something to having sense. confidence. You have to be confident yeah, in yourself to some some degree to know that, like, take the ego out of it. Do I have to take this? Could I? Yeah. Should I? Maybe. You know, do I have to? Do I have to? Is that that's the real question? Who cares what your floor press? Well, this uh, this is Who cares a, what this your block is a, pull? this is a big thing, right? Because <laughs> I mean, you have clients, you have people that you work with, and basically, this is auto regulating your max effort. Work, that's a great word. You know, because it's should you you know because they're all programmed, right? Max effort work hit a five pound PR, but in the full reality of the whole thing, it doesn't happen. Is it's not black and white like that. I know. I but you're I, just gonna have a five pound PR today. <laughs> How do you explain that though? Well, it's it's one of those things where like you, it, no one's gonna. We talk about this all the time. If we're all training together, and I let's say like you know I, I've got a, a fucked up back, right? And we and I pull something, I pull something, and, and I get I pull like you know twenty pounds off my PR, or I pull the PR. Let's say I pull a five pound PR, and it was pretty easy. And you look around, and you're like, should I take another one? And you take another one, right? If you get it, it was the right decision. If you miss it and get hurt, it was the bad decision. But the only way you know is by doing it. And the only way to know to pull the trigger or not is the experience of being in the gym for a long time. A lot of that yeah. is like hard to. Well, you could also get it and it'd be the wrong decision because now you've put your body in such a state. It takes more stress and a very it hard created to, more stress. You can't recover hard from. to beat Correct. again. Like when you come back around to it, that's like the that's my like uh, my reverse band deadlift is like one of those ones where like I'll pull a five pound PR. And then I do not fucking pull another one because I've had situations where I've jumped 60 pounds in that or rack pulls a better one, make a fucking huge jump in a rack pull. I haven't pulled a rack pull PR since 2019 and I hadn't done it in almost two years. He programmed this when I was at sweatshop. He's like pin three rack pull. I'm like fuck. I pull 745 pound PR. Fuck. Yeah. Two weeks later, pin three rack pull. I go, I, we just did that. He goes, do it again. Pull the five pound PR somehow. Right. And then now I haven't, I haven't hit another one in a very long time, but that first one before the 740 was like a 60 or 50 pound PR. I shouldn't have taken it because then it makes it more difficult to keep the ball rolling. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I want to be, I want to get greedy on a third attempt at a meet. Cause if I miss it, I've already got a five pound PR on the second. Well, if we go back to his deadlift that he just, it was your your semi-annual Instagram yes. post, right? Quarterly. I figured post. since I was coming yeah, it's on. It's not even quarter. It's like, it's like, it's just like half a year. And, I had to let people know, know I was still lifting weights. And um, <laughs> you could have taken another one, but then the energy demands to recover from that could have fucked up your next squat session or next week. Well, didn't Louie call it like delayed onset muscle transformation or soreness? It's yeah. kind of the same thing. Like something I do tomorrow, will, and if, if it's this it demands high output, high energy, you know, all, all, all this inner, just all this output, it's gonna, it can affect the next two weeks and the yes. things that you plan to do the next two weeks. So, you know, I could get, uh, my whole thing is like, if I can just get my body to respond, that's good. So like, you so know, what do you mean by respond? Meaning like, can I do enough to it to get, to get something from it? Can I cause just enough trauma for it to just give me something like a little bit of strength? Can I get a little bit? Of, my whole thing is just a lot of littles. Yeah. You know what I mean, today, I, I, like I said, the meat's not till November. I need a lot of littles. You know, I don't, I don't have to just get these big things. I don't have to get to four weeks out and try this big thing and make that just a lot of littles going up and a lot of littles after a while you, you get a, you get all this carryover with less damage. Correct. It's, uh, so what was the question you asked me? Well, it's, what I'm trying to do is to there's 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 two levels of lifters when it comes to this. There's the ones that are intelligent, and even the intelligent <laughs> ones, we're all gonna fuck up, right? There's gonna be the days like fucking, I'm doing it, yeah, you know, just because lifters. I'm not, yeah, yeah, because yeah, he's, <laughs> you know. So there are days that they're gonna fuck up, but then on the other ones, there's ones that are so conservative that just because they always feel like it's in range, they're not, they're afraid to push. I think that's where great training partners come in. Cause they'll be, you know, we got guys that are like, come on, you fucking pussy. What do you mean? You're quitting. You know what I mean? That yeah. didn't, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> yes. So, you know, that's where I think, you know, also it, there's a lot of intangibles. You have to have good people around you. You have to have a good head on your shoulders. I think taking the ego out of it a lot. So, you know, going, going back, like I don't have to pull that 900 just to make myself feel good. You know what I mean? Like me pulling the 850 was, I'm going to get, I haven't pulled, I didn't, that's the first time deadlifting in, I don't know, months and months and I don't know, since that November of last year, like that meaning taking that kind of a, 
where I put gear on and I'm trying mm-hmm. to deadlift. I've done like variations of training, but like actually taking a weight that was that was the first time. So you don't you just get your feet wet, let you introduce it. It's a lot of it's introduction. Hey body, this is what the fuck we're doing today. Oh, I remember. Okay. You know, like okay, you know, you have a pot. You know, your body's only going to remember the last thing you do. So if it's easy, it's like wow, that was easy. I feel good, dude. I feel great today. Um, like from, I mean, it, granted it's Wednesday, but you know, normally deadlifts, you'll feel, you can feel those for a week. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times, so now going, now being a couple days after I, you, you can assess how you feel like, wow, I recovered from that. I can take another one. Like sometimes not doing things will tell you a lot. Um, but if you don't know what you're looking for and you don't have the right people around you, that might not work. And, you know so, and sometimes it's about fucking doing like you say like some guys are go crazy and they go too much and some guys are too conservative i'll take the guy who goes too crazy because it's easy to put a leash on somebody it's yeah. harder to give someone like the bulldog mentality yeah. i i tweaked my knee uh with an eleven fifteen squat going into wpo uh several years ago and on the following monday we were doing a four inch block pull I just told this story the other day of my training partner because he fucked his shoulder up. And I'm like, no, you have to train, dude. You have to do something. You can't just stand here. You have to do something. Mm -hmm. Thank you for loading the plates, but you must figure out a way to fucking train. You don't have to bench with us, but you do something. And I I remember I messaged Dave and I said to him, yo, man, my knee's fucked up. Like, I'm going to come in and hang. I'm not going to deadlift. And he calls me stinky, right? So he goes, there, there, sweet stink you will deadlift. And that's the only fucking message he sent me. And I went and I deadlift and pulled 770 off the blocks. Cause I could, cause he told me that I should basically said more or less said that I had to. Well, there's like, are you and injured? Are you hurt? You know? And up. like, I, I, you know, I, <laughs> yeah. when you're around a while, you can be like, okay, that dude's yeah. hurt. Oh, that dude's injured. You probably, you know what I mean? Like, will yeah. something come off if I push him? You need to no, like, you need you know? to have, like you said, the right people around you to not make you be an asshole and turn into this like dick swinging contest, but also someone who's like, listen, dude, like I've seen guys get fucked up, hurt in training and finish the session. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like for us, for guys who have been around like for a long time and you guys were around in like the, the madness of it all when it was like, there was no pt people on the Lyra. mummy chuck vogel exactly yeah. like you know so and and the the voltaire or the um the liniment and all that yeah. so like you know you guys are around for all that but it's like having the right people around you to know gyms don't a, smell like liniment anymore to ours ours did the other day Val goes, Val goes, did you put liniment on do you remember you there's some old guy in the west side and it was just, just like <laughs> fucking blue heat yeah yeah it just smelled like cool blue in there or whatever mm-hmm. horse liniment absorbean you know yeah. Bring 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 horse liniment. Make make <laughs> liniment great again. If your gym doesn't smell like fucking liniment, you aren't working hard enough. You need at least one old fucked up dude in the just gym. in there. Yeah. You know, you just like, come in and you see as greater long on the as back. It's like attack. the fucking blue, you know, like the Arctic bomber blue heat or some shit like that. And so there was some nasty ass stinking <laughs> shit too, though. That was they got good. a tractor supply and get it. Yeah, it was yeah, actually for yeah. horses. Fuck I horse. The supply. big blue bottle is the one that comes to my mind when I think yeah. of the horse liniment. Pump. Remember, yeah. you'd have greater in there. There's always just be one like designated old dude that would be in there just rubbing his peck and rubbing shit down for 15 mm. minutes with liniment screaming at you that's why i remember L- gritter just being there on the back deck you stupid motherfucker do another set just was, <laughs> just rubbing liniment on him on his shit i can't make fun of it because i still use the shit now no it's great i, I, I love it i use the hottest shit i can find it has really? to be like so because it really doesn't do anything i was gonna say do you think that it's like a no but, if it, but if it makes it you feel better than fuck it, it yeah burns so he's like my god my arm's on fucking fire then i'm not worried about my shoulder yeah. well it's the same thing as those like remember those gold bracelets people wore for a while with the Copper. little balls on them yeah and it's like does that do anything i don't know does Louis it make you one. feel better if it makes you feel better uh, Louis had fucking fucking every, you know, <laughs> he tried everything he tried every it is and I fell for a lot of the shit. The, the funniest like snake one, oil, you know. Well, there was clay, right? There was this time he's eating clay, and it's like healing clay. It was a bag. It was a fucking. It was a lunch fucking bag. It was a bag full of clay, and you, you gotta eat, eat clay. the clay. And, clean and it's like it really works. And the first thing every time he would say that, first thing that go through my mind is. I thought the last thing worked. And then the thing before that what worked. Was the shark? It's the combination the of all the so things. Obviously, none of this shit's worked. What was the shark stuff? It was like shark uh, cartilage. cartilage. And he's yeah. like, I can't have that. It makes me go crazy. I'm like, you bite. wait a second. What are yeah. you talking about? <laughs> yeah, it was that. We're, we're there. Yeah, yeah. We're there. When you, when, when you think shark cartilage is making you crazy, it's like, uh, Louis. 
Yes. It can't be that effective if you can buy it over the counter at CVS. It was pretty much. You know yeah, what I mean? Ex exactly. <laughs> but it was always this next thing. And it's like, so I'm eating this clay. It doesn't do a goddamn thing. And um, but even now you'll have people that will say, um, take this. It will help your joints. So then they'll say, man, it was amazing. Like, to me, a lot of the peptides, like the BP-152. Can we talk about that? Sure. Dude. They don't do shit. Can like we people, please? Dude, why anytime, are we sticking needles? Anytime yeah. somebody fucking tears something, the next post is, injected uh, yeah, BPC-157 yeah, yeah. into my yeah. pack today. He, all the healing, yeah. where are we go? It's like, no. Just, that's not, no. So no. I, this is what I wonder. You shot saline into yeah. your peck. <laughs> on, on that on that list of hurt, injured, and fucked up, I got areas that are fucked up. I mean, they're <laughs> fucked up. They are never getting better. Seized. They're <laughs> fucked up, right? And I can put that shit or anything else in there, and it does zero. And then somebody else will be like, oh, man, it was the greatest thing in the world. And I'm like, so either you're just hurt. Right. Well, Where yeah. an ice bag probably would have done the same thing. Well, if you're going to take the time, like, <laughs> it's like if you, if you bad pull, information, if you pull your quad or whatever, you pop your quad and you're like, okay, I pop my quad and now I'm going to, ha I have a tear in something on me. So I'm going to take a sharp thing and I'm going to stick it into the thing that's torn, which is crazy to me anyway. I'm going to stick it into this internal wound into this thing. Right. And then it's like, but you're still going to take some time off. Right. So like yeah. you said, you you weren't that fucked up. You just, you got this little tweak and you shot this stuff in and you took two weeks off and then you feel better. It wasn't the shit you were sticking into yourself. It was the fact you took two weeks off and didn't, you know, if you fucked your leg up, you didn't do a lower body workout for two weeks. And it's like, that stuff is a lot of it's like so mental. And, and also sometimes like, sometimes it's okay to just like sit with being hurt. He, you said that to me. Once. It's like, sometimes like you're just hurt and you just like, don't need to do anything. It's kind of part of You just of need it. to fucking <laughs> sit there and be upset that you're hurt and you can't train like you want to so that when you can train, you're fucking hungry again. Like you well, don't burn yourself out. Assess yeah. it though too, right? Where it's people will, and granted, I, I, I would take anything, you know, fucking eating the clay, all that. I would do all that kind of stuff. But back then I never took a moment to think, okay, why A, did I pull this? Because yeah. maybe I need to figure that out so it doesn't <laughs> happen again. What's the causation? Right, and yeah. then what exactly, how much time is what I'm going to do? How much, I remember Halbert saying this to me once because I used to have reoccurring pec tears. And he was like, why don't you just rest the eight weeks? And because I'm like, man, if I do this, this, and this, I can be back in four. He's like, what the fuck? Do we need to be back in four? It's four weeks. Your meat is 36 weeks away. Yeah. So yeah. why not use the eight weeks? I know? always kind of looked at like, as like, as an actual wound, you know what I mean? So like when you just tear something and, you know, one of, one of, one of our training partners, Alex Kovach, he just tore his pec uh, six or eight weeks ago. And it was a pretty nice one. He you know, it was bleeding out everywhere. And uh, I'm like, Ooh, that looks like a pretty good one there, bud. You know? So, you know, when you look at that, it's obviously a wound, you know what I mean? You don't need to go in and, uh, I just think of it like an open cut. You know what I mean? If the cut is open and it needs stitches, it needs to heal first. So you running in the next day and trying to do pec flies and, and do benches to put blood into a wound is not going to like make it better. Something like, so I was like, all right, buddy, we're just going to take it. Just take a couple weeks off. Just let the thing just not be agitated. Um, get them a little bit of massage therapy, break that scar tissue up, stuff like that. And then get, get into a point where you can start doing the motion again and it's like you basically start at ground zero start with the bar you know what i mean yeah. do it till it doesn't hurt all right and then it's like next week it's like all right we're, we they fall they, they'll just fall in line with whatever we're doing so if it's floor press if it's board press it doesn't matter what it is you just you go until it hurts when when you're like okay there's there's like ow that hurt and they're like that's fucking pain you know what i mean like you have to i look at it what do they call it like wound abrasion like we're we're if someone's got a wound, they'll like they'll like cut it and and cause it cause like he, cause it to heal basically, and that's kind of like what um, after it heals a little bit, you got to kind of like tear it down, cause agitation to get to get it to what you know what what, yeah. what um, to get some kind of uh, reaction. Um, but you got to get past the first initial fucked up part before you start that. You have yeah. to get past the like the injury, like you have hurt yourself, and you need to chill. And like, <laughs> how, how aggressive that is is going to depend upon 
how far out you are from a meet, what the meet is. What your mentality I've, is, right. how bad yeah. the how You know, bad six weeks out is. from a WPO, you're going to treat that I did different. this. That was three weeks out. So in 19, this is funny. Um, we were three weeks out. Um, that, that was when we had just, we, we all left West side. I, I thought I was going to have a really good meet and I was like, all right, we're just going to take some, I'm just going to do some, you know, raw shit today. And I remember I put four plates on there. Boom. Pop my peck. Like three weeks out from this ESPN WPO. And I looked down and it started bruising and I'm like, great. Like a fucking half tweak. Fuck. Damn it. You know, mm. crap. So it's like, what do you do? You know, you're three weeks after the meet. Do you try to mess with it? Do you try to do stuff? I literally just didn't do anything. And I just went into the meet and you just kind of let the good times roll because what that's what you're there to do. So in that instance, like uh, I tweaked my pick and you just have to like all hands off of it. Doesn't fuck with it. Don't mess with it. You know what I mean? Like that's the confidence though, right? Well, it's like experience, that, you know, knowing. experience will will bring that confidence like you just kind of know how many times have i hit these numbers okay i've i've had pec tears pec tweaks in the past i know generally after about two or three weeks it kind of gets back to this thing of it doesn't really hurt anymore it might hurt when you're warming up it might feel cold and creaky and stuff like that but generally after a few weeks on a on a on like a pec tweak or something like that you can you know you're putting i'm putting a shirt on so i'm gonna have some kind of protection so there's just you know I guess it comes down to it's like what did you actually do and like you said like how are you are you far out from a competition is this something that um if you're far out from a competition you don't have to sit there and push the issue um but if you're three weeks out from the one of the biggest meets of all time it's like you kind of just you weigh your options and yeah. roll the dice yeah type deal it's uh, I'll, I'll piggyback off that a little bit with um, recovery, because that's another issue just from session to session, because you were talking about the deadlift holding back a little bit, stuff like that is, you know, it's, and I'm sure you get asked questions all the time, like, what do you do as far as your recovery in between as far as extra workouts, hot, cold contrast, shit like that? Whatever they want, whatever well, they think feels good Yeah, is what I tell people, honestly. Like, listen, dude, like, I've done all of the, every modality you can fucking imagine. In the cold, the hot, the cryo, the grass, then the dry needling, fucking tons of drugs, no drugs, lots of water, all of the shit, done all of the things. And honestly, dude, like rotate them. And I just tell people like, what makes you feel better? Like, do you think you need that? Can you tell me why you're doing that? And the thing is like, if, if someone starts foam rolling and it's like, you ask them why they're doing it. And they say, because I saw so-and-so doing it, wrong answer. Don't need to be doing it. Well, so-and-so has 30 more pounds of muscle than you. Yeah, you know, or, like. or they, or so-and-so is trying to sell you their fucking product or whatever. Or so-and-so has a real reason and you're not that person. But even if they say, if they say, oh, it helps loosen up my like, yeah, IT band stuff, so sometimes I'll foam roll to bust it up a little bit and it helps me. And I know scientifically it doesn't change anything with the muscle. But for me, when I do it, it makes me feel prepared to train. So if you look at me and you say, I don't know why I'm foam rolling my glutes, but every time I do it, I feel more prepared to train. Perfect. Fuck it. That's a good enough reason for me, for someone to do something. If As long as it's not hurting you and it's making you better, like prepared to perform, then that's a good modality to be using. But if you're just doing it because you're like, I have to sauna, cold uh, cold plunge. I have to foam roll. I have to do East M because I heard Joe Rogan said that I had to do it. It's like, no, no, no. Give me a reason and give me something that like a, uh, uh, an, a situation where you've done it and it's assisted you actually, even if it's just emotionally, mentally, like makes you feel more prepared Then I'm willing to accept that answer. But otherwise it's just like, otherwise you're just rolling around on the fucking ground for no reason. I'd still walk it back to ask, you know, why are you not recovering from your training in the first place? Oh, like, why do you need to? Yeah. Well, now, that would be, if it was now, a client, it would be almost guaranteed yeah. that it's my fault because I fucked up their training. Yeah. Or yes. I had a Well, kid. if they're peaking too, I mean, if you're pushing into a meet, the accumulated <laughs> fatigue gonna is going to start to feel better. You should. You should. It's part of that, right? You should be right on the line of overtraining. Yeah. Now, outside of that, if they're 42 weeks out and they have to use some recovery modalities after every max effort day, I'd kind of wonder, like, what the fuck is up with I've, your max I've effort? I've run into that. I had this kid. Dude, it was driving me fucking crazy. I had this kid. He trained alone in his basement. He's a raw kid. Nothing crazy. Very, like, normal type lifter, like sub 500 sub 350 sub 500 that's where his numbers right raw guy and uh he just week after week wouldn't hit prs on everything it was driving me fucking crazy it was driving me crazy as a coach i'm like why is this fucking kid 
So I get on the phone with him. I'm talking to him, talking to him, da 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 da. And I'm like, so like, why don't we try moving like some of your accessories maybe to a different day? So it give you some, I know you got kids and something. He's like, oh, well, I can't do it on Tuesday or Thursday because I roll jujitsu on those days. And I'm like, oh, oh hold on. Yeah. I'm like, hold on oh. a second. You do, you what now? And and what is that? And when you say rolling, like, like, oh, like two hours of like, you know, like full go rolling. And I'm like, well, this conversation has been a waste of my time because that's why you're not PRing anything. People don't know <coughs> the different variables and the different, like when he was saying like, you know, sometimes you feel good in the gym and you can pull that PR and sometimes you can't. A lot of people outside of people who are very in tune with what's going on, they don't understand. It's like, if you've been fighting with your wife for a week, that's going to fuck your training up. And they don't think of it that way, right? So what I tell people is like, if they go through a phase where they're not recovering and it seems like, and all the normal shit, like water's on point, food, gear, like all this stuff seems like it's on point. I'm like, okay, I want you to take the day and I want you to think about the last time that you trained that you felt like you were recovering. And then I want you to think of anything that's changed since then. Even if you think it's fucking stupid. Even if you think it's fucking stupid. You get a promotion at work, you wouldn't think that that, like, you're, you found out your wife's pregnant, your kid is getting in trouble at school, you're fucking, whatever, dude. You change the source where you're getting your shit, all of this stuff. <laughs> that someone who, with less experience, they won't even think of it. Or even someone with a lot of experience like he said stuff to me that I'm like, I never thought of that before, but yeah. it's because it's hard to self-evaluate. And, and so that's kind of like, as a coach and someone who helps people, whatever, like you have to look at him and be like, okay, dude, like I can't evaluate this for you. You're not a special snowflake. No one else in the group is fucking overtrained. What the fuck is going on with you? So look at it and, and have them try to figure out like what this thing is. Like I had, I had someone who was just like, he couldn't figure out a strong kid. Couldn't figure it out. I'm like, what the fuck is, why are you always hurt? You're always getting fucking hurt. Um, and he went and got blood work done. Finally, I'm like, dude, just go get blood. Dick figured out his fucking estrogen was like through the fucking roof. His hormones were all fucked up. And I'm like, well, that matters. That's what's happening. Hormones are real. <laughs> they are real. <laughs> like, L- Louis would tell you, because you, 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 you got weak hips. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you got weak hips. Yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> one of those things where it's like, yeah, that, that shit matters, bro. It's like. So with the recovery stuff, I try to look at the, the standard stuff. So it's always like food, sleep, hydration. Okay, those are good. What's your supplements like? Whether they're over the counter or not. What's your home life like? And then it's like, are you doing stupid shit? Are you getting on a Peloton four times a week and killing yourself there because you want abs? Like Measuring effort, I think, is one. Like some people are, you know, are you, like how hard are you actually trying <laughs> um, are you, are you, you're trying a little too hard here, you know, like you just need to do the things. That's a real hard one, right? Because you got to anchor it somehow. Because <sighs> what, what your 10 is, is going to be different than somebody else's 10. Yeah. Where they may think that their effort is all out. Yeah. But it's not. And where they're putting it too. So he helped me figure out that like, man, I'd go into West Side, we start doing jam presses. I remember, you know, you know how Lou would like stand over you and you're doing something. He'd be like, no, you got to get your elbows up this way. Mm-hmm. So I'm going, when I went in there, uh, I, I could do like a football bar, like plate and a quarter for like a set of five jams, right? To, like, oh, I got a good story about this. I did. I did two plates and a quarter for three or five, either way, right? And I worked it up and my bench went up five pounds, dude. But my accessory went up fucking 150. So, Who cares? So here's dude, a great, what? here's a great story. We'll just go down memory lane here so i remember like bob code told me one day he's like it's like one day we were just all high high and hot on on the skull crushers and i was doing skull crushers with 365 or 315 or something like that but he went to the meat and blues tricep bob with a 500 pound bench you know what i mean so the dude could could do a skull crusher with 315 but he couldn't bench 500 in a shirt Mm -hmm. so it's like well you know maybe maybe doing skull crushers with three plates isn't is yeah, it, that blew it. my mind when I st- when all of a sudden he's doing extensions with a quarter on the bar, and I'm like, give me a plate, and he's like, no, no, quarter, put it in your fucking triceps, dude. I think it's bodybuilding. I think people can learn a lot from uh, like really good, or just really good bodybuilders yes. in general. Like you know your mind and muscle connection, and this is maybe we can touch on this some now, but uh, just like style of training, so. Uh, so what's the story that you were saying? Oh, okay. So I'll just kind of briefly get into it. And if you have any questions, we can yeah. elaborate. But so, you know, you know, every time, um, you know, I do, I do a, a commercial snow removal in the winter. So like, I, it's real hard for me to like 
be super consistent during the winter time. So, you know, as soon as spring sprungs, you know, whatever you want to call it, spring springs, you know, it's like, okay, I got to start reevaluating stuff. I know usually I'm only good for about one meet a year now and my meets the WPO to mm-hmm. go to the super finals. And that's usually in November. So I'm like, okay, I got some time. Um, what, what am I doing that I'm still doing that's not helping me? You know, like you, you have, you have this, I always say you have something in your bread and butter that you're sticking to, but you're like, what have I done in the past? So I'm sitting there just thinking, I'm going back to like the year 2008, you know, like the year. And then I'm like, well, I did these things in the year 2008 and I'm not doing those now. And that's when, you know, stuff was moving. So some, so then I start like kind of combining years. I'm like, I'm combining 2008 with, you know, 2014. So, um, so this kind of like dovetails into like, what am I, what's the point of what I'm trying to say? Um, I remember like when, when training becomes stagnant and I'm not feeling strong, I'm not feeling, you know, as I get older and I think it's more or less the numbers as the numbers are getting bigger. It's when I, when I take that pause in the winter, it's really, really hard. It's like a train dead stopped on a track trying to get to trying to get the, the engine moving again and like that's where it, it'll take me four or five weeks just to get the wheels turning again to where like now i can train so you know going back to what i was saying i remember louis always told me you know if you're doing this one thing or you're doing this set of things and you start to become stagnant and you know you're you're not getting the response from your body you just need to turn around and run in the other direction so I just dropped everything and I turned around and ran in the complete opposite direction and the complete opposite direction was Power Shack Gym. So I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go, you know, you know, we, we train at Doghouse and they have everything, you know, like I, mm-hmm. I put, put some of my, my equipment in there and the stuff I want and, and it's got everything, in, you know, I've total big totals out of there. Some of the, the biggest ones I've done come out of that place. So really, it's not like the gym thing. To my, my mentality was what am I not doing? And I'm not really doing a lot of machine work. I'm not really doing bodybuilding structured workouts where I'm not really having a main exercise. I'm just going in there. I'm going to do lats today. I'm going to do a lot of rows today. I'm going to. Oh, we're going to do biceps today. So it's just like, I just turned around and ran in the other direction of training. Like I just went full retard the other way. And, um, so that's pretty much what I've been doing through the spring. You know, I've been going, we go there a couple days a week. We'll go in there. Hit, it's primarily on a back days. And, uh, and sometimes we'll go in there and do legs. You know, we don't squat cause it's fucking legs, you know, yeah. you know, so, and that's where I was kind of saying it and, and t- to that point, so it was training. So what am I doing in my training? And then the last podcast we had on here, you start asking me about diet nutrition and I'm like, shit, like I know about diet nutrition, but I'm not focused on my own diet nutrition like I should be, you know, like, so I start focusing on, you know, the things I'm eating, the portions I'm eating, you know, you know, how many, like you asked me how many grams of protein I eat a day. And I was like 400. I was like, I don't eat 400 fucking grams of protein a day. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm thinking like longhorn meals. If I eat longhorn four times a day, that's 150 grams of protein. Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. So like, so, you know, like, you know, you know, I start figuring all that stuff out and uh, I start getting shit in order and f- just from doing that and then I came back around to that deadlift and everybody, all everybody in my group was ripping shit off the ground. 25, 30 pound PRs out of nowhere and it was like, oh, so like, it's like I have, I have nurtured this side of training that I haven't nurtured in 10, 10, 12 years. You know what I mean? I've come back around and revi- like, like Donnie always said, what is old is new again. So it's like I, I went back and just did all that. I don't want to say it's bodybuilding work, but you know, it is, it's, you know, muscle isolation stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, like I said, I came, pulled that 855 deadlift on Monday and I haven't pulled a deadlift since November at the meet and I pulled 815 then. So I hadn't, I hadn't, dude, I mean, I did a rack pull, maybe worked up to 675 or something like that, you know? So nothing. So I guess what I'm trying to say, all that isolation work, like tied all the loose ends together. It's almost like I had things that weren't connected or the, the, the connection was getting dull and I like renewed this mind to muscle to where now I have this ultra proprioception of what I, where I remember from the past I used to have. It was like, I could think, I could just think and see things like, like if I needed to push my knee out, I could just see myself outside of my body, pushing my knee out. So it's like, I, I have, it's like, I think bodybuilding in a sense that mind to muscle connection helps with cues, coaching, you know, push your knees out, sit back, you know, 
keep your chest up. You you can tell your muscles to do things when you have more control over them. Well, I think there's there's another factor there that if the power lifter is the dragster, yeah. right? Then it's got to everything has to neural neurally muscular everything it needs to fire at the same time you know all at the same time the engine after a period of time is going to get wrecked yeah. sometimes it has to be taken in the shop then you take the engine completely apart and then you clean each part right and you fix each part each part could be biceps triceps lat, all these things so you you put the car in the shop Right? And then you started fixing all the parts and then you put it back in the car. Now, when you go back out on the strip again, the timing is going to be a little fucked up. Right. It's, it's been a while. I'm, it's like it's like I'm not coordinated, but I'm strong. It's not coordinated, but the parts are better. The parts yes. are fixed. Yes, yes, right. Yes, so yes, now yes. over a period of time, the timing starts coming back in and then there should be less nicks and ticks and, and that yeah. kind of shit going down the stretch. Because all those things were usually the smaller body parts that weren't able to stabilize the bigger ones that created the issues in the first place. Yeah. You know, and all these imbalances kind of fall over a period of time. Everybody's a little different. Some people do this shit too much, and then they never get timing back. It's a weird balance. Correct. Right. So it's a weird balance of where it goes in there. And I do think looking back over all the years that yes, you can conjugate this. You can put it in with all the other shit. But there's still times, and I don't know how frequently it needs to be, that it has to just be designated just to that. The, the, we have, the, dude, I'm telling you, like, it's been, I haven't really, I don't want to say I quit powerlifting because I did the movements, I did yeah. powerlifting stuff. But, like, I just had to stop and almost forget that kind of stuff. It's almost like once you do something for so long, it, it gets ingrained in you. And sometimes what you ingrain in you is not a good habit or something that's not, that's not optimal. And... Like I said, I think going back to these things, they tie up loose ends. Um, and now, with your mind muscle point, if if younger lifters aren't doing some type of training like this, when you go to cue them, like you know, activate your lats, they don't know how to flex their lats. They don't have, have a lat. They don't have lats. They, they, they don't they, have they, a yeah, lat. Well, yeah, yeah. And they you might know. they might be able to flex their pecs, maybe, maybe biceps, but outside of that, they don't know how to flex shit. You know, so. Those also teach some of that. Well, and I also think, like, I think I've said this before, but, like, dude, when you, like, muscle stores energy, you know what I mean? Like, if you're weak and you, like, need to get stronger, the first thing Louis would always say was gain 25 pounds. You know, get bigger. You know, you get bigger, you'll get stronger. So, like, and my thing was, like, okay, I need to get bigger somehow. You know, when you're already 300 pounds, getting bigger, you know, is, you know, you're just like, I got to get bigger somehow. So sometimes it's changing composition and you might stay the same weight. You know, the, the scale might not change a lot. You're just changing composition composition but um yeah i just had a you got a real man on here said a brain fart well it's, it's changing the composition so as you start peaking towards this meet in november you may end up heavier correct right? because you started well with more so muscle, muscle so you so you're starting the training cycle and you, you know you have muscle you know i've got muscle but like i need more of it and i need it to be fuller and because you know muscle you, it's kind of like bodybuilders the side effect of their size is strength mm -hmm. you know what i mean so i'm i'm gonna take from that and if i can just put on some muscle that should affect my lean lifts you know what i mean so basically these past few months i've just kind of focused on uh the mind to muscle connection uh nutrition trying to put on some uh some just some quality whatever you know whatever they're whether it's size or muscle just something that that stays and then then you kind of just start turning the dial back to what you were doing so then you start pulling you start pulling off bodybuilding stuff, throwing in powerlifting, and you have this middle ground of stuff. And then, then the meat, you start getting 10, 12 weeks out for the meat, and then it kind of goes the other way. But we were talking after that, after Monday, dude, it was pretty significant. Like uh, some of the guys, it was like a Louis day where Louis figured something out and everybody's doing this now. You know, it's kind of like, wow, that, because I wasn't real sure. Like I'm pretty confident about most of the decisions I, I engage in. And I, once I make the decision, it's just all in. We got to do it. Because mm -hmm. if you don't go all in on that decision, you're not going to really know what to take from it, what works and what really doesn't work. And uh, in this instance, I was like, man, like, ugh, these, a lot of dudes are putting their trust in me right now and I got, <laughs> it's got to be right, you know, so. 
Um, I'm telling them to buy memberships at this other gym, you know what I mean? And they're already Mm -hmm. buying memberships at this other gym that we're training at. You know, it's like, uh, you're going to have to get some supplements now. I need you to have some isolate protein for after your workouts. We're going to need a meal replacement, Um, you know, just like, just stuff. It's, I mean, we're not going full, full on bodybuilding, but you know, they have a lot of good, they're bodybuilders for a reason. You know, there's, Mm -hmm. that's, there's ways to do things to anything that's going to make me stronger. I'm going to do it. And if that's what I get in this instance, if this is what I got to do to keep moving the dial somehow, then that's what I'm going to do. And, um, yeah, Monday it worked. So I have like, I have a good feeling about this year. So like this year, I think we're, it's going to be a little different than most years. Well, in, in past podcasts, you've, you've noted that you have certain checkpoints, like here's where you should be X weeks out. Here's where you should be. I'll, I'll tell out. you right now where I'm at. I, I'm like, dude, I'm like 14 weeks out. Like I shouldn't, I'm like way ahead. I'm like way ahead. Uh, in terms of like how my body feels like, you know, Louie always talks about GPP and doing, you know, you do all these special exercises to bring up the weaknesses to help keep you in shapes type shit. But dude, this other stuff, it just like when you, I just, t- we can just call it tying everything together. Like these, these little side things that are outside of powerlifting uh can contribute to that end goal and i guess that's i'm very end goal oriented what does the ends justify the means and what i'm doing is that going to get me to where i want to be at the end everything has a sole purpose you know like so i I, my uh, the main thing that i was looking at this time was is all this back shit I'm doing? Because Louis would hammer it. You gotta do more back, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, it, so it's like, okay, I'm just gonna hammer the shit out of it, and and I, it. I, I'm kind of shocked at how it transferred over. And I didn't think it. You know, most times when you try something, it doesn't work that well. But you know, when it, when it's working for five, six people around you, it's like, okay, that was a good thing. It's a good point you just made, though, that people need to understand is most of the times you try shit, it does not work. No, no, but sir. You still have to try the shit, right? So a lot of people won't, though. So you, they... can't ride a two, you can't ride two horses with one ass either. So if you're doing that, for the most part, you can't be like, well, I'm going to do back workouts on Monday. Then on Tuesday, I'm yeah. going to come in and I'm going to pull speed deadlifts. Then on Wednesday, like you can't no, do that's that a good shit. Point. No, you have to, and people fuck that up. So too. this yeah. is a good point. And I can yeah. maybe elaborate on this a little bit. You're like, well, how do I even incorporate all this shit? So when I'm thinking like, where, how am I going to position these days in my current scope of training? My current scope of training didn't change. You know, Sunday's speed bench press day for me, dynamic effort benching. Mondays are a back day or a deadlift day. I'm off Tuesdays. Wednesdays is a heavy bench day. I'm off Thursdays. Fridays is squat off Saturday. So, like, that split never changed. So, like, when I would go to the gym, like, whether if it was a Sunday and it was a speed bench press due, I would do speed bench press oriented muscles in the bodybuilding gym. Does that make sense? Yep. So, like. But you're not doing the speed bench press. Correct. Well, I, I will say this. I, I did it more so on the heavy stuff, and I kept the speed. So I kept the speed bench pressing as, like, a constant for explosive power. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so you the know. max effort was dumped. Essentially, it was more like every other week. You know, I right. would kind of back that. Because, cause, dude, when you when you start hammering rows and biceps in your fucking forearms and shit, get all torqued and bite, you can't do. Mm-hmm. That's how you tear biceps, and you get tendonitis and shit like that. And so... I kind of prepared myself, you know, when I was going ham, you know, doing, doing four and five plates on row machines until you just couldn't do it no more type shit. And I think there, you know, I hear people talk about, you know, I, I like Dorian Yates, you know, I'm, I'm a big Dorian Yates fan. And I know some people talk about not having to go to failure all the time, but um, that stuff worked for me a lot. We, we used to do that stuff in, in Westside a lot. Uh, it's like speed bench press days, you know, you do your you do your band sets and they pull the pull the bands off and you do like a rep out with two twenty five or two fifty or whatever it was, and then you we would always try to push that number up, you know, every and in that one three week you'd have three week wave in one of those three weeks typically it'd be in the second or the third you would do that rep out. So, you know, you would do it bands and then you'd come around chains and then that second or third week you'd try to rep out again and try to beat the the, the th- the rep out from the three week wave before. So we do shit like that. And yeah. So the reps tell you if you're right or wrong on what you're doing too. So if you're, if you, if you do a two fifty rep out set and you get whatever, however many fucking reps, and then you continue doing what you're doing. Otherwise, the next time you come around to that rep out set, if you do more, 
reps with that same weight or the same reps with more weight, you know that your training is at least eliciting some sort of Correct. response. That's a, yeah. that's a you good way to put it. And it's then you like have like a, a constant. Yeah, yeah, because if all of a sudden... Kind of goes back to raising the average. You know, yeah. you're, you, you have at this average stable, number yeah. and it just slowly raises it. And almost like that pushes the max effort number. You get so close to it that it's almost like... That overall average, once you push that overall average up, it kind of like kicks the max effort forward yeah. without necessarily, like, see, Louis will say reps don't equate to absolute strength. So it's not absolute strength, but it will make strength endurance is something, you know, like. Well, it will, it's just another indicator, though, for you to track if there's forward progress or regression. it or does back fucking back matter also. Yeah. Like it does, like, if you have a 225 set and you do more reps, it doesn't mean that your 1RM is better. But if you're doing more reps, that means you're better conditioned, you have more muscle, so that when you transition back over to get the timing back, you will have a bigger bench press because of that. Yes. But it's not like a one equals one thing. And I think that's what people have a hard time with. Like, when I come off a of meet, like, you're not going to see me pulling a max effort single. I, I'm going to pull, like, I'm going to do rack pull triple or a double or something like that. And just to get the work in. Now, like... If my double is a better, because if I PR my double, does that mean that my deadlift's up? No, not necessarily. It just means that from the last time I was in this training situation, I got a little bit better. And I have to trust that when I do take a single, the first time you take heavy stuff, it's probably going to feel uh, disconnected or heavy because you're used to doing the reps. But... In actuality, like if you give it the time, people are nervous to give it the time. Like even he's just said, he's like, I was pretty confident, but I wasn't a hundred percent sure. Right. And he's the best to ever do it. So when you've got Joe Schmo, who's been lifting for two, two years, most of them are not going to have the confidence to say, okay, let's take four months to bodybuild, not take a heavy single. Right. Still practice the lifts and everything. But not take, and then they take a heavy single. Like, what the fuck? I didn't PR. Yeah. It's like, well, motherfucker, you've been training for distance running and you just took a sprint. You need to give it a second to like transfer over. Mm -hmm. You know, like I bet you in three weeks, if he pulled another four inch block pull, he'd PR the fuck out of it. Mm hmm. But, like, because he doesn't have to because he knows that it's working. But people are scared of that, like, like what would you say, delayed gratification. They, they don't, it's like, you don't get to just, like, do bodybuilding training for six, week, six weeks and then on six weeks and one day take a full gear free squat and PR your fucking yeah, free squat. Yeah, be the That's greatest power lifter of all time. Yeah, in yeah. The I mean, it's, it's it's all it just, just amazes me that people think that it, you could, it's all, I mean, it really it's like, does. They're like, why does this feel so fucking heavy? And it's like, well, motherfucker, because you haven't taken a heavy weight in a long time. Yeah. It's supposed to feel heavy. It is heavy. But like, you're not accustomed to that. You're accustomed to the other thing. Now let's use the other thing to help build the thing that you ultimately want. It's right? like you essentially have to like step away from the heavy thing. So the heavy thing will work the next time you come around to it. You know <laughs> so what I mean? when going to your, your, your bodybuilding training. So I want to reiterate what Anthony was saying. You're not throwing other days in there. You're not being, no. you're not having bodybuilding days and powerlifting days. Because it's I was, I was days. torn between that because so, <laughs> the, whole, the whole powerlifting world gets <laughs> fucking flipped upside down. We'll see guys doing, well, well I don't have time off, to do this. And back off sets in mm -hmm. their suits mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, it's like, how, how, what are you actually doing in there? You know what I mean? Like it, they, you shouldn't be in there any more than a few. I mean, some of those back workouts took a few hours, sure. you know what I mean? But, um, so same days, you're just trading out the movements. But my question is when you're doing the movements in the higher rep ranges, how are you doing? What is the intent of those movements? Are you training them like a bodybuilder where you're trying to slower tempo? It's all range? tempo, dude. So this is something else I noticed and this is wild. so like, so one of my Achilles heels and I'm always very you know, introspective on myself is like, I don't have, I don't have super grip strength. You know what I mean? I got an 800 pound deadlift, whatever, but you know, I don't have super grip strength. I probably couldn't hold on to 900 if I tried. Um, and I started, you know, doing those, ro just getting on those machines, whether it's a row machine or some kind of shrug machine or like a lap pull down machine. And, you know, you're doing, st I learned this from Scott Mendelson. Um, when I would go out to California with him, um, we go to Venice Golds and I'm just like, how do, like, what are we going to do in here? You know, I'm, I'm so rooted in West Side. I'm used to being in a, you know, in a, in a, yeah. I'm like, how does this going to work? And all, and all I would watch that dude, he would just go, you know, he would do half the stack, full stack, full stack, full stack, add a, add a piece of weight on top. Like that, it didn't matter what it was. It, it could have been a bicep curl. It could have been a lat pull down. It could have been a calf raise. It didn't matter what it was. So 
we so tempo i think is building grip strength you know when you're sitting there just holding on and i think it's the mind to muscle thing I, I i watch people train all the time and it's like dude you're not you're doing tendon presses you're not even in the muscle you know what i'm saying like if it, a tricep rollback you know mm-hmm. what i mean you're not even in the tricep you if you if you watch people do a kettlebell benches for and they're just sitting there benching you know what i mean and it should just bounce all over the place it's like that's not helping anything it's like so there's something to like the tempo uh that builds the mind and muscle connection. I think it, it builds muscle, you know what I mean? Contraction. Um, I found that like, you know, obviously when you're sitting there contracting all the time, it's kind of like a rack pull. Why does rack pull make your fucking upper back and your trap so big? And cause you're sitting there straining so hard on it all the time. So I, I have kind of like straining and like tempo. I kind of like, they're kind of like cousins to me, you know, like I, I kind of view them the Explain same. the tempo a little bit more to me. So say you're doing a, a chest supported row. Yeah. Like you can sit on there with your strength and probably put six plates on there and hammer out a set of 10 What's, or put three on. Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good point. So I never, it kind of also depends on where I'm at. So if I'm closer to me and I'm going to be stronger, you know what I mean? I'm going to yeah. use heavier weights, you know, or I'm somewhere out right now, three, three and four plates on something like that. You can still get a whole lot out of, um, a lot of the tempo stuff for me is like uh, five and six seconds back, five and six seconds forward type stuff, you know, um, um, real, just staying in it. You know what I mean? A full, full, you know, what do you, what do you want to call it? Um, a f- I don't know. He trades all of his full range of motion. He trades all of his accessories pretty slow as far as tempo. Yeah. Just like from, you know. No, I think that like I said, it's yeah. hard to evaluate yourself. Like I train, I watched, I learned a lot. I trained because, like, people would take like their speed bench workouts and then you watch them doing like some overhead press after and they're like, gah, gah, gah. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, no, dude, like you don't, you need to. He he got me to like, it's like no, dude, like we're just we're just pressing and bringing it down. And it's smooth, and you're just staying in the muscle. Like when you're training speed bench, you're training for speed, and when you're doing the accessories after, you're training to put yeah. muscle on. Yes, you know what I mean. And yeah. and that I think people miss that. No one's gonna be like, how explosive can you do a tricep push down? Who gives? No, a but this is a tough one, man, because it's one of the things I train or that I teach during the clinics is you know how to train like a bodybuilder, right? Because yeah. you can use that tempo, say on a chest supported row, and go to failure. But then I can say, okay, now fucking give me eight more. And when you go into like full drive powerlifting tempo, you can do. You got to learn more. to get in a gear, and I think developing yeah. gears and for it, 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 see bodybuilding will give you a whole other kind of gear. I mean, some if you got muscle, you you see those dudes that just got big muscles over there. Like, how does that guy even doing like a, a curl with three plates? You know, it could be anything. But um, brain fart, help me. Tempo. The, the tempo as far as keeping the the gears or the. the the gears is what you were saying. So saying I, you need different, le- like different gears, different, different like gears. So the like bodybuilding gear is a slower gear, which is a tighter gear. Especially when you're in like when you're using multiply gear, for example, like things are things don't happen fast. Bad things happen fast when you put. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's a good point. So like. You know, that it, that bodybuilding gives you that like it's almost like that four wheel drive low gear. But my, the point I'm saying is most people don't do that because they just see three sets of ten. So then when they go to do it, all they want to do is do 10. Correct. But if they keep the tempo and the gear slow, like you're talking about, they may fail at six, but they're not going to let themselves fail no. at six. So they're going to start to go faster and cheat. Make it hard. Make these things hard. It's like I can fucking. Heavy, not hard. There's heavy, not hard and hard, not heavy. Yes. You know, elaborate. So, so I can, like, like he was saying, like I can do a skull crusher with, I'll put, I'll put, take an easy curl bar and put 10 pounds on each side in a mini band. And, uh, I remember Travis Fletcher, he taught me that we do these things called eight, eight and eights. We do eight off our head, eight off. We do it eight presses and then eight back off our head. And that would burn you, burn you out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But th- that thing would make you somehow it would just, there's like Donnie Thompson would say, there's just things that do things that science can't, there's just things that work that science can't explain. And they just work and you do them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's just kind of like one of those weird things that like. Um... They're hard. It's hard. It's difficult, but you can't really put your finger on why it isn't. When you say hard, not heavy or heavy, not hard. Like I think of like when I hear that, I think of the like narrow stance, low box squat. Right. And Lou explained that. Yeah. To me. So like it's like the weight's not going to be. It's like I'll take fucking 900 pounds to a regular box in fucking briefs. No problem. But you can get a this a similar stimulus 
by going to a low box narrow stance, you're only going to hit five plates, six plates. It's going to be fucking hard, but it mitigates the amount of weight the 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 amount of weight you're putting on your back. It helps save you a little bit, and you're going to yeah. still get a good strain. I think the tempo stuff does the same thing. Yeah, that that's that's a good that's a good point um, of um, hard not heavy. So like where Louis would say intensity, he would use the word intensity. You would weigh the intensity. So that's kind of like what that is. Uh, you know, if I'm doing tons of reps, um, throwing a band, that's, in you know, making it more intense, uh, what increasing the tempo, things like that is like hard, not heavy, uh, low ass box squats with sub maximal weights, um, just super low full range motion type stuff. Um, deficit pulls, deficit, hard things, you know, like things that you're not going to be going heavy on because they just can't really, but your body responds because it's hard. And it's the strength curve, right? So yeah. it's like, you're going to get the same stimulus. That's how Lou kind of explained it to me. It's like, so if you take 900 to a, whatever, a 13, a, a 14 inch box, right? So you move it however many inches, it's 900 pounds, right? And you move it from here to here. And then you take four inches off of that. And now you're going whatever, I forget how many I said, but you're going to a 10 inch box now, right? Not only is it four more inches down, it's four more inches mm -hmm. up too, motherfucker. So you just added eight inches to the movement on the bar, right? So you're almost, it's almost double the amount of time that you're under that weight. So yeah, you might take a thousand to a box. You might take 500 to a low box, your body, what did Louis used to say? It's like, you get beat up in a dark alley, you don't know who did it, you just know you got beat up. Yeah. <laughs> Same sort of fucking thing, right? So it's like, you can get that stimulus. So like, of course he could put on fucking seven plates on a chest supported row and just blast them. But instead, so he doesn't kill himself for no fucking reason. It's like, if I can get, what did you, uh, you said it to me, I believe it's like, what's the lowest, like the lowest weight that you can get a stimulus from? Yeah. That's kind of like where that's like what I was trying to explain earlier. There there is a, there like is a number that is so low. Like what what is the least amount I have to do to get something? People think that's lazy, but it's not. It's smart. It's actually harder it's, if you do it right. Well, and, well, and also it's I think that I said this the other day where it's like you it will take we all had those crazy times where we trained insane like yeah. you know, everybody went through that time, right? And it's kind of like a battle of attrition who can get further right so the control training with the like the looking at it from a larger perspective it gives you the opportunity like it might take you longer to become elite but once you become elite you will be elite for longer do you see what i'm saying yeah, i don't know if it's going to take longer because you have to recover from every stimulus you put in well i mean my my squat jumped 175 yeah. pounds in 18 months because i trained like an asshole you know what i mean i just happened to yeah, stay yeah, in yeah, one yeah, piece yeah, yeah so i my squat went from pretty good Really good locally, pretty good nationally, to a top 10 all-time squat in my weight class in 18 months, right? I stayed together for that, and then I kind of got fucked up. I had to slow down and be smarter about it. Yeah. So it got me to be elite very quickly mm -hmm. in that particular lift. Sustainability, auto-regulating yeah. like you talk yeah. about. There, it, how long can you stay here? Like, how many yeah. motherfuckers do you know with barbell tattoos that don't even lift weights anymore? I know quite a few that I could <laughs> name by You know name. what I'm saying? They're oh, yeah. all wearing, they're all doing gi and no gi training now yeah. instead of lifting weights. And or guys, guys who used to beat you maybe when you were younger aren't lifting weights anymore. And now who's the fucking king? And there's guys who used to kick my ass all the time that I don't, I don't even know if they lift barbells anymore. Well, it's, it it's sounds like, like to go back together. to a story that you were telling earlier that your JM press sounds like an example of this. So the JM <laughs> press before, you know, in, in the AM crew compared to the night crew. So walk through what. That story was. So it was, when I first got to West Side, I could do like a plate and a quarter for like, you know, five, seven, whatever. And Lou had me really push those to, and to a point where I did two plates quarter, like to my neck, for, it was either three or five, right? My bench went from, in a shirt, 520 to 525. For what? And my elbows hurt all the fucking time. For what? And then I go with him and we're doing skull crushers with a quarter on each side or a dime and a, and a band yeah. and my bench goes from 570 to 640. So what's the difference with the tempo with these? Well, the other about? ones, you're just trying to survive it, right? Just, yeah, you're, yeah. you're, you're just, like, I'm going to not die. Ah, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, you're raging you know, out five like, reps. Ah, you know, yeah. and then, but with these, it's more so like I would literally try to put my fucking mind in my elbows and like him, sometimes we'd be training. And I'd be like, how many are we doing? And he can just do them till they're fucking hard. Well, that's another thing I'll touch you know, on. It's like, not 12 reps. It, like some people's burn is not another per person's burn. My burn is not his burn. So like, dude, people come up to me. 
how many how many reps are we doing today? It's like, dude, just go fucking do them. Like they want the secret, Dave. What's the secret? The secret is is you. What's the, the secret? That's the secret. You have your own set of <laughs> limitations. Like you need to understand and figure them out. Like twelve reps for me is not twelve reps for you. Like I was telling Kovach this when he tore his peck. Like uh, we've been killing the bamboo bar, you know, putting the hanging kettlebells and all the shaky shit. And uh, we starting out, you know, 10, 15 reps, and then, then it's 20 to 25 reps, and then it's add a kettlebell, get into the 30s, uh, add another ke- – and as time progresses, you're adding kettlebells and adding reps because you're obviously – you're getting stronger. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're starting to bounce back from uh, whatever problem he had, like tearing his pec. So – Let's take a piss break real quick because I'm going to die. Owen, are you ready? His eyes are Are turning. (laughs) You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH First. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code tabletalk10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. All right, guys, I want to thank today's sponsor, Element. I'm having fun with ads now instead of just trying to like read through all the talking points and so forth. But there's a talking point here I have to read through. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything that you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt and no sugar. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. I've had and have been in the habit of drinking a half a pack before every leg training session and all my cramping issues that I had went away because I've always had cramping issues on heavy leg days and leg days especially. Head into our description box and click the link that's there for Element Or if you're listening to the audio of this, it's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash table talk. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. The date is October 20 and 21, Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last year. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning Uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 38% off or 48% off. It's, I don't know, I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all the different lectures that you want to go to. The caveat is there's three or four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures 
for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and gives you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is, it's a streaming service. So it's, it's if you've ever purchased a training course from anybody before, it's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch, you stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium, a limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound at Elite FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there just to train and to hang out, have some barbecue, have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left, depending on how you want to look at it. Go to the link in the description. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast. As we move forward, we have a lot of the presenters booked for the podcast. So we'll be talking more about it. We'll see you there. This big. Yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> fuck. I mean, the chalk, it wasn't, it was, there was no point. All right, we good? Yep. Maybe we go to chalk and it was, it's just goop. Yeah. It's, it's probably kind of like what you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, I like, like those days do? though. Like I said, like when it gets really hot in there, we had a squat session last week and it's fucking hot. And I just like, I looked at one of my guys and I'm like, I fucking, I could tell they were kind of dragging ass. And I was like, I fucking, I like it when it's I like love this. this shit. Because oh, it's yeah, like, yeah. You, you have know, to change it. Like once it gets to that point, you just have to like embrace, like embrace yeah. the suck. You know, you people say that shit. But yeah, you change it. You redefine it. You have to yeah, become yeah. aggressive yeah. with it. Like I fucking like, I like this, this now. It makes, I said it makes me feel like a psycho because I'm like, let's fucking go. Let's lift weights. And then it kind of reminded me of like, uh, you know, like playing hockey or football, you know what I mean? Like where your coach, it's like double sessions beginning of the year. And it's like, I have to fucking survive this. And every other pussy is throwing up or whatever. And I'm like, nah, give me, I mm -hmm. want more of this. And it, it kind of puts me back in that mindset now because we're not a private gym and we want members. We try to keep it kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. But like at night when we're training, it's fucking, it gets fucking hot in there. Bad times don't last, but bad, bad guys do. Yeah, I, I enjoy I enjoy it quite a bit when it gets like the cold. I can't do. You got to do the NW Scott Scott Hall. I can't do, do, the, do, the, <laughs> can't do the cold. The cold bothers me more than the hot. Yeah, a yeah. cold gym fucking bums me out. Yeah, especially the older you get. Or not that I'm old, but like my training age, I would say is rather yeah. old. You know, uh, it's harder to grease the wheels. Like, yeah, when you first it, get in there, it's it like just, mother. No, it sucks. Like, oh. It feels like I'm molten in granite, and I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. like. Like just, they used to have a space heater in the doghouse when Val first started training there. We first moved to Ohio. She'd go down to Laura's twice a week, and then the other two days she'd train at doghouse, and I'd help her when I got out of work. And there were a couple of times she'd go in there, and there's this little. It was before Jimmy like fully took it over, remodeled. It was when it was just the one side, and there was this like little. It was probably like. 12 inches by 15 inches like this little fucking space heater that you'd like stretch the cord for as long as it might you'd be put the to, bar in front of it to <laughs> like, warm the bar yeah up. like that was like you try to like <laughs> oh she try to squat and she say like her hands hurt like grabbing the bar and shit yeah. it's like uh, it makes you feel grateful when you get when you're not in a situation yeah, like that. the bar you know <laughs> how is i guess for both of you how has your training changed because you just kind of touched on it throughout i don't want to say training age like just biological age, just as, as you've matured as humans, right? Because you start out just a fucking high school kid, no responsibilities and nothing. So it's pull the trigger on everything. Right? So it's crazy. And then there you go through all these phases of either education, marriage, all these different things that life happens. Yeah. How, what things, what are the bigger things that you can think of that have changed throughout your training at a macro level. So, so mine's a little unique because I started powerlifting a little later in life. This is my ninth year of competing. I haven't been to 10 years yet, but I played hockey my whole life and I was a skateboarder and shit. So I had a lot of, um, uh, Kellen said a lot of, uh, salt on the hull. Like my body was beat up before I started miles. Doing, yeah. I got some miles on me before I'd already had knee surgery before I even started playing or started uh, lifting weights competitively. So um, I kind of started late, which made me feel like I had kind of nothing to lose. So I trained really recklessly. Um, my late twenties, early thirties. Um, I'd only been 
in multiply for less than two years when I went to West Side. So um, when I got there, it was just like, it's psycho time. Like, I'm just going to do everything crazy. And for a while it worked. I think I started to slow down when I had a pelvic floor injury that gave me a really hard time squatting. Um, and I had to kind of figure out like that whole thing, you know, like everybody talks about, like we didn't know what we were doing until we sat down at breakfast. And that's kind of true, right? Mm -hmm. It might've been very true when you were there. Um, and, and when I was there, it definitely was a thing. Um, but when it really changed when Dave kind of looked at me and said like, bro, like you can't do a pin three quad purple band rack pull and then fucking two days later get in a bench shirt and try and do something cool. It's not going to fucking happen, right? You got to back off. So it, it started in a way to like just set up better training days. That's when my training kind of changed from like the psycho time to, to that, right? And then it's kind of, I've used that to mold around like as I've gotten a little older what I have to do to stay whole right and some of the stuff I do less of and some of the stuff I do more of like so for me I couldn't do like a raw ass to grass squat with a narrow stance three years ago because my it hurt my fucking knees like my hips like it just didn't feel good I was I was always wide and we're going to a box or we're in gear like that's it right um even on some of the deload days we would do you know where we would just fuck around with a mars bar or something like it was terrible for me so adding in the i do 100 lunges every every day 50 each leg um has helped a lot just regain that range of motion where my knees feel solid because they're just always moving i really am a believer of a, a object in motion stays in motion right so within reason so um 100 lunges a day that's really helped my knees stay and and being in the gym with the athletes that i train now i had to become a little more pliable and less like of that like sticky rigid sort of powerlifter um and so as i've gotten older some of the stuff i don't do like there's certain movements that i don't you're not going to catch me benching with a bow bar it ain't fucking happen. I'm not going to bench with a cambered bar. Um, yeah, I'm, me either. <laughs> like, I don't want, I want my pecs to stay where they are. Um, we do save pecs where I come from. Yeah. We, <laughs> we do save we pecs. Do. We save pecs. We save pecs. <laughs> it, it looks better when they're wrong. There's so, a t-shirt right yeah. there. Man. So we save pecs. Right? So, so I, I don't do stuff like that. And I won't do the like. I won't do the low box raw squatting to a max effort anymore because to me it was just more of a dick swing than anything. Whenever I was in the morning and we'd do that, we'd be like, we're going to post this and show them how strong we are raw. And it's like, who cares? We don't compete raw. Yeah. So why risk it, right? So risk versus reward. On the flip side, the stuff that I do more, like I don't do extra workouts. I don't do any of that stuff. I, I, I stopped that several Didn't years ago. Didn't you used to? I used to. Ugh. And someone told me. He goes, like, what do has, you do? I'd go in the who, gym and like, what are you doing? Who here? has the most muscle on their body? Bodybuilders. How often do they train their body parts a week? Once. I'm like, fuck. Okay, good point. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, but. Maybe twice. But. I've done, <laughs> I've done like, uh, I do more push-ups now and variations of push-ups. That has helped me keep my shoulder and my pec health much better. So we do like one of my go-to accessories on a um, on a heavy bench day uh, is a like a triple set of push-ups, and I'll change what we're doing. So I'll do we'll set up boxes that'll be like 24, 18, 12, and we'll put our feet on the boxes and go like 10, 12, 15 reps, or we'll go the other way. Or we'll put our hands on the box. We'll do incline. Or we do, they, we have those like perfect push-up things. Yeah. So I'll come down with it like this. And when I press, I squeeze in and I squeeze my pecs. All while trying to keep my shoulders sucked. We'll do the chaos push-ups, push-ups on a bar. And I try to do them always supersetted with some sort of like external rotation for my humerus, right? To keep my shoulders in line and so I don't end up really rolled forward. So that's something that's changed. I'm adding something to my training even though I'm getting a little older and I feel like because it's not a lot of wear and tear, it's more, it's almost like, I think of it like how Lou would speak about like a reverse hyper, how it can be restorative. I do think that the push ups are part of why my bench has gone up without re injuring myself because it's like low risk. What the when fuck's you, gonna when happen? When you add those things in, does something get pulled out? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I, yeah, I think a common misconception too is, and, I don't know if it's, I, I would assume it's the same for Dave, but it's like when I walk into the gym, like I basically know what we're going to do for a main movement. 
I might have seen something on Instagram that I wanted to try for an accessory or like might have thought of something, seen an old video myself, whatever, been like, or I got a hair across my ass and I want to do something hard for one of the guys in the group or whatever, right? But for the most part, it's like I'm doing a set and I'm thinking of the next thing or I am I see, all right, all of the guys that we have right now, we all just missed our top set on a fucking rack pull. Well, I guess we're doing demos next and pull throughs because our glutes are fucking trash. And I just kind of figured out that way. And I don't like I can tell when we're done like you know what I mean mm -hmm. or I have an idea of it's like okay it's Monday we're doing speed pulls and we're gonna do you know some hamstrings and glutes and lats and shit and then as towards the end I'll be like okay it's week two for our squats so squats are gonna be kind of hard this week on Friday okay we're done for the day we'll do a couple sets of reverse hypers be done in anticipation of the other days and then other times like it's week one motherfucker on friday so we're gonna kill ourselves on on monday sometimes we don't have to sometimes like a main exercise or something can will dictate usually the group of exercises you do after it it exposes everything right like yeah. If, yeah. especially in a group because if everybody or a high percentage of the people in the group are having the same issue it's like heavy lies the crown right like everybody in his group like out here like even when i come back here it's like what are we doing dave like i just follow him and everybody in the group does the same thing and where i'm at now they're all looking to me so you have to look at the health of the overall group does everybody look fucked up is there one guy that's fucked up because that doesn't matter to me is everybody having a hard time with this one thing okay we're gonna do that like inverse leg curl F fucking I got like two or three guys in my group that are ass at inverse like they fucking struggle with it so we do those pretty frequently I'm not going to do anything negative for me I'm not great at them they're not something that I need necessarily they're going to help me and a bunch of guys are bad at them so we add them in so I don't I wouldn't say I specifically drop stuff off I just train until I feel like I'm done on that day if that makes sense. Yeah. It's it's intuitive. and, and it used Taking to, what the day gives you. I used to write uh, yeah. it down, but it, I stopped doing that because I was at Westside. I wasn't going to be the guy with the book at oh, Westside. Yeah. No, you I fucking crazy. Exactly. Hey, Luke Edwards had a book. <laughs> I couldn't yeah, do it, right. dude. Yeah. I, I didn't have an 840 deadlift. I couldn't do that. Like, yeah. So I came in and I was just like, oh, we're just... And that goes back to when I was there. Louis would throw him in the trash can. Yeah. And it's... And it's we don't need that back. <laughs> well, it's... You know, I... I'm writing that down for it. I, I see both sides of it, right? Because one way it's teaching you how to auto-regulate better. Oh, I track my right? shit yeah. now. I just don't have a book. Yeah, it's, it's, but, the, you know, the other way is... You know, it gives you something to track. But most people, I do believe, are still writing shit down when they got home. You know, what they could remember, at least the big things. I have a, it, the, I have a the, file the, called Road to the WPO that I started my first week out, my first week of training after the first WPO came back. And I've written down every single weight that I've taken since then. It's mm -hmm. a fucking huge file on my computer. I go home and I write it down so that I have it because going into... um going into semis this year i was taking a squat and i was like am i free squatting next week I'm like fuck is next week the week that i'm supposed to and i'm like fuck this when it opened my phone i can get to the file there when was my best 1100 pound squat oh is it this meet what did i do okay i free squatted three weeks out boom okay yep i'm free squatting next week and i just put it in there because that's you know i didn't need to adjust it because i felt prepared to do that you know what i mean but i have that like to reference yeah um because I don't have as much time and experience where I can go back to 2008 and say, what was I doing? I have to like physically look at it and be like, okay, I'm kind of a dork that way where I'm like, all right, what did I do to get this? I'm going to do this thing to make sure that I'm in the best position to get that again because I know that worked and I haven't done it since. So I'm just going to put it back in and I have these records that it's right there in front of my face. I can see it and I can like go back in my phone look at the video be like that's what those training squats looked like okay i'm gonna try to mimic that and fucking do it again elaborate what on what you mean by the first exercise can dictate what happens next uh so like you know like if you're doing good mornings that opens up the route that opens up the door to do to increase the number of accessory movements that you would do because in my mind like a good morning opposed to like a heavy rack pull they're like they don't affect obviously good mornings suck and heavy good mornings suck but they don't do really what you know a rack pull will do to you so a rack pull is going to require more it's going to take more so after if once you complete both of those on two separate days you're like well i'm pretty waxed after doing these rack pulls i can pretty much only do these set of things 
you know, and usually that includes like some kind of hype or some kind of hamstring something. Yeah. Um, because on a heavy rack pull, I'm not going to go in there and fucking rip lats. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's it already like, happened. It's been ripped, dog. Mm-hmm. Like, it ain't, there's, you're not going to get a lot more out of that. You know what I mean? And you can even tell when you get into the body, when you're doing bodybuilding stuff, you'll get to this point where, like, you just can't, you can't do it right anymore. Like, I'll be trying to curl something, and, you know, I've done a whole lat workout before the curls, and I can't fucking do the curls. Cause it's, it don't feel right. It, it just, it's like... I've I've roasted the connection like it's it doesn't work anymore, and so like the next time I was like, well, I'm gonna do biceps first and then do lats second, and we'll, we'll switch it. I might do four or five bicep movements and then I might do three lat movements, or you know, you kind of switch them around. So you 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 roast one in a different order, which allows you to do you know, if I'm roasting my biceps first, it'll probably, you know, it, it affects how you you're able to pull things. So you obviously can't do you know heavy rows and stuff like that, and. And days you want heavy rows, for example, or I use rows a lot because I do a lot of rows. But um, anytime you want to do heavy stuff like that, you're not going to hammer biceps before then to to because then you can't sit there and yard on them. So that that's kind of like uh, people are scared that they're not going to do enough. I think that's part of it too. When you're talking about like dictate. they do more out of fear. Yeah, they're like, well, yeah. what if I don't do enough? It's like if you're worried about not doing enough based on that character trait you're probably doing too much. You know what I'm saying? If you're sitting there like, have I done enough? It's like, hey, psycho. If you're sitting there thinking about that, you've done enough. You know what I mean? And being able to like pull back and stop. Like in that moment, it's like he's not sitting there being like, well, I said I was going to do four sets of curls, so I'm going to fucking do them. It's like, no, he started to do it. He said, this is fucking garbage. I'm smoked. I'm done. And it could also, you know, sometimes like, you know, I do, you know, if you do manual labor like I do, like some days are just harder. I might, it might be a 12 or 13 hour day. And after that, it's like, this is where something called discipline comes in. Dude, there are literally th- three out of four training days. I get home from work and I'm just like, fuck this. Fuck today. You know, I can't, I can't fucking do anything. This was Monday, dude. I get home from work and I'm like, there's no fucking, like, yeah. I was supposed mm. to deadlift today. He's coming. I was like, there's no fucking way. And I'm just sitting there like, and then the little thing in the back of your head, it's like, well, do you want to win? Yes, I want to win. You can't let the bitch assness. Yeah, you still got to go. Do, then it's like, do you want this? It's like, the, these are things that like are always, is always, I, always it's, I don't even know if it's me asking my, something is asking me that all the time. When I don't want to fucking do something, it's like, well, somebody else is going to win. Do you want that? No, I sure as fuck don't want somebody else to win. You know, I'm going to, are you Do you want to do this? Do you want it? Like, and it's like a real thing. Do It's like, dude, sometimes I, it's like, do I really want to keep doing this? You know? And you got to ask yourself, it's like, Yes. Okay. Then do it. It's like, so then you take you a nap and you go to the gym. Like, dude, Monday, I, f- I felt like there was no way I was going to pull. I was like, dude, if I can pull my opener, I'll be happy. That's like where I was at. 765. If I can just pull that. It's a great place to start. Then, then you get to the gym, you start warming up. That's like a discipline thing. You just have to like put your head down on the days you don't want to do shit and just get in there because some of, almost every time those bad days will be good ones. Like I can't tell you how many times I didn't want to be there in the last fucking month and I go in there and I got something great from it. And it's like like my squat. Dude, I hadn't I hadn't I hadn't free squatted since November. And I haven't put knee wraps on since last November. It's like, okay, work up to a thousand pound and breathe. Sure. That's great. Moved great. Didn't feel hard. You know, I, I felt like I knew how to squat. Great. And same thing with the deadlift is like, you just got to go in there, put your head down and get it done. And most, most of those times in the days that you don't feel like it's going to be good, those are the days where you get the most. And you'll yeah. never be yeah. mad that you go either. I think that's like, you'll be mad at yourself if you don't go. If you allow, if you allow like your inner bitch you know, to, to dictate that you're not going to do it and you don't go later in the night, you're going to be like, I am the softest pussy in the world. But if you get yourself and go like something that, you know, I don't remember if Dave taught me or where it came from, but it's one of those things where it's like, just show up and start going through the motions, show up, start warming up. If you get partway through it and you still feel like a bag of shit, Shut it stop, yeah. but like go generally yeah. you'll get halfway through it and you're like that's not as bad as i thought and yeah, you put another fine. plate on you're like that yeah. wasn't bad either it's like well let's do it it's it goes like- the other way too though i think i think a lot of times in 
um, like internet culture and stuff like that. And just to be clear, like I love the internet. I think it's been great for powerlifting, but I think that in internet culture, um, people are scared to not do something cause they, they think they have to do the thing. And sometimes the discipline comes in to, to, to not do it. Right. Where it's like, I was supposed to get in a bench shirt today, right? Or whatever. I was supposed to do this today. And you get there and it doesn't feel right. And you've got the icky feeling and you know that it's not going to go good. It's just, just fucking stop. And, and it's fine. Like everybody says like, I'm willing to do anything. I'll do anything to win. It's like, will you not do something though? Yeah. Will, will you just stop because yourself? you planned it and yeah. that was the thing yeah. you were supposed to uh, people have all a problem the training with training cycles like all written like out. it's all written out <laughs> yeah, block yeah, periodization yeah, yeah, yeah. Shit, you know what i mean they have it all written out i'm going to do this this day this this day this this day this day say and then the auto regulation thing people that's like a really great thing i've learned from you mm -hmm. that like term um you don't like you don't always have to like push the issue like you, what is it though? Like, it, but there is something. It's funny because it's like when you do have when to, you know it's you bad. Ha you have to do it when you know you have yeah. to. No yeah. one's and holding you know a gun to your head and being like, so like if 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 like for example today we put a shirt on him and it wasn't great. It's like, all right, man. Well, we'll just try it next week because you can't be. be yeah. Chances of you being shitty two weeks in a row are you know usually not. And if and if you're shitty two weeks in a row, then it's like what the fuck. Is, then then you're like having to look at a whole other set of problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And. I think being able to back off is important and knowing that, dude, the like, you don't have to do it until you have to do it. And when it's time to fucking go, you have to fucking do it. Right. So it's like, I had a situation last training cycle and it's, uh, we were doing a free squat. It was the last free squat before, um, semifinals and i wasn't working up to a third i was just taking like a like a rough like a 1065 like a second he's raising his overall average like you do when you learn from the best so i so I'm, i need I'm, to put that on a shirt you really do <laughs> so i'm so i'm just doing my thing i take 10 30 or 10 25 or whatever and i felt something in my knee feel funny now it could have been the knee wrap it could have been whatever right and I had just been recently rewatching West Side vs. World. There's the classic thing where I felt something in my knee slide and Chuck put on a plate and I blew my knee off. Right. So that's in my head. And they're like, what do you want? 1065. Give it to me. Right. And I hadn't taken that weight in a while. I had had the weird knee thing and I'm sitting there and I got a little like, like wound up, like emotional about it. And I'm like, dude, like, I don't want to take this weight right now, but I have to take right now is one of the times where I have to, yeah. because a, I have this meat and B, if I don't fucking take this weight, I don't get to be the guy. I have to show my group of lifters that I'm different, right? So it's like, I don't know if he's going to be mad at me telling this story, but I'm going to like, I've watched Dave dump four digits. I was actually going to tell that story. <laughs> we were, he was reminding me of a story. It was, it was training for one of these WPO meets and the, I think it was, it was 1250 or something. I had it was, it was 1200s. Yeah. It, it was 12 something in the 12 and he fucking puts it off. Like I unrack it and the motherfucker dumps off my back Dude, and everyone catches it. He, he mm -hmm. goes, he puts his hands on the mono and it's just balancing there and he's like, it's okay. And we, so we, you know, we do takes his knee wraps off, takes it again, smokes it. Right. So, well, no, this is, I'll elaborate a little further. Yeah. Give it. They walk up. Are you done? Like no, I'm not done, That's and they're the like, feeling they want me too. to be done because they don't want to catch it again. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. It's not because they don't <laughs> yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're looking at me like I don't think Dave is is got it today. You know, you know, I just had a bad day. You know, sometimes when you get those big 1,200 pound squats and you catch the bar on a band and you unrack it, it sinks into your shit. It'll start fucking rolling, mm -hmm. and that's basically what happened. And I, dude, I'm I, like I said, the mind to muscle proprioception. You know, I just kind of know things when something's happening. I'm like, oh shit, you know, like there it goes, you know, and. uh I just kind of unracked it. I started to go down, and it just fucking flipped off my back. They all caught it, and they put it down in the, the, the little hooks, you know. And they're all peeling it off, putting it on, and they're all, like, uh, thinking that we're, like, kind of, like, hoping that we're done, you know. They start to put the plates away. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't put those plates away. Mm -hmm. So they loaded it back up and just just business as usual. You know, I got back under it, got my shit together and just did it. You know, like sometimes, like he says, you got to, there's times. And that was a time where I had to have that squat in training. Like I couldn't yeah. just pass it over. We're three weeks out from a meet. I need that squat. I, my body needs that. There's like times when you need to yeah, do things. It's non-negotiable. Correct. And, yeah. and that was one where I couldn't just say, well, I'll just do it at the meet. Cause what, no, what my body just remembered is I missed 1250. Not mm -hmm. that I got it and it was hard. And, and uh, you know, in hindsight, I turned around and got, it, it was just like any other squat I did. I just did it right. You know, it looked like, fine. Yeah. I remember he blasted it, yeah. but that's a separator, right? 
Yeah, well, in your case, it's the knee, too, because if you don't do that, then you go to the meat, still wondering, eh. Is my knee okay? Yeah, my yeah. thought you, was you this. Learn, if I blow you, it off, I blow it off. You yeah. know the threshold. Like, I'm, I'm trying, you know, like, when I'm feeling this pain, I'm still able to do these numbers. It's, well, and and when, when is out. it not negotiable? Usually right, when it comes thing, off, right? but yeah, usually, yeah, yeah. you know, you kind of well, know. I know that, but, but there's earlier, say six weeks earlier, you're not doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and I think that also like in that moment, it's like, what are you not going to do it? Like, because in the meat, if I take my opener and my knee feels funky, I'm taking my second. Yeah. So what are we not going to do it? Like, no, fuck that. We're doing it. And when in my situation, I ended up coming up blasting it. And I told my guys after, I was like, dude, that's a, di that diff that's a different part right that, that's what makes that's the part that's not on paper that's the difference between winning and losing sometimes but that's that's also the difference people need to understand better because they'll do that shit six eight no yeah they'll do when it you, all the when time you fucking have to do it and, yes. and i think that have to has different reasons like when we first got out there i was just getting back into you know i had been hurt and i was getting back into handling some weights we're doing a workup with a safety squat bar no hands four chains i think it was like 675 or something like that i'm doing a double and i do the first one like you know how like once you get forward in that bar you're fucked so mm -hmm. i get the first one and i'm standing up and i get the first one i go to get the second one and for some fucking reason i put my hands down on my knees ah. and push both of my knees forward fall on the box they peel the bar off me i thought i broke my back i couldn't feel my legs i was like what's going on i'm all disoriented i'm all and then so we get it going and i'm sitting there and i'm like oh fuck I'm like, well i guess i should probably take five plates or something just to like do something again and I'm sitting there like, mm. and I look at my wife and I'm like, what do you think? And she just goes, if Dave was here, you'd fucking take it again. I said, load it up. And I did it and I got it right. And to me, that was an, I have to, to prove something to myself because I was coming back from being real weak and gotten small in the move and everything else. So that was like an emotional decision, but it was an, I have to, and it was another thing that I felt would show my guys the separation between like what it takes to get to the next level and knowing like, okay, that was a stupid fucking thing that I did that has nothing to do with how strong I was. That was a dumb mistake. And now I'm going to show you that I can do it right. There's something that you said too, like sometimes when something goes bad, like, I'll give you an example. Let's say he, he did 675 and he crushed him. Some people, they're like, well, let's just take a plate off and and we'll go ahead and do that. And in my opinion, that that's like that, that has a detraining effect. Like, you're not like that's not. Yeah. There's sometimes where when the day's bad, you just need to fucking stop, move on. Like, just that's not that's, mm -hmm. to, you know, well, either do it. Or stop. Or, you or, can't go down. Correct. We're not going to take lighter. It's like weights. a meat. Like once you miss your opener, you can't. Like you know what? I'd rather take nine hundred. You know I mean? <laughs> can't do that. Like at least well, there's a mental side of all this shit too. It, know, it's so it, 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 sitting here talking to you a lot. You you realize like how much of it's mental. It's like a lot. It's it's and nuanced for like different people because some people because dude we had when i tweaked my knee we were going into the espn wpo i took a thousand pounds in the gym my opener was 1037 i looked like hammered shit it was so bad and i looked at him and i was like do i have to take another one and he was like no nah, buddy you'll probably be fine i opened with 1037 he knew in that moment my knee was fucked up i didn't know if i was going to survive my opener but i didn't want to take it here for no fucking reason fuck with my head i just squatted a thousand i'm fine dime five jump from that to my opener and i just went to the meet and i did it and i missed my second horribly and it was scary but in that moment the right thing to do was to not take another one and he knew it so it is so fucking nuanced and there's i said it the last time i was on here like experience like time doesn't mean anything without the experiences and the only way you know how to pull the trigger and when not to is having the experiences like the only way to find the line is to fucking jump over the line that's the only way you find it is to do the thing where you go past and go whoa too that much. was too much <laughs> yeah, like yeah. i can't fucking do that that's the only way you find it and some people don't want to do that you have and to, then also it, some people only want to do that. And you have to find it and then and establish it and then know <laughs> when you're up on it. You know what that's, I mean? That's the one. It's like go over it and then make a mental note. Be like, okay. That's well, where the line is. It has to still kind of be in the training process because at some point in time you're going to get in the meet and you're going to be coming up on a squat and it's going to get hard. Yes. Right? It's going and – and you have a split-second decision Yeah. You, that you're – you 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 know – I don't want to say you're going to tell yourself you're not going to get it, but you know it's fucking hard. Yeah. And you're always you, questioning it. Like, I've you, done this? Yeah. <laughs> can I, I mean, do this? I mean, it can slow down enough to where you're like, fuck, okay, what do I need to do 
to get through this. Yeah. But if you haven't been in that spot, most people, when they first, if you look at beginners that you work with and, and even intermediates, they begin to feel that pressure. It gets really, really hard and they just stop. Yeah. It's like, if they it's don't moving, know it could still go if they just kept fucking pushing. this much more, it's going to go the whole and way. Maybe it does stop for a little quarter millimeter, you know, just a split second. Mm -hmm. All they need to do is keep pushing and it will go. A lot too many people hit it. Just I think in a, in a training sense, I think that's where like max effort work come like helps with that ability to sustain a a strain mentally. Mm -hmm. Like you know when you're doing heavy rack pulls, you're just pull 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 pull. You know any time you any any kind of like any kind of max effort variation, <clears throat> especially with the pin pin pulls. You always say to us like, just get it off the pin. Don't stop. Because sometimes like, it's a couple seconds yeah, to fuck your moves, just right? Keep fucking it teaches pulling. you that you that 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 you just have to get like I was telling Kovach yesterday, he pulled six seventy five off that mat and his best pull off that mat was like six forty. And uh and he, his grip would always go at like uh six or a little over six hundred, and now all of a sudden dude's pulling six seventy five holding on to it at the top and it's like like Yeah, you said to him you're like it's gonna be slow. But just keep going. And you you, sometimes when you tell the it. people where it's going to be hard, they will they will know that it's going to be hard there. It's like, hey, man, you're going to pull on this. You're, it's going to move. And then it's going to feel like you hit a fucking brick wall and it ain't moving. I need you in that moment to just keep your head up and keep pulling until I tell you to put it down. And usually where you feel the fucking brick wall hit before you know it, you're being told to put it down. It's like um, I, I think things like rack pulls really, you know, teach that mm -hmm. um, you definitely that's probably one of the the biggest things that i taken from you to my lifters where i'll just be like all right man this is gonna feel like shit just so you know and when you get to your knees you're gonna feel like it's not moving and like he said just keep pulling don't do anything weird to try to finish it just stay in position and and keep going and teaching that to people like the refuse the refusal to allow yourself to miss i think is like because it's like we're all made of the same shit bro or even you be slow I mean? like, like the slow thing everybody wants it to be fast <laughs> everybody wants it to be i remember bob's like it ain't a race motherfucker you know you know you, don't, you only get three white lights you know yeah so like you don't it doesn't matter if it like if you're doing speed work of course it needs to be yeah. fast but like it's okay if you if your max effort work happens to be slow sometimes like if it takes you 10 seconds to pull a deadlift sometimes that's okay like, and honestly, probably good for you because it teaches you you can, you know, mm -hmm. and strain through those moments. I had a, um, you talk about those like little moments where you're like, am I going to get this? Like, is this going to crush me? And you make that split second decision. Like the, the clock is going, like you have a little stopwatch. And it's like, <laughs> like yeah. am I going to get this? Like, I think that, you know, speaking on the mental aspect, I think that part of it is like not allowing yourself the option to miss something. Like you just know you're going to do like, like the, I have to's right. Like you said, like the, I have to moments and the, when we were, you know, at semis this year and I had to pull a deadlift and it's just, I said to myself, like you can, you do not, you know, you, you, the little, that little thing that's like says to you, like, well, listen, dude, if you miss this, you're going to come in second at semis. That's pretty fucking good. You start getting that shit and that shit is soft as fuck. And, and, but everybody has that little voice. that's like, well, bro, you're pretty good. You did pretty good today. And if you miss this, you still did pretty good. Right. And in that moment, I had a, a, a thought that I was just like, you will not miss this. I gave myself no option. I said, if you miss this, you're just like everybody else. If you get it, you're different and you don't want to be like everybody else. So you better fucking pull this. And I had to in that moment. I did. But I think if I had allowed that doubt. Giving yourself an out. Fuck that. Yeah. Like, I've learned to, because I used to, that used to happen to me. Dude, it used to happen to me bench shirt sessions. I'd get, I, you know, that first set in a bench shirt, you fucking, you're like, ugh, dude. Like, especially, I'd be like, motherfucker, this shit feels like dog shit. I'm like, whatever, man. Like, worst case scenario, I can open with six and a loose shirt and we'll just fucking see how it goes. Like, this session. To, and then I started being like, no, motherfucker. Like, don't quit before it starts. Like, don't allow yourself to feel that way. Like, because all that is is setting it up so that you feel better after you do poorly. But instead, don't allow yourself to do poorly, and then you won't have to worry about that feeling after. And so, the like I said the last time, like the, the unwavering belief in yourself is huge, even when you're in the middle of a fucking lift. 
Like, no, yeah. motherfucker, this will not fucking break me. I will get this. I think another thing adding to that is sometimes you're just not strong enough. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, everyone, well, I missed it because this, you know, I, this, that, this, and, you know, you know, I, t- my, I t- flipped my elbow. You know, it could be, and they'll give you all these excuses of why they missed the lift. And sometimes, like, this is, like, I think what's helped me a lot. I just wasn't fucking strong enough. So then what are you going to do? It's like, it's, you need to, you need to train. You need, you know what I mean? Like I'm not strong enough. What am I going to do about it? You know what I mean? A lot of people, they won't just sit there and, and be like, I'm not fucking doing something right. You know what I mean? Well, it can be with, with the straining that you're talking about. That's a trainable attribute. Like your ability to strain for X number of time is a trainable attribute. So let's say the squat takes from the time you because as soon as you grab the bar and start getting set you're under tension right (laughs) but you're under tension before it comes out sure so if you actually time when you start getting under tension by the time it's racked it could be 15 seconds yeah right on the bench is the same way i mean you're under tension before it comes out then you're holding it then bringing it down Mm -hmm. so let's say as an example that that time under tension is 10 seconds to complete a full lift but said lifter only does doesn't hold the shit doesn't hold it after completing the rep, you know, doesn't hold it before squatting, right? Just go down, all right? And has never trained that attribute past five seconds Mm -hmm. or six seconds. So now it can be coming up on the bench and they can't finish the lockout because they've already exhausted the engine that can only go for that five seconds. Or the squat, they ran out of gas. Because their selection of max effort exercises are always three board, four board, high pin press, things that they're fucking good at. Yeah, the strength curve thing that we're talking about, go to the lower box. And the the board press stuff, Lou said that too. It's like, yeah, it's two boards. Yeah, it's it's two boards shorter. But it's also two boards longer, like, that you have to go. But to compromise, they can hold longer too. You know, so a lot of times you finish the rep, hold, 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 hold. Don't let them rack that motherfucker, you know, so they've held it for four seconds to kind of make up some of the deficit. Yeah. I never thought about training people to strain longer like that. Well, I think, and this is, that's why we do max effort work and that's why we do dynamic speed work. Speed work has become, you know, to recruit muscles, to be more explosive and faster, increase bar velocity. Um, That then decreases the time under tension, which... Um, is the time that you strain under a, a yeah. maximal weight. Um, sometimes when you get one out of whack, you, 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 you're you super fast. And I mean, I think, I think I don't want to say Chuck was an example of this, but he was so fucking explosive that he would blister 1150 squat out of the hole and then it would go up so fast he would just lose it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So there was like, uh, it's kind of in an instance like that, like, some dip max effort work in a different way would work, you know, to bring up your ability to to kind of like pass off that ex- you have this like careful balance of being explosive and being able to strain and uh, when you get you know if you're too slow how can i say it well you run out of time yeah like, <laughs> it's yeah. it's like a you literally run out of time you can look at a guy like like greg panora like he lifted slow you know you've seen a lot of guys lift slow and then there's lots of guys that are like fast 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 dead I believe you were mm-hmm. like a very fast, right? And so it's- yeah, Chuck and Greg are like two two good examples of that. Chuck super explosive, yeah. super strong, but like his explosive power almost overtook that ability to strain. Mm-hmm. Where Greg was complete opposite. That dude would pull eight. I've seen that dude. It was some, I, it was a meet somewhere sometime. Pulled eight hundred pound deadlift. It took him like ten seconds to pull a deadlift. <laughs> And it's like, I don't, like, I could have, I could have taken three bites of a sandwich and like, you know, like, like when he's still deadly. Yeah. I think taking the guys with the, that are very, very fast and having them go against a shit ton of chain is a good way. I know Lou didn't really like the chain, but Lou didn't like the chain for the reason that it's good for guys who are fast and not, then not, don't have the slow strong. Cause if you put 200 pounds of chain on a bench bar and work up to a one RM, if you're fucking trying to smash every one of those. You're gonna. It's gonna fall on your face. You're gonna dump it. You have to be in that other gear. They develop yeah. different you gears. Get, 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 you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Where you can kind of just like one more link, one more link. What? Whereas as with bands, like I'm not very good at squatting against bands now, but I used to be a motherfucker against bands because I got so good at cheating them and outrunning them. Basically. Yes. Um, it's like I mean, that's a good word. Outrunning bands. I think yeah. you're so fast out of the bottom. You're like, whoop! I'm at the top. Yeah. 
and it doesn't do anything that's for an, you. That's like where, like when I saw Chuck Squat. You know, I trained with him a lot. And yeah. He was so explosive, dude. And you'd see him at those Arnold, you know, Arnold meets. He'd come out and just, he'd, get, he'd come back and, you know, I think he would do so much band tension. I think the biggest band thing I ever saw Chuck do, he did 882 blues of green and a purple. Yeah. And it was before the 07 Arnold Classic WPO. And he went out and it, his best squat was like 1115. And he went out and opened with 1118, the all time world record. Cause he was supposed, cause the bands equaled 1400. So it was like, he's going to squat 1400, mm-hmm. you know, like, and, uh, yeah, like it just didn't. It, he went to the meet, open with like eleven twenty two, and uh, he bombed out in the meet. He just couldn't. Like it was like, it was like the things that were locking him in place were gone. Yeah. I had a very similar. I had experience. a conversation with him about that. He, he even told me that he was like, "Yeah, man." I was like, "I, I, I we just, I got to get away from bands, and you know, I, I think they locked me in place too much." So a lot of where I learned from a lot of the squatting come from Chuck. Like Chuck's mistakes, like he would tell them to me, and I would like make mental note of things not to do. So. Well, they, they, they comes on differently. You explained it very well. I mean, the, the, the chains, it is forcing you like, it's like a grinding time. It's it's different Yeah. where the bands, if there's a lot of them, I mean, there's, it's kind of like on rails. It's kind of like you have two extra legs. Yeah. Well, if you you can lean into them too. And it's like Lou says it, Lou used to say it doesn't keep you in a line, but my retort to that is take a fucking blue band, put a, put it on a bar, lift the bar. And drop it a hundred times, and a hundred times it will hit the same fucking spot on the monolith. Put two hundred pounds in chain on that same bar, and do the same thing, and it will land in a different place every time, because it it does. And and what I found with squatting against a bunch of bands is, it doesn't like a bar doesn't just go this way. A bar goes this way, this way, this way, yeah. this way. And with bands, you can't windmill. It grounds it. So if you're, you know. Yeah, like, you're I, locked into, you're like. I think mm-hmm. we almost had the same Circumax. Like yours was obviously much, but I did, I did seven plates, dime five, with blue, green, purple. And Lou's like, you're going to squat the 242 world record. No doubt. I opened with 1047 and missed it three times. Yeah, there's a good. I have a story about that. There was, a, I think this was on a Ferguson's Power Station Pro Am. Mm-hmm. I think it was 08. Um, I had done seven, and Chuck was there because you know he he would help me do a lot of stuff. And I did seven thirty five blue green and a purple and a pair. Of, I think it was a pair of briefs or something like that. And they're like, dude, you're gonna squat eleven thirty five. My best squat at the time was like a thousand five, thousand something like that. So I remember um, I opened with a thousand fifteen and I got crushed twice. And on my third, I barely got it. And it was like, I think these were times in West Side when we all like we, we, you know how we get real rooted in something and it works and everybody just rides it to the wheels fall off. And I think at that time, the wheels were kind of falling off of the the and this is where I think uh, Louis got frustrated a lot because the bands didn't they they made you super fucking strong. They made you, I, I've said this before, it makes you a super strong squatter, but it doesn't make you a proficient free squatter in gear because <laughs> you have to free, like Louie would never want to free squat, dude. He would never want to do it. Um, I, the only way I would do it was be able to go lift with Chuck, you know what I mean? Because he would leave Chuck alone. So like if you went and trained with Chuck half the time, Louie would leave you alone and you were getting stronger. And, uh, I would see time and time again, you know, like I, I know it personally it happened to me, 735 blue, green and a purple squatted a thousand fifteen off of it. And I was supposed to squat a hundred and 110 pounds more than that. Um, I, I just saw it time and time again. Um, Chuck was a good example of it with the, he did 885, two, two blues, a green and a purple. It was like, it was like 700 pounds of band tension. It's like, at what time, like, does this not working and then we went through some years at west side where he kept trying to pound that same thing into some of the new guys and they would get up around 1100 pound squat and then it's like dude you have to squat you have to squat these weights to squat these weights you can't just do a bunch of bands and some weight and think that that's going to make you squat louis did that because so many he had such a pool of a pool of data to pull from he he knew i've got this amount of guys they all did this amount of weight and 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 more in a very large percent of them did these numbers off of doing these weights against bands you know the yeah. circuit max bands and and it worked for a while and it worked it, it was just like i i, I think past that that was one thing me and him always butted heads on was he, he I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm free squatting like world records. Like, I don't, I don't understand why you don't 
Why you don't want to do this? Practice your sport, right? So with conjugate, right? It's like you could take a fighter or a gymnast or a fucking volleyball player or whatever and bring them in and they never touch a bench press all the way full range. They never pull off the floor and they never free squat. They never do straight weight anything, right? And then and they're going to become, they'll be stronger, right? And they'll probably get better at their sport. But that same, that fighter is going to go and he's going to do jujitsu and striking yeah. and he's going to practice. The hard part, one of the hardest things about conjugate for power lifters, it's funny because people think conjugate, power lifting, equipped power lifting. Yeah. The hardest part about conjugate is the sport specific training that has to, you have to mimic it because for us, our sport is very close to everything that we do in here. So how the fuck do we practice our sport and where do we put it? And, and, and you and you're lifting 90 percent to get an idea of what the fuck how the, the gear fuck will am, work. how the fuck am i going to practice yeah, yeah. in my bench shirt without going to 90 percent? it's very difficult yeah, right yeah. with any sort of like it's like yeah we're gonna what am i gonna take 60 percent to a three board like, what's the point <laughs> yeah. so that's the hardest part and i think a big misconception about about the conjugate system is is that it's just for powerlifting, and it's like actually powerlifting is one of the hardest things to utilize conjugate for because if you're uh name any literally any physical fucking endeavor any read book of methods and follow it without changing anything you're going to get stronger and you're going to get better it always seemed like if, louis louis put them around sprinters like a lot of it was like because sprinters you know they have to be fast off the track when they hear the gun and stuff i'd see him in there with sprinters having these sprinter girls do power cleans with bands like just crazy stuff like they're he'd always say like if you run to make your your if you sprint to make your sprint faster, you're going to get slower. You know what I mean? You can't run to make your run fast. You know you get what I'm mm -hmm, saying? Mm -hmm. That's something like he would say stuff like that. Like you can't, you can't run to make your, your, your time faster. You have to become stronger and more explosive to become faster. And I don't think that applies to, but those runners still knew how to run. Correct. They, they would still the practice, they would still practice, practice yeah. that. And for, it, and the other thing too, I think that like, being proficient in the mechanics of it, I think that's yeah. like a sprinter, but you, you have to do the sprinter things. And like us as power lifters, you know, the, for example, that box squat with all those bands, it, it got, it caused an effect. It made you strong, but like that you still have to, it didn't have the transference. Yeah. It doesn't have no idea where to put your fucking feet. Like, dude, like it's you, like you're a whole new creature walking out there. Like, <laughs> yeah, what is yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. Where this the fuck do I put my me? feet? Yeah. Where do I put my feet? Where if you've, it, it's like, if you never free squat and you only box squat and when you go to a meet, how the fuck are you going to know? where to put your feet, how to set the bar on your back, when, how to push back, if you're going to dip, how to dip, all that stuff. You, you have to practice that beforehand. I think that, like something we said earlier, like earlier in your training, you train like a psycho and it teaches you stuff, right? And it, and it gets you through. I think when I got to Westside, one of the things that it taught me was the fuck it button, where it's like, I haven't free squatted in eight months. And I have no, I'm basing my opener off of what I want to squat on the third, <laughs> which yeah. is outrageous. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. okay, um, but I haven't actually touched that weight since the last meet, and I have no fucking idea where to put my feet. Fuck it, tighten my straps, and we'll just let it ride and see. And it taught me how to have that, like, I'm not scared of shit, or if I am scared, I'm going to do it anyway. But it didn't make me an effective powerlifter. It's exactly, he just said it, like, a lot of guys getting up close to 1,100, and then they start having problems. So where does the specificity, where do you guys work the specificity in? We free squat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I learned you know? this from Chuck. Like, like um, you would you would have to spend time getting strong and fast, which is the box squatting. And then you would have to spend time uh, refining your craft, which in this instance is a, is a free squat. You know, um, most times when I free squat, I, I put everything on. A lot of people, you know, this last time I put briefs on, but... Um, most times I put everything on it, people, they try to, they'll, they'll increment, incrementalize a squat. Like if I do this much without my squat suit on, it means I should be able to do this much with the suit on. It's like, take all that shit away and just do it. You know what I mean? Um, I've said this before, like, um, depending on how far you are away from the meat, the bottom isn't real. And you know, like it, it, depending on your weakness, 
you should work from the bottom up or the top down. Generally, I work from the top down. If, you, if you're if you fucking shitty in the hole, you need to build it from the bottom up. If that's like where you're bad at, you start there and work up. If you are if you don't have issues down there, and the, for me, the bottom end just comes around right around the meat. Like I don't have to squat super deep all the time, but there's a time and a place. And, um, and that changes too because we reverse mine. Because you used to take me to like this crazy low box. All of a sudden I come in, I wanted to fucking scream. I was so irritated. He's like, nope, two inches are coming off your box. I'm like, fuck my life. I was so irritated, but he's doing it because I had a hard time getting down there. I was having a hard time staying in position. So we switched my box. Now my normal box is that box. And that's just what I fucking squat to. I take it to the hole every time. And now we've started working the top end. Mm -hmm. because that's the part where it's like, if I want to start squatting those mid high 11s, you know, this fucking around with those weights, I got to figure out how to get them out of the hooks. Right. So that's the practicing. And it's not always to depth. Like he says, it's just, we're working on this part of it. And then you got to break a squat down. Like there's, I mean, if you can just make it simple for the sake of uh, conversation, it's the bottom, the middle and the top, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, I start from the top down, you know, um, like we talk about chain squats, you know, I might be around four inches, two inches, you know, I hang around there. And then as the meat gets closer, I'm down, down further. Um, if people are having, like, there's things that you can do that will, will push your free squat. Like, so, um, if you're having problems in the hole, you know, like, let's say we go to a meet and you, you just having problems making depth three two one and getting biting up at one and we're not getting down there well um, that's where like he was talking we'll lower the box down take an inch out of the box start training there make that your new normal you know um so a lot of people they don't like doing that because sometimes pulling a mat means pulling a plate and then people have a problem with that yeah you know that but that's you have to rework back up to the you have to yeah yeah you have to take the engine apart like you were saying and you have to put it back together a different way with the same shit you got essentially well if you can't use the same right like if your normal weight is six and a half plates 200 and chain and you pull two inches off the box and you have to take a plate off well we just proved that you're not strong down there so that it's a self-serving yeah, thing you yeah. know what i mean it's like well if you if he had taken the fucking two inches off of my box and i just continued to blast the same weights off of that then it'd be like okay well this isn't the problem but I had a really hard time and mm-hmm. I had to work back up. So it, it proved itself. It, the practice was proved by the fact that I simply could not do the same weights that I was doing before. There it is. If you're fucking so good, you should be able to take them to this box just like you did the last one. There's also something like um, uh, you always hear Louie talk about avoiding the law of accommodation. And um, people always ask me, like, how how do you have such a, a good free squat without rooting your training in a free squat it's like the box squatting does a lot like all all of our training and primarily mine is rooted in box squatting and that's all i've ever done like like literally and it's probably closer to 80 percent of your train of my training's box squatting not free squatting and the only free squatting i know is exactly what i'm doing in a meet so i don't have all these extra references for briefs this not knee wraps that straps down this it's dude when my suit goes on i'll I'll put i'll go from a pair of briefs in the warm-up like so if i'm warming up for me i might work up to like i don't know 700 685 in a pair of briefs i just put my suit on straps up 865 870 but make a 200 pound jump and then it's like 860 960 1060 and then i'm up going out open with weight so those big jumps are i learned that from donnie thompson too that was a um i remember i, I always go down there and we'll we we'll go down to the bowtie cottage and uh uh, he, he'll be like, Hofster, you can't make those this, this fit. Because I was making like 60, 50 pound jumps. And then once you start getting into 1200 around those numbers, you, you, dude, you, at, if you're taking two squats over 1200 to get to 1300, you're blowing a lot of juice. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you did. <laughs> you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to open at 1170, then go 1235, 1275, it's like, or if I'm, you know what I'm saying? You, you have to, you only your gas tank's only so big. You only have so much to output, and sometimes you need to restructure jumps once you get into certain numbers to just go and hit them and quit wasting energy. Like what? Are you, what are you there for? I'm there to squat this number. It's like, are you there to compete in a meet and get PRs? Or this is different for everybody. Like for me, it's, it's, it's things are a little different for me. Um, yeah, your view and what you how you experience it is is a different thing. The jumps, and you're right. Like certain 
numbers once you hit them you have to change how you approach them like you you had me start taking those jumps and it's funny because you look around at certain meets and it'll literally be like i'll go he'll go everyone else go twice i'll go he'll go because mm -hmm. we can make those this also jumps. help us helps at meets too big time like dude. let's say you're i can't tell how many times has anybody out there been in a warm-up room and you hear it for 10 minutes until the meet starts and wait a second I have four more warm-ups to do. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, that's fine. You mm -hmm. take a 200-pound like, jump. 200-pound, boom, 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 boom. Just, you know, like, at what point, when you're at the meet, you're already, you, you, it's time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, just because if I got to make a 200-pound jump or a 100-pound jump, you know, uh, in those earlier ones, because the end, the end is what matters, essentially. So, um that's something Donnie told me. Like once I started getting to certain numbers, you have to make big jumps just to close in on them and have juice to finish the meet. You know, mm -hmm. you still got to squat. You still got to bench and deadlift after that. You know, yeah. you know, when you're trying to squat the biggest squat of all time, it's not like it's still it's just different. You know, like you're, you're trying to compile the biggest squat of all time with the biggest bench meet, the biggest benches done in full power meets. And then you have to have juice left over for a deadlift. You know, it's just like and by then I want to go home. You yeah. know? I'm like, I'm tired. And everything's going to feel like shit, too. I think that's something when I have my it's like a progressive uh it's like taking off from an aircraft carrier. It just gets faster and faster and shittier and shittier as the meat goes on. You just <laughs> what, what do you mean by it. feels like shit? Well, like, so I'll go. So for me, my numbers are a little easier for people to wrap their heads around than what he, so, but like, I'll go, if, I'm, if my opener is 1035, I'll go, I usually don't take the bar in that situation out of meat. I'll just go to a plate, right? So I'll go plate and then I'll go 100. Then I'll put another 100. So now we're 465. Then I'll put my briefs on and jump to 665. Put my suit on, jump to 865, knee wraps on 975, opener. I So I get to my opener but in he's five done that. sets. You, but you've done that. But, like, that's not the first time he's done no, that. No, no, it, it took a while. And, and That's and, all training leading up. Anytime we free squat it, those are the numbers practicing. So that's another thing. When you free squat, you're essentially – a free squat workout isn't a free squat workout. It's a practice run of what's getting ready to happen at the meet. How from, long it takes. So. From the time, the jumps, where you put your wraps on, how, how my, my straps are here for this set. If this happens, we make 200-pound jump. If not, we continue with 100-pound jumps. It's just like you know – like, all that has already been – instilled when you're there so like can you imagine like dude can you imagine me looking at you at, at a meet and being like what should i put on the bar for my next set it's like people do that they're like what's next yeah. it's like have you not fucking done did you before? were you at the workout <laughs> were you at the training <laughs> session that we just had yeah, yeah. it's like and and the same thing applies to like i think a part of that where i learned with that those big jumps is i'll do the same thing when i'm box squatting like i'll go whatever it's going to be like if my working weight is six plates I'll go bar, like with chains on it, whatever, bar, plate, I'll jump to plate quarter, from or two plates quarter from a plate, and then I'll jump to three plates quarter, and then I'll jump to six plates, put my briefs on, jump to six plates. Listen, dude, th the fucking, the jump from 465 to 665 in my briefs on a free squat feels like shit to jump from 665 to 875 the feel like, like shit, shit. it Let's, just feels like heavy like it's so like, the ugh. feel like shit thing is that is a what you come to know is that is a part of it that <laughs> yeah. is it yeah just like accept the, that it. shit feeling like this does not feel good well that's because you made a 200 pound jump but you also know when i make another 100 pound jump that shit feeling your body well dude it's so like when i make that initial 200 pound jumps from like my briefs to a squat suit i'm going from like you know six to eight hundred or whatever it is you you're like that's a shocker you just made a 200 pound jump but it's like i guess i don't know what i'm trying to say you get that you get the instant sweat Right? Like, it's like people want to get warm. They want to warm up. And it's like, they just want it all to feel easy. It's like, easy no. doesn't mean you're going to, like, <laughs> yeah. just because it feels bad doesn't mean you're weak or yeah. doesn't well, mean. Yeah, that's what you said. And people, they matter. align that together. They're like, man, that, that didn't feel good. Like, oh, and then, then, then the downhill trajectory of the day already starts for me. None know? of it feels good. It never feels good. It always feels like shit. But like for like the six sixty five to eight seventy five briefs to a suit for me, right? That jump is like, whoa, fuck my life, right? And then you rack it and then I add knee wraps and make a jump half the size to nine seventy five. And so that just feels the same, right? Yeah. That's like, oh, that feels you, like you start reaching terminal velocity. You're like, okay, it all feels about the same. Yeah. And then and a then... seventy pound jump to your opener feels like you just did nine seventy five again. 
So yeah. it's just like it sets you up. That last warm up really doesn't feel much different than a third attempt. They just kind of move a little slower, and you might feel a little more pressure. So if he's bringing in his his free squat once a month, right, for practice, right? How often do you? How do you work yours in? For like my group, uh, yeah, I'd say like. Well, the people that I train with, like in my crew, we basically are, you know, it's I'm an extension. You know what I mean? Like we, we do basically what he does. It's like every four weeks or so, depending on how far out we are. So, um, you know, and, and that'll dictate how much gear we put on. Like I know, you know, all of the different variations of free squats, I don't really fuck with them anymore. I program them for my lifters. What what I've started doing for my lifters that I don't have hands on with is three weeks of box squat, briefs only free squat bare knee. Three weeks of box squat, briefs and knee wraps. Three weeks of box squat, briefs, squat suit, bare knee. Three weeks of box squat, full dick. Right? It's accumulative. Like you, you don't, don't notice it after a while. You yeah. know what I'm trying to say? And it's... it gives them and it gives them something to beat, right? So if you can beat your briefs and knee wraps yeah. with a fucking suit and no knee wraps, you feel like you're a god because you did it with bare knee. Now you got your suit on. It's a, really you're just like getting used to handling those weights. But for those people, it almost is a shorter version of what he was talking about with the denim, where it's like he, he makes it hard first. And then kind of it gets easier when you get into a phenom from the denim. It's like the reverse of that. It's like, all right, let's get you used to squatting and free squatting and briefs. You feel that pressure? It's not so bad, right? Let's add some knee wraps to it. You're used to the briefs. Okay. And the knee wraps. Now so you're, you're not just, contending with brief yeah, anymore. Yeah, now yeah. you're just contending yeah. with wrap. You throw the and straps it's... on, not worried about your knee wraps anymore because they're bare knee. And then you do the whole thing. I think people launching them. tons of variables at one time is probably what causes a lot of issues. Well, the other thing, too, is that we're not doing this. I'm not doing this on a bow bar with reverse bands. We're doing this with a straight bar, straight way. Mm-hmm. We're not fucking around with like, I'm not doing some weirdo shit to. I think free squatting with a safety squat bar, you know, like you don't, you don't. It's you wild don't, to me. Yeah. Like you don't. Like It's to, not going to make me a better free squatter. Yeah. It might make you a stronger one. That's yeah. the biggest takeaway from all this, I think, is the. Like strong is good, strong is better. Being, I don't know, dude. Like if I had to pick between being a strong squatter and a proficient one, I probably proficiency pick proficient. wins meets consistency. Mm-hmm. I mean, because then you can my, still deadlift, right? Well, my experience up. with consistency, dude, is when I can always rely on something I know, and that 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 is effective in competition because I know. I probably, dude, and like I study people, like I've always done that. I know what I know what these dudes can do more than they do. <laughs> like, like I'll tell, I'll, I can tell you what they're going to open with. I can tell you, I can, I'll watch training videos over years and I'll just watch them and I'm like, nope, he don't have that. You know, like some people. It is, I can, I can back this story because mm-hmm. this is true. I've seen <laughs> him do it where it's like, that dude's going to do that and then he's going to miss his second and third. Or that dude's going to do that and then he's going to miss it and he's going to go up and he's going to bomb. And it's just like, because he's seen it all. It's just years, you know. I mean, how long have I been doing this? Eight, nine, this may be 19. I'm pushing 20 years, mm-hmm. maybe. It's getting close. 18, 19, 20 years. I've just, I haven't been lifting weights for 18, 19, 20 years. I've been in powerlifting meets every year. I've done a powerlifting meet every calendar year since like the year 2003. It's like I've seen a lot of things. I've seen, I've just seen decisions people make. And um, I see, I had a, you know, being at Westside, you have, and, and the people that are around Westside, you know, it's not just what people, it's not just Westside, you know, you have you know, like your big iron guys. It's like people you see at meets. I learned a lot from Rick Hussey and Jim Granick and all them guys and how they do stuff. And yeah. That progression is something that kind of picked up from like what I just spoke about. was kind of like, there's a, I never got a chance to meet Rick which is a bummer to me because the guy's a fucking legend and everybody always spoke so highly of him. But uh, nice. there's a video There's a video on... Uh, he was a good one, dude. Yeah, it's a bummer, man. Like I, I, I never got a chance to meet him. That's That sucks. I hate that. He was always kind of like... He was like the alter, Lou, alter ego Louie, you know? Mm-hmm. Like they, they were like... It was like they were brothers, but from different mothers. Like one was brought up this way and the other one was brought up this way. And like their guys are super strong and our guys are super strong, but we each did completely different fucking things dude like opposite the culture seems different like the culture seems much different the people that i've met for even now like you meet the guys from night crew you meet the guys from our group and then you meet the guys the newer guys coming up with jimmy and all that stuff and it's like 
it's like they're cousins. We're cousins with it. Like it's like the, it's similar, but it's they're, just different, you know. Uh, but yeah, that progression came from a video I saw where he talks about how they would like put on gear, not really worry about depth, take a couple, of, and then the next week they would take yeah. it a little bit deeper, and then a little bit deeper. And I thought like, well, I can't really fucking do that with people that I'm not standing in front of. Yeah. But what I can it do It takes is a really good layer. coach to train like that. And to that point, I think this is a, a testament to Rick. Um, they would do, I did a lot of reverse band stuff. So Louie would call it the future method, you know, yeah. or the or the light method. Yeah. But uh, they just called it reverse bands, you know, like they would start doing reverse blue. Like that. they free squatted all the time. They never box squatted. Um, they were always in gear. They would start in briefs and work at briefs, knee wraps. They would do uh, doubles and then they would start in singles and doubles into bands. So they would, you, know, you might start with a reverse blue band and like Jimmy might work up to 1150 and you're like, holy shit. You know, all he knows, he took out 1150 and yeah. went down and stood up with it. It, it. I saw the things that Rick did. It like dulled your brain to numbers. Like you just, you just got into autopilot, you know? <laughs> and uh, so that they would go from blue bands to green bands. And then the next week they're doing green bands and they're squatting 1100 of green bands. And then it's like the next week they got purples on there and then uh, they'll go hit up, uh, hit up and try They They do attempts. That's why I started learning attempts from, you know, like they would practice attempts on all these reverse bands. And then, then the, then like uh, they'd come around to squat again it'd be just before the meet they'd take all the bands away and then they would do their three attempts and then they'd put like a green band on and do a hundred pound jump and do it full full range they do all all that kind of crazy stuff they did it with the they they pretty much I think or were kind of like the trailblazers of board pressing mm -hmm. like you know you know Crawford he came up with you know you know he was kind of did a lot of board pressing stuff and Lou uh, and uh, Louis, uh, a lot of raw board pressing stuff, but like they were the ones that were like doing attempts on boards and uh, reps on boards. And they, they just, and I mean, Sean, he had a, a what, he, I think he had an 850 bench at 198. I think it was yeah, yeah. 860 at 220 and he did or something. 870, like 860 or 875 at 220. And he weighed 215 pounds. It's fucking crazy. And, uh, so like Sean was, I, I, he's a, he was another anomaly. Like Sean, mm. Sean was, uh, man, if that guy was still around now, like if it, <laughs> some, see, and I think that that's where, when I saw stuff that happened, they, they all had tons of muscle, dude. So they were, they, they were from that background of like, they did the power lifts and they went to the fucking gym and just did tons of bodybuilding shit. So they were like that, that old eighties muscle fucking blam that could just lift Jacked. in gear because they, all they did was put gear on. So they all yeah. had sort of the same shape. It seemed like, yeah. Like, like you know, your Cartinians remember like there's Cartinian Remember Nick hatch. They called him the man child. Mm -hmm. He was this little like one, one forty eight er that had like eight, eight something squat. Um, you had like Becca, Becca Swanson, um, uh, Jim Grandick. Um, there's, there's a lot of other, there's just so many dudes that went through. There's so many good. Richie Briggs was another one. He had like an 865 bench. They, the big iron had all the big benchers dude back in the day. So there was just, yeah, they, a lot of the ways they structured stuff I took from like how they approach, uh, almost like giving you a little bit more, like giving you another little piece of popcorn, you know, in the form of weight and yeah. taking this off and uh adjusting you to to bigger numbers uh acclimate like they, they did really good things but i think where louis louis like you can't do that you know you don't you don't ever work you, you can't do that forever and that, now looking back i kind of see it you know uh where we would consider it gpp they were just in there doing tons of work in the gym you know you know they they didn't really have a rhyme or reason. They just went in there and killed it. You know, it wasn't like where Louis like, well, if you're feeling bad today, you got a deload. They didn't know what a fucking deload yeah. day was. Like you know, no, they would just crush from everything I've heard. And they I, would just crush themselves. Like say fuck it. And you probably know this, D dude. If there was if uh, pre 2010, if you said the word deload in West Side, <laughs> you were basically like yeah. on the ver you're on the chopping block. It wasn't even a it was like a, if you look deload like uh, that was week one. Though. That's what I never understood with the whole thing because if it's a three week wave, week one's lighter than week three. 
isn't that fucking deloading? Yeah. You couldn't right? go in. Yeah, but you couldn't <laughs> ever say like, I couldn't ever say like. Hey man, I'm getting in a bench shirt on Wednesday, so I'm not going to pull anything heavy. On oh Monday. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's D trading. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like it's, it's like, but yeah. like, uh, that's like how you set up for the good, mm -hmm. the good one, you know. And the attempts thing, right? So like, um, I don't know how, how it was, uh, you know, when, whatever. But like the the two inch block pull, the like two Mondays out before the meet, that was like part of the Circumax whole thing. Mm -hmm. it was like that the two inch block pull, the Circumax squat, and the floor press, like that whole thing. I look at that two inch block pull and I'm like, well, I want to pull my opener, my second, my third, and then try for a two inch block pull PR. I don't want to base my attempts on that two inch block to try to just PR my two inch block pull because I don't give a fuck about yeah. my two inch block pull. I want to make sure like, oh, I'm opening with 700. Cool. I want to make sure that I can hold on to it. So I'm going to go 700 and then I'm going to go 740 and then I'm going to go 770 and then I'm going to go for 785 or 800, whatever I'm trying to do off of that because... The point of all this, if I'm not mistaken, is to make sure that you have a good meet. Yeah. It's not to make sure you have a good Monday. Fuck Monday. I don't give a shit. Louie would have big hangups on, like, the detraining effect. Like, if we... That's why we didn't free squat. In his mind, like, my my my, my squat day was Friday. But to Louie, that was dynamic. That was dynamic yeah. lower. You know what I mean? So in his mind, a max effort squat, in his mind, because it's max effort, you should be trying to PR all the time. You know, you don't free squat and practice attempts because in his mind, that took away from the time you were doing building strength. So if I, in my mind, I was like, well, Louie, what if I just suspend you know, strength. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be weak the next week. He thought that if I suspended training, like my max effort training, and I went over here and did this, this free squat workout and I didn't squat a PR, that was D trading. Like that, mm -hmm. that was his hang up with stuff. He thought that like, no, nope, you can't do that. You know, you, you, you D trading effect, you know, you can't lift less, uh, going into the meet, you know, it's like, it's like, I get, but you guys aren't even lifting this, you know, like, yeah. So that's kind of like we just differences you know like i think louis was just really so many so many he had so many large squats off of that style of training but when you started getting as time moved on and the weights got bigger um we had to do things different obviously like you know free squatting putting your bench shirt on more so like the when you the one of the first things we were talking about like you know when you first started training how was it compared to, to how you're doing shit now and i remember like when we first started like when i first got to west side you didn't put a bench shirt on remember that shit no oh, no, yeah. no 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 uh -uh. i was in that shit yeah. no no sir no sir you put a you you, you train 12 weeks for a meet and uh oh the meets around the corner you need to put a shirt on it's like what do you mean we have we're... i remember like the first meet i didn't even realize i had to put a bench shirt on yeah like i just had one we never used it i just trained all the time three weeks out from the meet uh i would i would just take a three board just put my shirt on take a three board and we'd open up 100 pounds less than that yeah, that was fit. benching yeah yeah see if it fit you yeah. definitely suits, weren't suits, you yeah, definitely suits. weren't touching when i was like uh, no no uh, yeah i was there like you were not touching in a bench like it was a uh, it was very frowned upon to put like a bench shirt on like no no we do that at the meet we train to go to the meet to put the shirt on we don't train in the shirt to yeah, get stronger yeah. bench I, I take I away my last three years there i never put a shirt on unless it was a meet i never put wraps on unless it was in a meet i never put my squat suit on unless it was in a meet Everything else was brief. So I always got a kick out of the people would say that West Side's just all for geared lifting. And I'm like, dude, we, I, we, we got, I, we literally yeah. were threatened to be thrown out. I mean, if yeah. You put I mean, a one, one of the things I'm <laughs> the most pissed about is I had no specificity in gear Yeah. because we never fucking used it. Yeah. You know, and you, but it's, and I came from using it every week before okay. I got there. Right, so you were talking earlier about not knowing where to put your feet. The first fucking meet I did at Westside, I, I'm on the platform deadlifting, and I fucking, I'm so confused. I'm looking over to Lou, like, where in the fuck Am do I doing I a put, rack pull? Where yeah. do I put my feet? <laughs> yeah. like, where the fuck do I? And forget about squatting with you know all the other kind of shit. It's like yeah. fuck. I guess, I guess I'm just gonna open really fucking low, and hope I don't bomb out. It was know? a big, <laughs> it was a big fight to try to be able to take a get in a bench shirt and touch because i like, that's all he me, wanted to do so we went just, through this yeah. we went through this thing of like no no don't do board presses like so i would do a two board and i'd work up and hit prs off two boards because like i say i work my shit from the top down mm -hmm. and uh he would be like well that's not touching that's, that's not a pr 
You know, it's like, oh, but- that, yeah, there was that. I remember that. We went through a thing where when I would show, we would show up in the morning and. <laughs> all he'd want everybody to do was touch and a bench. He pulled all mm-hmm. the boards out. And we all they did was boards. bomb. I was like, he what took are you all doing? the boards out. We didn't have any. Dude, there was probably. I had them in my car. <laughs> yeah. I hit them. I, I remember. Yeah, I remember. Cause I'm like, I here it in, is. I would come mm-hmm. and help you. At night, so this was like in the weird transition of like morning crew, night crew ship. But I would go in in the morning and he had taken all of the fucking boards out. And Tommy would go in there every morning and pull all the boards out. Like they would have their the super early morning stuff like, um, you know, like Tony Ramos and all those mm-hmm. dudes would come in super early. And then we would come in at like seven or whatever and all the boards would be gone. You, We were not allowed to. So we went the other way for a little bit where it was like, nope, no boards. You guys are because it was. That's kind of like the thing where I told you, like when Louis says something's not working, turn around and run in the other direction. Mm-hmm. He's just no. Well, it was it was uh, boards aren't working. No mm-hmm. boards. You know, he other way. Saw like, someone who the fuck was I don't remember who it was, but you had helped some. It was a girl. She had come in and she hit like some monster two board in her shirt, and then she went to a meet. Might have been Rita West. She I think and she PR'd, but it was her PR. It wasn't bench, what she it hit wasn't off what the she board. Hit off the board, and he's like, well, that didn't work. And it's like, no, yeah, it, yeah. it had the stimulus. Like it, you know, it's so funny because like. Listen, dude, like, I, I've had my moments where I've said shit about Lou, but the guy fucking helped me so much. Mm-hmm. You know, it's everybody's got that sort of weird relationship with him, and it's like... He it's always just, keeps the mind... He'll always keep you on your toes of how to restructure <laughs> and rethink and... He had me com- squat, squat with my feet straight for a little bit. Straight against the monolift. And I did it for one week, and the next week from across the gym, I'm doing what he told me, and he's just like, hey... He comes over and he's like, what are you doing with your feet? He's like, you're going to blow your fucking knees off. And I was like, I had only been there for like a month. I was like, okay, this is normal. I guess this is normal. It's totally normal. Like, I guess I'll just (laughs) go back to what I was doing before. I was like, is he fucking with me on purpose? I think you've been told that on a few occasions. What's that? You're going to blow your knees off. (laughs) Yeah. This month, dude. So I I was hoping he'll tell this story. Fucking, dude. It's great. So I was going to, I was trying to take Greg off the board and I was supposed to do bench only meat, right? But I, I ended up, I was like, fuck it. I feel strong. So I signed up full power last minute. I opened with, uh, the number I had to hit was 1065. My best was 1030. I opened with 980 and I went straight to it. Right. So, but I, I, <laughs> I squat 980 and I come out, I'm, dude, my knee wraps are still on. I'm still fucking, I'm not even off the platform. And this dude, he's like, dude, you're too fucking wide. You're going to, if you squat like that, you're going to blow your fucking knees off. And I'm just like, holy shit. And me and David barely talked at this point. I didn't even know, you know, I was yeah. like, I've seen kneecaps come off before. Like, and that's what shit. it looks like. So, <laughs> oddly enough, I'm going to tell I was debating on whether or not I was going to tell a story, but I'm going to So Dave did not like me initially. And it was because I did something that did not, it was disrespected the gym and I didn't realize that it did. Um, and so we had met in the past, but very briefly. And, uh, so I took a spot on the board and, uh, I put my name up there and I put this little inverted cross cause like, you know, whatever, that's who I am. And, and, he, and I posted it and he messaged me and he's like, take that shit down. He commented on it, take that shit down or there's going to be blah, blah, blah. So I go and take it down or whatever. And then he messaged me later and he was just like, listen, dude, like, I believe that you have the ability to squat a world record squat eventually, but you cannot disrespect the gym like that because anything you write on there, you're not just writing your name. You're writing it on top of everybody else's name. And it changed my whole perspective of like what it meant to be on that board. And after that, we, we became friends and whatever, but it was that moment of like, he was, he was ragefully pissed at me for that. And at the time I was like, man, the fuck is this guy's problem? Like, come mm-hmm. on. I had like an ego on me for no fucking. I'm like, man, what's his fucking problem? Then I thought about it. I'm like, he's been here for fucking 15 years. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I just disrespected this place that is a second home to this guy. And he's just setting me straight in, in the way that he knows how. And it changed our whole relationship with that. But I needed that little like smack in the head. Like, hey, motherfucker, like, you don't, this is not your spot. You're just visiting here. Like nobody lives here. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was, it's really interesting because it was, it was actually that squat where he told me to scoot my feet in there. Because most myself. time, like uh, just to just to address the squat, like somebody would squat a big squat, take take Greg off the board and think that was good. But then somebody would come around and be like, dude, if you squat like that, you're going to blow your fucking knees off. I don't care if you took that fucking dude's name off the board. <laughs> like, do you want kneecaps to do it the next time? <laughs> like, I'm, I was just, that's just the way it is. So like yeah. some people are like what's the next thing you need to do to make it keep going? And then other people are like, look what I just did. You know, I just have, have a different outlook. 
it changed it changed my perspective on what I needed to do to respect that place and what it meant to be on the board and what it meant to have the respect of somebody who's a fucking you know the best guy to ever do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I needed that especially in that moment because I had this like crazy ego for no fucking reason really. I right, take another pee break, and then I'm going to jump off. Start there, yeah, where you went from the AM crew to the night crew. Is what I want to come back. Yeah, let's talk about that. Cool. Oh yeah. Oh. We'll be back. Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH first. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. All right, guys, I want to thank today's sponsor, Element. I'm having fun with ads now instead of just trying to, like, read through all the talking points and so forth. But there's a talking point here I have to read through. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything that you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt and no sugar. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. I've had and have been in the habit of drinking a half a pack before every leg training session and all my cramping issues that I had went away because I've always had cramping issues on heavy leg days and leg days especially. Head into our description box and click the link that's there for Element or if you're listening to the audio of this, it's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash table talk. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is TABLETALK Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. The Swiss Symposium 2023. Yes, we are bringing this back to Columbus again. The date is October 20 and 21. Columbus, Ohio, Hilton, it's the same location it was last year. If you head over to the website, there's a big banner that links directly to Swiss. There's also a link in the description box so you can see who the presenters are as we are booking them for the symposium. The symposium has been going on for 20 years. It's, in my opinion, probably a little biased, but in my opinion, one of the best symposiums when it comes to strength and conditioning, uh, sport medicine, therapy, physical therapy. Right now, the admission is 38% off or 48% off. It's I'm don't know. I'm not looking. I'm just kind of looking at the camera right now, but it's the early, early, early bird rate. That rate is until July 1st. So now is the best time for you to sign up. When you go to register, there's three different ways that you can res register for the symposium. There's the general admission, which gets you into all of the different lectures that you want to go to. The caveat is there's three, four lectures going on at the same time. So the second option allows you to purchase the videos of all the lectures for you to be able to watch at a later time. So that allows you and you access to everybody that's presenting if there's two people presenting at the same time that you would really like to see. The format that those are in is, it's a streaming service. So it's, it's if you've ever purchased a training 
force from anybody before. It's very similar to that. So you log in and then there's all the presentations that are there. You just click, you watch stream. It's how it works. The third option is the VIP option. And included in that is the Sunday after the symposium, a limited number of people will be coming out to our gym, the S5 compound at Elite FTS with a handful, maybe a little bit more of the presenters that are there just to train, to hang out, have some barbecue, have a good time. And that again is limited on the attendance. It's already 50% sold out or 50% of the spots left, depending on how you want to look at it, go to the link in the description. We'll have more information about the Swiss throughout the podcast. As we move forward, we have a lot of the presenters booked for the podcast. So we'll be talking more about it. We'll see you there. Now we're on. Okay. We're back. Oh, here we are. All right. So yes, we are back. <clears throat> what I want to jump into talk about is they talked about it a little bit. And I don't know, I've been out here a few times now, so I forget which podcast, when you came to the PM crew. So mm -hmm. I don't want to get into the drama, all the bullshit about that. Just the, basically you're in the AM crew. If I, if I remember correctly, um, Louis sick of it, you don't have potential, right? Yeah. And you're in a, not the greatest mental place either Correct. because you don't think that you have the potential. He sees something in you. I don't fucking know why. I don't know what either. Right? I'm waiting and to then find out. Sometimes you can just see it. You know, it's like there it is. So yeah. it's so it's you run basically you ran your ass into the ground in the AM crew. Yes. With just let's just say overreaching and just trying to do this. Yeah. The and trying shit to, and trying to survive and trying to prove that I was deserved to yeah. be there. I think a the dynamic thing. with the morning crew is you have this you have this un un you have this super desire to please Lou and. In pleasing Lou, you kill yourself, and Louie doesn't care if you kill yourself. Yeah, like, you have to realize you know that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's not, not everything. So I think that it cracked up to be. So, honestly. so you're in this, so you're in this weird spot, right? To where you kind of think and feel like you're going to get fucking kicked out. Mm -hmm. right? I was on the block. And you had I know where else to go. Um, then he reaches out. So, did you? I don't want to say. Did you feel like just giving it up? I mean, did you feel like just giving it up or were you... I didn't know. If he didn't reach out, were you going to Lexon? Let me put it that way. No, so here's the thing, man. Like, <clears throat> there was never... Put I looked Tom... to pasture at Lexon. I looked Tom Bar Barry right in the eye and I was just like, you're not going to get me to fucking quit. I'll stay until he throws me out. I'm not fucking leaving. And he's like, he is going to fuck with you until you quit. And I'm like... You got the wrong guy. I think half of the problem <laughs> was that as I started, like, you know, after you, dude, you've been around Louie a long time. You kind of, like, know his mentality. You know, his, you kind of know how he acts, and you kind of, you, 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 I don't want to say I gave him the cheats to the game. You know, like, you get video game cheats. It's like, he's going to do these things, dude, and you're going to have to do these no, things. No, he definitely, yeah, he's like, the way to beat him is to win, right? Mm -hmm. And the way to not let and so I really tried to not, um, allow louis to affect me in a negative way but there's just no way to to avoid that i didn't know what i had left i was fucking hurt i didn't really know like how to get better at bench pressing at this point i had i had been you know gotten tutelage from a couple of guys in the morning that were pretty fucking good benchers i couldn't figure it out but i wanted to learn from the best bencher so <clears throat> i just asked if you know i would come in and do extra workouts at night a couple of times a week and I would so I was there sort of like peripherally with with them training in their group and they always looked like they were having fun it was a totally different vibe than the morning and um I just wanted to show that I could bring some fucking value to the group and that's how I ended up getting kind of invited in he's like yeah you can come and bench with us and I show up the first day to bench and I would, well, I'd go in the morning and I'd make up some bullshit fucking variation that Louie wouldn't know what it was. Like, I'd do like a close grip football bar to a foreboard and I'd fuck it. I'd, you know, I'd <laughs> he'd be yeah, jumping yeah, rope yeah, in the corner. Like, like, I, I don't know. Like, rah, you know, and yeah. then I, you know, every time he'd look at me, I'd be sitting there going, <sighs> like, looking like I'm doing something, hiding in the bathroom and shit. And then going at night. And so I go in and I bring a bench shirt and I walk in, I got a bench shirt. And Dave's like, the fuck is that? I'm like, well, I'm going to learn how to bench. And he's like, you're not putting that on. You have to learn how to bench press before I put you in a bench shirt. And I'm like, fuck my life. And I just wanted, I think at that point, man, if I'm being honest, like I just wanted it right then. 
Like, mm-hmm. I wanted to show everybody, because that's the hard part of this sport, right? Is like, you're going to work your ass off for six months to to maybe show someone that you've gotten five pounds better. And I wanted it right fucking then. Because you got to understand, man, my third meet there, my second meet there, I went from a 905 to a 1,000 pound squat. Two meets later, I was on the board. So I was just like, this is how it, this is what yeah. happens. I'm going to squat a million pounds. And so Dave, like, restructured my entire bench press away from like the straight bench straight off your belly to more over your face made me bench with a rug under my back to couldn't get, arch to, i couldn't arch i didn't know I didn't hold. you'd be like arch and you'd be like what what, are, <laughs> what do you got a fused well before spine? that i mean what did you see that made you think that he could be a better lifter than what he was well a lot of it what i saw was he was just hurt and run down and louis has a louis had a always a he didn't. Louis wasn't really a nurturer. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know. Yeah, I kind of so like me. Yeah, just do ten more sets of that. You should be all right. And they'll run and do ten more sets and drive themselves ten more sets into the ground rather than just be like, dude, I'm not doing that. So I would see stuff where I was like, okay, he doesn't need to do these. In my opinion. I was mm-hmm. like, you know, I don't, I don't see how this justifies the ends. You know, the ends doesn't justify the means here. You're having him do all these weird things. He's getting hurt. Um, he needs less, not more. Um, you're you're oversaturating him in these areas. He needs more of this, which was free squatting you need more you uh instead of box squatting break the box squat down there's stuff like that like things that i saw that he could do it um, when you have somebody that's there at west side already and they're committed like that that's already kind of like the hard parts out of the way yeah yeah um so you already have intangibles yeah and mm. um he kept trying, you know, when somebody doesn't give up, that's a big thing with me. Like, no matter what, are you going to give up? I'm looking at effort. What kind of effort are you giving me? If it's not like, if it's not some substantial fucking effort, I don't, I don't want to, if yeah. I'm telling you to do something and you're not giving me effort, I don't want anything to do with you. Like is effort that it kind of tells you a lot about what you're capable of and the ceiling that you have is how much you're willing to, to apply and put your, put into it. And I saw a lot of that and I just see Louis, I didn't, I kind of think it was Louis's age, you know? Uh, I think as Louis got older, he, you know, it, 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 dude was fuck. I tell people this dude was fucking dying. You know what I mean? Like yeah. people don't understand that the last like handful of years, Louis was not in great health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, he was not on his, he was, he was still on his game, you know, but he wasn't that Louis from he wasn't that 55 year old Louis that was just you know in it to win it all yeah. the time every time and he was it's just age man you can't you can't it's just it's okay I, I yeah. tell it's okay it's okay that he calmed down it's it's okay like you can't do that forever and he did it forever he did it for a long fucking time uh, right up to the yeah, end yeah. I mean I mean <laughs> we so, never got we ne- me and him never fully got along he brought me in he told me at one point he brought me in to push silent joe and west mccormick squat he didn't think i was gonna fucking do anything and i'm the type of person that like uh, keep telling me i can't do so like i'm just like i'm fucking stubborn like that i don't like being told what i'm able and with my history with the drug addiction and stuff like i kind of have felt like this is all extra time for me so I was so grateful to be able to be lifting weights. You're not going to tell me what my fucking capacity is because I'll do anything because in my mind, I should have been fucking dead anyway. Yeah. So I don't fucking care. And you're not going to tell me what I, what my ceiling, like I don't, you're not going to tell me what my ceiling is because as far as I'm concerned, I don't fucking have one. I think for him, like Louis, I think it, some people, they take some specific things to fix whatever the issue is. And I think as he got older, he just kind of wanted to, to just throw something at you, not really dive deep into. It was just more is what he wanted. It more, was just more rather than, stuff. rather than pull, peeling the onion back, finding the nuances of what's causing the issue and giving you exactly what you need. Yeah. We would always preach training optimally. So, you know, you just apply that to somebody else. Like, what? What do, he doesn't need all these extra things. All these extra things are hurting him, not helping him. You know, like you need just let's just try these things first. So, how did it work when he fully committed? So, when you fully committed, so you quit. Well, doing I was them. only. I was so I was in the morning. So I was coming and training at night on Wednesdays only, um, and. I, I, truth be told, I wasn't even in the evenings long enough to get into a fucking bench shirt before I was told that if I get caught training at night, I'm going to fucking get kicked out. So all that happened for so, pretty shortly quick, after. four or five okay. weeks. Right. And so, so I, <laughs> I remember he's like, we're going to come in and free, like come free squat with us. We're going to get in a suit. Mm-hmm. 
And I was like, fuck, yeah, this is what I want. Like, I want to fucking squat with the dude, you know? I'd never squatted with him before. And I was like, this is what I want. So I, I went in in the morning. And I looked at Louie, and this was before he had told me if I train at night, I would get kicked out. I looked at him, and I was just like, hey, man, I got a, uh, I got a dentist appointment on Friday. So I'm going to come in. I'll help load plates for a little bit, but I got to run early. And I'm just going to come in and train at night, whatever they're doing. I'm just going to jump in with Hoff. And he goes, hmm, dentist appointment, huh? Like, yeah, he knew I was full time. of shit. Mm-hmm. He knew I was full of shit. And there was another dude who trained, I'm not even going to say his fucking name, but he, he he trained in the morning with us that said he was going to come and squat at night, but he pussied out and he didn't. Mm-hmm. And I did. And I, I sw- remember that. Yeah. And now nobody <laughs> and remembers now nobody his name. Nobody knows who he is. So I, I squatted mm-hmm. 1045 that night, 20 pounds off of my best, and fucking obliterated it. And um, I was like, this is fucking unbelievable. Like, just little things, like taking it out, holding it, where my feet are, how to arch, where my butt goes, like not doing the straps too tight, being patient, taking lighter weights deeper, like all so of these things. Louis was very good at making you strong. And that's not what, that's not like what yeah. we're talking about. Like, dude, he was, it, there's probably nobody better than him to identify you need to do this to get strong. It was when it came into, uh, increasing the proficiency of the lifts and gear i think like there you you had to position things in different like if you're gonna i'm not gonna do a rack pull if i'm gonna put a bench shirt on yeah. where he would just be like why well, we're doing rack pulls and now we're gonna put a shirt on wednesday Shouldn't it's like matter you should be able to do two extreme workouts within 72 hours yeah, or whatever. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, you should be able to lift a mean every was, three weeks and little things like oh your knees are going forward when you're squat they couldn't figure out and he's like well your knees are going forward because you're not fucking opening up enough and you gotta step into the rack more and da 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 and it fix it's all like once stuff. you get to those like little things it kind of like took somebody that was there and i think that's where i learned a lot from like chuck um he just kind of like, I just, you got to do this when you get here and you do this. And it's like, Louie didn't tell me things like that. And changing how I, how I box squatted too. That was another thing. He changed how, like, not as wide. Take the box down. Louie's whole wide. thing was like, the wider you train, the, you know, the, the more it get, it puts everything into your hips. And, he, and, and, and he's right. The, the, you need, your whole base of everything, you need to have strong hips and ass and lower back because you're deadlifting and you're squatting and those two lifts that's the main gist of the muscle groups for those mm-hmm. lifts. So he was always synergy. His synergy of training was around like wide stuff uh, in the squat and uh, tons of like uh, belt squats, ultra wide, wide poles, ultra wide, just, you know, he didn't just mm-hmm. that stuff. And, and I think that's good, but I think um, sometimes it becomes too nuanced and too much of a thing all the time where I think where that stuff's beneficial when it's needed, not necessarily as a staple. And if you're well, would it be safe to say that over time, just the way the gears worked, it, the the competitive squats become more of a plie than a sitting back type motion, anyhow. Yeah, and, which and is going to put more on the quads, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's the other thing too, is that like things change. Like the so that's a good point. Like the style, the stances, and the styles and gears change a little bit, which you have to you tweak training to do that yeah. stuff. You know, when you're starting to use more of a, if you're more of a quad. So I'll give you an example: whether a high high bar squat or high bar squatter versus a low bar. You know, you're going to be you, you you're shifted in the weight shifted into different muscles. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and so. Um, structuring training around how that changed, I think, uh, was kind of Louis. And I can't say I'm p- putting this on Louis because it's up to us to figure that shit well, out. Well, you're in the gear. Like, yeah. like unless it's not you're Louis. In the gear, you don't know this. Right. And also, like, I think he was part of the problem with me was like, Dave's a big guy, but in comparison to some of the guys that came in there that were squatting 11s back in the day, like, he's not a humongous guy, right? Like, the, the he, Matt Smith is a fucking huge human yeah, being. Yeah, like yeah. these are big fucking dudes. Who's the, the guy they call like Ryan? Well, I forget his fucking name. Mike Rogeria. Yeah, like mm-hmm. like these dudes are fucking. There. So he didn't know what to do with a guy who's a middleweight that's squatting four digit squats. I think it because it well, kind of changes stuff. Like the, it's just different. I don't to have to that point. Belly, like the the lifter, I think changed over the years too. You know, you had like he said, you had people like Matt Smith, Tim Harold. Uh, remember, like Josh Guthridge, them dudes were all huge. You had uh, Farmstrong, like huge uh, motherfucker. Chris Spiegel, he was in there, real big guy. Um, even Jerryo, people like just mm-hmm. big, big humans. Mm-hmm. Like, and then once the lifter changed, 
it, it just seems like as time went on, the lifter got smaller. It was almost like those big dudes were just kind of dinosaurs of the past. Like, I don't know if like uh, the 275ers and like the, the 308ers, they started pushing the numbers that the supers were doing and it kind of just drove the supers out. Mm -hmm. Um, and they've probably figured out that they could make more money playing football. That too. Or instead of. Yeah. But yeah, so to kind of circle back, so I, I mean, like I, I, like, I left slash got kicked out, whatever you want, however that conversation with Lou went. I wasn't full time with Dave until after I had gone to the sweatshop. Okay. So yeah, so I went down to, I went down to sweatshop and uh, when I was training there, it was like, text Dave, what do I do? You do this. And it's like, it was great. You know, like Laura treated me with a ton of respect. She was awesome. She was always good to my wife. Um, and so, uh, like he was telling me what to do for main movements and accessories. And then I'd have, you know, it's, a, I mean, that's a dream situation, right? You're fucking got, you've got Laura Phelps eyeballs on you and Dave's telling you what to do. I mean, fucking a, like mm -hmm. that's, you're going to get better even if you are the worst lifter in the world. Right. So it, it kind of just cycled back to him kind of talking to Lou and how that whole thing went down. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Cause I wasn't there, but he texted me and he said, Hey man, like, you're good to come. I th we were talking about coming up for a Friday. Like I thought I was just coming up for a Friday to squat. And he's like, no, you're, you're good to like, you come train with us and your wife, you know, Val mm -hmm. can come too. Well, I can tell you what happened there. I remember, <laughs> oh, was this, was this before or after nationals? It was, so it was, it was right before nationals because I didn't national. You had done the meet, and we and it was showman's meet, right? I had done showman's meet. I bombed on bench. I so Louis saw that in your heart. Yeah, he told. I was twenty five or something like yeah. that in my heart because <laughs> he bombed on the bench and he pretty much locked it out. And then he pulled, and I was like, "Well, if you add those together, you're already twenty five hundred right here in the heart." <laughs> so we, we know you can do it. You pretty much did it. It's in our hearts. Let's we'll just go do it again. You know. So Louis was at that meet, yeah. and that, that's actually in the new in the movie coming out. Yeah. Suppose. Michael, so there's some more stuff we can talk about that, but um. I remember Louis had seen that and he was like, he was just kind of like, what the fuck? Like, how'd that happen? You know? And none of those dudes, none of the dudes would, I remember talking to you at that meet actually, cause I, I didn't know what to, how to handle it socially with like a bunch of guys there that fucking had stayed at my mom's house with me before. And I, I had, we had were handling him. So he was down at Laura's and it was yeah, my was group with, handling him with, yeah, while Louis's crew was lifting. Yeah. No, it's a weird, it's, it's a weird, it you just got to really, do what yeah. you got to do. Yeah, so yeah, it was yeah, like all yeah. this weird shit. But that was yeah. where you benched thousand five too, right? Fifteen thousand five. Yeah, so, so yeah and like that meet was funny because i kind of was around those guys again and i'm out squatting i out squatted all of the fucking big boys like i out squatted all of their dudes and it was like a big like beat my chest mm -hmm. moment you know because it was like look at all you motherfuckers and look at us who's doing the shit wrong not us mm -hmm. you know like it, it was just a big fucking you know how it is it's mm -hmm. a big pissing contest mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but so louis had seen him do that and uh I was like, hey, I remember, I, I always have to catch him in the gym. He would always pull his little Jeep up there, you know, his little red Jeep, tomato stick Jeep. His head in. And he'd stick his head in. I'm like, hey, hey, hey. Mm. And he's like, I'm not, I gotta go. I gotta go. I'm like, no, wait, hold on, hold on. And he'll get in his car. And you tell him what do you want? What do you want? What do you want from me? I was like, hey, man, I got an idea. Just hear me out. He's like, what? What? You go, what is a neutron? You know, like, what the fuck do you want from me? I was like, look, dude. I was like, you need, I was like, how about this? I was like, just, let Anthony come train with me. Now, Neutron, he, I, he ain't going to do, he ain't going to do, he ain't, you, blah, 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 he ain't going to do these, you know, he, that's all he's done. He can't, he can't do, I was like, Louie, basically saying, you know, he's done, he, he doesn't have what it takes, he's, he's only going to do, so he ain't going to listen to you, he don't listen to me. That's what you're like, you know, yeah, you, yeah, you didn't yeah. get strong because you didn't listen to me. <laughs> so, he, he's not going to listen to you. I was like, Louie, I was like, just, how about this? Just don't worry about him. I was like, I'll. I'll deal with him. If something bad happens, it's on me. How about that? And he goes, fine, you're trying. You just do whatever you want. And I was like, well, his wife needs to come to. He's like, fine, just do whatever you want. He's like, fine, just do it. And I was like, okay. So that's when I called him. I was like, okay, you can come back now. You know, sometimes it takes a little finagling. but mm -hmm. And we moved our asses back to Columbus from Cincinnati. We had been mm -hmm. down there for eight months. We moved back, and Val got a chance to jump in and train with the night crew, too. And... And Didn't she squat 700? She squatted 705, bench 429. Like, she had a big... She broke down a lot. At the time, there weren't a lot of women squatting 7 and benching 4 active. You know, there had been, obviously, in the past. It was kind of like at the entrance of those when you started seeing girls squatting 700. Yeah, like, 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 like all those girls, like Leah and Amber and all them, like, they hadn't squatted the 7s yet. It hadn't happened yet. And then Val came and Katrina, all those people, and Val came in and squatted the seven. 
and benched four, then 429. And it kind of like, and then, you know, she stepped away. So like she busted the door open and now everything's made this big jump. She kind of gets lost in the shuffle with that. But like at the time, like, I mean, that was fucking ridiculous when she did that. We were all like, holy shit. And, um, but yeah, so we transferred, we tran, you know, came back, started training at night and just kind of, it was fucking awesome. It was training was fun again. Like, uh, like it reinvigorated my love for, um, powerlifting. And furthermore, like I got to train with the fucking best guy to ever do it. Right. And to me, like there's a lot of people like one of the reasons I got into equip powerlifting is because it's a counterculture thing. Right. So it's, when I got into it, it was at like its lowest. Like fucking people hated it. Wasn't cool to do it, especially it, multiply. It was yeah. like people fucking hated it. And so for me, I'm like, sweet. Don't you know multiply's <laughs> been dying since the year 2004? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's there were like all those <laughs> SPF squat compilations and all this shit. And, and the high PA. And then the <laughs> and then the and then the biggest the biggest dude of them all, like the guy that people are like, this guy's ruining powerlifting. I get to train with him. It's fucking awesome. Like I was, it, it really, let's ruin it together. And I got to be back at Westside, which meant, yeah. you know, something to me as well, you know, and I've obviously have my negative feelings for that. I've reconciled a lot of that shit, uh, you know, with myself, but getting a chance to train with Dave and train in the group. And, and it wasn't just training with Dave, honestly, like it wasn't just training with Dave. Like you step in there and on a Sunday morning, you look around and it's like, Oh, there's Bob Coe. There's Jimmy Ritchie. There's, you know, the fucking Amy would be around and the jesters and, and all this stuff. And so for me, because I started the sport late and I missed out on meeting a lot of the guys that are big historically for me, it was like a time warp. I got to go back and I get to see all these fucking because all the old dudes they still come in and hang out. <laughs> yeah, like you get to see all the relics, you know. You get to see all these, and you know, there's like a random fucking pit bull in the gym, and there's it just it just felt like it felt more like the West Side that I envisioned when I had gotten invited. And that's no disrespect to the what was going on in the morning, because what was going on in the morning was its own special thing. And I have I wouldn't not, really call it special. Well. <laughs> So for me, it was a big deal. A lot for of me. fucking idiots. So, so to I me, hate them. Still, it's, it's hey, listen. It, it doesn't change. Like all these years, I still hate them. All every single one of them. There's what, a reason. What, what is it when you say there was a cultural difference? So the, between, the difference between that? the two was in the morning there was no clear cut leader. There was no in the morning, in the morning. It was who had the loudest mouth and who was willing to like fight somebody or who was willing to fu whatever fucking thing. And <clears throat> it was like, it seemed more like a bravado. Everybody had their fucking costume on, you know? And it was like this thing. And, and I go to breakfast with Louis. And, and yeah, and to mm. me, don't you know? To me, I felt like the vibe in the in the evening was like a bunch of dudes who had been doing this for long enough that felt like they didn't have to prove anything to anyone. And I also liked the fact that there was, at the end of the day, right, if you're in the night crew, you got Tom Brady, Wayne Gretzky, mm -hmm. right? And in the morning crew, like, you got a bunch of good lifters, but, like, you don't have the fucking guy. And I liked being associated with the guy. And I also really liked the fact that, listen, dude, like when I left the first time, I had people that I considered some of my best friends currently stop fucking talking to me entirely. And when I left, someone that I had only had a relationship with for six months or something like that took his neck out for me. And so to me, that changed. That was the difference because I had somebody in my in my corner who had like integrity to our friendship and I could tell that he genuinely believed in me to do something and that gave me um the confidence to like full as corny as it fucking sounds it's like, almost like to you took a page myself. out of Louie's book like there you hear talk about like Louie was the first guy that believed in me and told me I could do those things it was like sometimes I felt that and I think it was his old age and him being sick and just not feeling well all the time um he kind of like that became less as as he got older. He didn't. It was you became more of a thing to try to please him to get that out of him rather than him just saying, "Hey, if you do this, you can do this." You know. Like, mm. uh, he so. just told me. Yeah, he told me. I talked about it last time I was on here. I'll never forget that he messaged me. I felt can held the message up and showed it to Val. It was like he just sent me a message that said like it was like eleven. Oh, what the fuck was it? It was like eleven. 
six thirty seven seventy or something like that. That's how you'll tow to twenty five hundred. And I hadn't, I had just squatted eleven. I hadn't, I'd benched six hundred barely. And my best pull was like seven thirty five at the time. And I'm like, look at this shit. And those are almost exactly the numbers that I ended up doing. Uh, whatever, like was that months. nationals? Was that yeah at nationals? I went eleven oh seven six twenty two seven seventy one. That's twenty five oh two, and I think like that's the meat. Kovic blew his squat suit out and squatted nine oh three at one sixty five. Yeah, that and that that galvanized us. Right? There's a reason. So listen, there's a reason we have those night crew shirts. Everybody's seen them, right? Those were drawn up. The original iteration of those had West Side's fucking address underneath them. Like when we got them initially done, right? And then we didn't end up printing those or whatever, but because <clears throat> we were at Westside at the time, <laughs> we were like, okay, let's make our own shirt. Yeah, I'm so, getting embarrassed wearing this other one. There's a reason why. There's a reason why there are night crew shirts and there aren't morning crew shirts. Because the the night crew, we were galvanized. Like we went through it together. We had we've had our our moments, and everybody in the group had fought with someone else in the group at some point. But it seemed. Can like, I say that a lot of what he is telling you is in the movie that Michael is making? Well, that's so, what I was going to ask you in about. Greater, yeah. In greater detail, it's in, it's like it's a movie. You're going to see it all firsthand. Like everything from the bench meet that we were talking about, where where he came back and he bombed out and didn't do very well, and I was like, hey man, you pretty much total twenty five hundred in our hearts. That meets on there. Uh, you Nationals. see the animosity. Be, I start yelling at the morning crew guys because they were they just sat there and took it. They didn't fucking do anything. Like was, and that made me fucking it, rage. It felt like we had like six months of time where it felt like all of us like had our backs to each other and we were just like fending off yeah. like people like just like ah, ah, ah like ah. you know and and it was always and and it and I think that like listen the major cultural difference between the two I think now that you know talking this out is the 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 true to form like Louis oversaw the gym but I wouldn't classify him as like a leader in a training group at the time that I was there. Now, he may have been at some point. Yeah, uh, younger, you know, like, yeah. I would say, like, after yeah. Louis turned about 60 years old, he couldn't do it. I never saw so him. Much. I never saw him yeah. squat. I was there at the end. Like, I, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. So it's different yeah. for me. We had a clear cut, like, the guy. And that makes it easier to just fucking close your eyes and follow. Like, I mean, what am I I had say? that with Chuck, too. So, like, it was, like, this example. Like, I had the Chuck to look up to. That's why I trained with him, because he was the best, dude. That You know, you'd see him mm-hmm. at the Arnold Classic coming out, blistering 1,150-pound squats when that was unheard of at the time. And he was just doing things. He had the deadlift, didn't have the bench, but we know he didn't have a bench because he broke his neck. You know what I mean? It wasn't because he couldn't yeah. bench. Yeah. Um, so you're like, well, he's got stuff there, too. You know, I learned a lot of stuff from him um, in bench pressing that people probably wouldn't even understand it's just like um what louis says you run with the lame you'll develop a limp Mm -hmm. and that's that's true (laughs) i feel like also like because i knew we knew that dave was gonna do that 3100 like we knew that he was gonna do that that was not surprising to fucking any one of us we knew it was something big it was kind of funny because like (laughs) we were all like because yeah, the we, like no the, shit. three weeks before that meet, I'm like Louis. I think I'm gonna total 3100. He goes, "The hell you what?" Like I'm like my best total was 3014, and I'm just like, "Dude, I've done all these numbers in the gym, and they all equal 3100." And he was just like, "Dude, out of, get the fuck out of here." We, like, we, we he'll he'll listen to me total 3000, but he's not gonna hear it. Like, dude, come on, like just stop it. We, like, we we knew it was gonna happen, and I think that part of the the also the the change in culture is like. All of my totals in the morning belonged to me, and I think that certain people helped me get them, right? But, like, they're my fucking totals, and I did them, and Lou helped me push along or whatever until he didn't. And I think that any total that's gone on in our group with the night crew, like, that 3,100, like, we all helped him do that. We all were there for all those training sessions. We were training till 11 o'clock at night and fucking do like, we all did that. Like my 25 shoe box. Cause at the time the doghouse hadn't expanded. So we were in this little shoe box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was like, it, it mean, I mean, it was maybe not, not much bigger than mm-hmm. this little square area. We, we all, it, it felt like, it felt like when like we he, went back to Demarest or something. Yeah. That's what it well, sounds that's like. What, that's what you said too. I remember we were standing in the parking lot and he said like, this is like, just, we're going to take all the good stuff. And we're gonna have it, right? And, and we're gonna take all the good stuff from West Side, and we're gonna have our own fucking thing, you know. And that 
like like my like my first 2500 pound total everybody had a piece of that Kovacs world record everybody had a fucking piece of that you know like Val's meets Kellen's meets Logan me Zachers, me, winning the these, WPOs winning like, the, like when I could win a belt us. when I would win a belt it was like we always take this picture you know me holding the belt and there was a big group of us and it was like it takes an army like at the point I'm at like dude I can't like I need all them yeah. like loading my plates wrapping my knee it's just like I, I'm not high maintenance but it takes it, it I need some help I need some good help everyone's aware of I think everyone's aware of that too. So it's like what Dave brought to the group was like the experience, the fucking biggest numbers of all time. And like this thing that he believed that we could do awesome shit. Right. And what we brought was setting up the chains and loading the fucking plates and spotting him and making sure that no one ran their fucking mouth about him without getting told something. And so we had this like really tight knit group and it was just like, we said it like there's only one west side man you know there'll never be another one like that can't be duplicated because louis is west side and yes there, that just can't be duplicated but man it sure felt like <laughs> like the year 2004 you know like mm-hmm. it just kind of felt like Dude, showing that up, it, showing up to fucking wpo like as a group and just it was shut off like, you know like you know like the old west side nobody was yeah. going in there nobody bothered you it was just like it was us first the world um it was just it kind of it was like I went back in time, kind of and reconnected with the past, and that's kind of like what pulled me through that whole time. It was fucking sick, dude. Like, I, like the, like you try to be present in times where, like, the good old days when they're happening. Like that was a time where I look back on it, and it's like I got to be a part of something that fucking mattered. Sometimes like, you don't know the good. You don't. You don't know you're in the good old days. We were, you know, it was yeah. happening and we were like sitting there just like, like everyone, dude, like he, when he benched, what did you bench at WPO and ESPN? What was it? It was like 1014, 1014 biggest, biggest bench in full power meet at that time. Like what? And everyone in the back room was like, cause they had TVs. Everybody in the back room was like, oh, everyone's like, oh, 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 like all this when he does it. And me and Kovacs just started laughing cause we knew he was going to do it. It was not. And, and it felt like we, everybody kind of like carried their own part of that. And, and and like with the different WPOs, like I'll put it out there right now, like Night Crew is undefeated in WPOs. There has not been a WPO since it come back that a person from from fucking Night Crew has not been in first place. And the first meet that he didn't do because he got a pass because he won, I fucking won. So like we are undefeated. And if it's WPOs. so easy, why don't you just come win it then? It feels good to say that. Like our team is fucking undefeated. If you don't like the guy that won it, maybe you should come win it. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of sit there and complain, well, if I went to this meet, I'd out totaled him. It's like, but you didn't. You stayed at home like a bitch, and you and you lost. Mm-hmm. What is? It? Where is it? Where is the movie at now? As far as the process? So uh, I, I, I had to call him before I came on here. I was like, what am I allowed to say? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, tell them that it's nearing completion. Basically, the movie's done. Mm-hmm. Um, he's been in, so he just had a kid, so uh, his daughter kind of takes takes time away from that. But it, a lot of the, he said pretty much the editing's done. It's about an hour and 38 minutes. Um, it follows me, Anthony, Chanel Nole, and I think Bob Merck is another one that's in it. Um uh, essentially, he said it's a pumping iron format. Um, it'll k- kind of reminisce reminisce of that. Um, the storytelling's a little different from West Side versus the World, so it's not it's not that type of a movie, but it's it's more in a cinema setting, meaning it's got story to it as well as like reality. So the, it, there'll be like reality clips, and then it might break away into some kind of side story or something. Um, but what he was telling me is. The movie is essentially done. Uh, there's no definitive release date. He doesn't want to put a, um, a what do you say? I don't want to put a deadline on it yet uh, because of the, all the shit that happened with West Side versus the World where, yeah. you know, things things just kept fucking happening, dude. And I'm sure and I'm sure you can have him on here and he'll uh, yeah. go through all that crazy shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it was like the movie, that, dude, like everything came against that movie. Like everything. Like that movie should have never seen the light of day, but somehow it did. And... um. I'm trying to think of like things that, like neither of us have seen it. I've he- I've like so heard little clips and stuff, but we haven't I, like seen. I the, haven't the... seen. Uh, yeah. So he he's posted. He'll send me some like clips of us talking or something. But it, it essentially starts in 2018 at the Orlando WPO when the WPO first came back, and it follows us all the way through. It goes through t- 2019 when we do the ESPN stuff. It goes through all that. Um. 
um, and it, and it, and it briefly touches the last few years because the pandemic kind of fucked everything yeah. up. It fucked everything up for everything, you know. So we, the, there was it. It just took. It just got drawn out, and then uh, stories. See, Michael says when he starts with a movie, he has an idea of what he wants to do, and then he starts filming, and then people that were supposed to be good weren't good, and people that <laughs> were supposed to come through and do things didn't do things. So then the movie changes, and um, I was supposed to not really be in it. He told me like at WPO in Orlando, uh, he said he saw me and he's like, this kid's like cool to film. I wish he was a better lifter because I have him <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> so so c- luckily I got better at lifting <laughs> weights. <laughs> so, so yeah, it goes through, it goes through 1920 and, um, uh, basically I'm going there next Thursday. We're going to do, uh, I got to fly down to Tallahassee and we're going to do some of the final stuff for it. Like the, the, basically what you would see at the end of the movie. If you saw the end of West side versus the world right before the, uh, the credits come out, you see hear me talking and stuff like yeah. that. It's, it'll be like basically tying up the movie. Michael will make the movie. Uh, he'll get, do all of our interviews and the movie comes together and there'll be pieces and parts of where he's got to kind of like, okay, I need more of this and I need more of you on this subject. And then we'll do an interview and then piece it in there. Um, I know, I know he's talking about having a narrator. It is a special narrator, uh, better than Ron Perlman. I'm, I'm sorry, I won't say anything else, Michael. <laughs> but it's it'll be substantial if this narrator comes around. Everybody knows who he is. Um, it's going to be a badass. I think it's going to be badass. I, I think it's going to shed light on some stuff. He that... said it's really intense, so it's not like this happy story. It's it's just like he breaks it off no grease, like right from the like 30 seconds in. It's like, holy shit. Like, and it's like that for the whole movie. So um, he said it's there's a lot of intense. There's intense moments. He gets in in some... Uh, some really cool moments that have happened in the past. You know, you know, one of them was Matt Minuth. He blew his bicep off in the 2018 WPO and he needed a 675 mm-hmm. deadlift to win the meet and total 26, nine, 26, 27, nine, 10. 27. Yeah. To break the 242 world record. He missed it. He, he pulled it to the top and drops it. And I was having a turbo bad day, dude. Like my back was all fucked up and I was not having a good day. And, uh, uh, it kind of shows you how close Matt Muniz gets to beating me in that one. And so there's this thing between me and Matt there. And um, it just goes through meets. You, you just see uh, my 3100 is on there. The whole, the whole, that was a really cool experience because it was kind of surreal because the meet itself being on ESPN, like it, it was going to be on ESPN. But when it actually happened, we're like, there is an ESPN truck right over there. Mm-hmm. There is guys with ESPN microphones over here. And it's, this is real. And uh one of the best post game interviews of all time. Oh shirtless shirtless Dave Hoffs in this so <laughs> like you usually have to pay for this. Yeah, that, was, <laughs> that was fun. That's so good. But um <laughs> it was just kind of like a a surreal thing when it all it from so what's cool is you see the ESPN side of it, like from the front, but there was a whole camera crew there the whole day. So like any time I walked from the platform to the back, where the ESPN cameras cut off, Michael's camera crew caught it from there. So like that day especially is like the most filmed powerlifting meet of all time. He was mm-hmm. at uh, he had people at um the semifinals too. Like all of the WPO yeah. meets, he's had like people there. It's really cool, man, because it's like a snapshot of this time. It's like your football highlight film. You go yeah. back and we watch fucking it. have the the good old days. Are like we got it. Document. I try to tell you know, people this, cool. and I tell like when you know when when we were making the West Side movie, you don't realize that like you're in it while you know, and I try to tell them this. I'm like, dude, when you go back and watch it, you're gonna realize that you were in it. Like you, that that is the time. Like in like what yeah. the and uh, sometimes the time isn't this. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not this romantic. Uh, <laughs> It's just every. It's just day to day, man. It's just day to day, and day to day is business. And like once you like, and things just incredible things happen along the way, and it's just a really cool. It's crazy how that five years. It took us five. We're pushing almost six years on this one. It took us five years to do the West Side movie. So, it's crazy. I feel like I feel like when that whole thing started, I was like a like a kid almost you know what i'm saying i was already in my 30s but i feel like i look back on it i see the little clips and i'll look at like my old 
videos from other past WPOs in that time frame. And look it's how like, fat I'm not. I was, <laughs> I'm like, what happened to me? I look at it and I'm like, damn, dude, like I wasn't even married in that fucking yeah. video. You know what I mean? Like just little things like that. So I'm really excited about it. And I'm, I'm excited that like people are going to get to all of those fucking AMAs that I've done and all this shit. And people always ask all these fucking crazy details and all this shit. Well, you're going to get a chance to, to it's hear pretty it. cool. There's a reason why. I haven't been super open about super certain things that all of it's on there. Yeah. Like everything. So they're going to learn. They're going to know why we're not shit We've talked about. Uh, Yeah. yeah. But to another degree, like you're going to say stuff that we've talked about off camera. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of off camera stuff that we've talked about uh, will be on there. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, it'll just tie everything together. Any questions anybody was ever wondering, you're going to know. Yeah. Um, We don't flambast anybody, but we tell what happened. So, Mm -hmm. You're allowed to tell the truth about you're things, allowed even to tell the negative, you know, yeah, because it happened. So there's yeah. stuff, and and honestly, like I've uh, with, with 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 the West Side stuff, it, it's weird because you end up everybody's got those like subtle negative feelings. But I'm you know without that situation, I wouldn't be sitting here with you guys, and I wouldn't have a good friend in Dave, and I you know like I wouldn't have a relationship yeah. with you, and and so I'm super grateful for it, and I'm I'm uh, I'm hoping that the the movie just like sheds light on on everything that's gone on and gives people fucking perspective of what it takes to do this at this level and what it takes to do what he does and how what he does is is a different experience from what I've done and how like powerlifting can be whatever the fuck you want it to be and you can experience it in your own way and there's all this stuff that goes on under the hood that I think it'll be really awesome for people to see and I think it'll show it'll humanize a lot of us to to where like people see you know they might see a still picture of dave coming off of a bench and yelling death kill motherfucker and they see a still of me with a tattooed head screaming and fucking yelling and banging my head on the bar and stuff and think that we're just some fucking stupid meatheads right and i think that this sort of film is the type of thing that can humanize us and, and let people know that like we're not just doing this because we're big, dumb, and strong. Like, we have a purpose and, and that this stuff really means something. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah. But for me, like, you know, this means a lot to me and it means a lot to me to be a part of this sport in this capacity. So I'm really excited that people will be able to see that in like a HD. Yeah, that's a really good way. That's a good description of it. Basically, in, in a nutshell, Michael essentially makes compares and contrasts um, what somebody like me goes through, my mentality, kind of over my shoulder, the things I deal with, what I go through, how I deal with them, opposed to somebody like him. The, the the dynamics are different, you know, the numbers are different, the the positions we are are different. And then you throw somebody in like Chanel Nolet, who's a, who's a, I mean, she broke her arm and I don't want to, oh, oh, sorry, Michael, yeah. but she breaks her arm in the movie. You see it, you, you see some shit in this movie. Like you're like, he's like, I got to capture the audience for the first 30 seconds. In. They're very, that fucking... I remember when that happened. I was at that meeting. My parents were at that meeting. They were like, "Oh Jesus God!" <laughs> you yeah. know. And then, yeah, you know, that was a pretty. Then, then she goes out there and blow. No, she blows her knee in the squat. Yeah, and then comes and goes to the hospital. I realize, well, you know, I can't really do anything. I'm just going to go back and see if I can bench. Wraps her knee up, lays down a bench. Boom! Blow, breaks her arm in half. That was like a string, honestly. Like over the course of the next like six months, there were like four chicks that broke her arm, their arm, and and uh, <laughs> there's a handful of them. Yeah, it's it's wild, dude. It just kept happening. It was like roughly the same number, like high threes, low fours. Val started getting forearm pain. We got an MRI and all that shit. We were so scared. This of it. is where we started figuring out. Like this is how I started. Things like that actually started making me figure out how to train women better. Because their bones aren't the same as ours, uh, you can give them weights. Like, yeah, we we can give them weights, you know. But you start. I started finding out that bench shirts give bitches. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> excuse me. Give ladies stretch fractures in their in their forearms and stuff. So, um, uh, gotta be wicked my, careful. Uh, Kellen, my girl, she had she had stress fractures in her forearms and stuff. She's like, man, I can't I can't bench right. I feel like my arms are breaking. It's like, well. And we got an x-ray, stretch fracture. So it's like, you know, when you have a stretch fracture and you keep putting weight mm-hmm. on that, that causes, you can break your arms real easy after a while. So it's just like it, the bone becomes bruised, you know, after you keep sitting there trying to like, it's like a splinter off your bone. Yeah. So we saw a bunch of them. It's a fucking crazy thing to, the, this sport's so wild. I wish more people would, I hope this movie oh. shows like how crazy it is. You, you know? just made me think of something. What is it? How cool the WPO is about ready to be. 
Yeah, really can we fuck. pump that? Can we pump that? Really yeah. fucking cool. It's going to be rad as fuck. Yeah. Rad. I'm I don't very, say that word, but yeah. yeah. I'm very excited about it. So um, essentially, um, the W. So the, some changes have happened this year, and I think they're great. Um, Wayne um, got partnered up with the Olympia. And now we have we from what he's telling me, the semifinals will be removed. So there won't be an American semifinals. They'll be selected to do the American Super Finals, which is now at the Olympia. Uh, so the Olympia uh, Expo, it moved from Vegas to Florida. Yeah. And now they have it down there in Orange County, Florida, Orange County Convention Center. And um, what what happened? What's different this year than most other years is he's added a guy. I can't pronounce his name. His name's like Estuablo. He's from Portugal. And uh, they're running a, a European, Euro-Asian uh, WPO semifinals in, out there in Portugal. So now the WPO is overseas. It's going to start influxing um, foreign lifters. That's kind of been the thing that's been missing. If you think back to like 04, 05, 06, you had, you know, Ukrainians. And that might be difficult now. But you had, um, you had just a lot of Euro- strong Europeans that were in there, a lot of the Finns and stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, so that's going to give us an influx. They're going to have a semifinals for Europe, essentially, the other side of the world. And they'll take the top 15 out of the out of overseas, and they will get a bid to the Olympia Superfinals, and that'll be in 2024. So it'll be essentially America versus the world. Yeah. And uh, you'll actually have different people you're competing against. So the, the roster will grow, the level I think once you get a couple years in, uh, when you get some guys over there, I mean, you, you know those Europeans. They're big squatters, big deadlifters. And uh, I think you're going to start seeing a lot of that start to come come back in. Um, another thing uh, would be the bull farm. So um, I'm really good friends with uh, Yanni and Mina. Uh, his name's Yanni. I can't pronounce his I'm so sorry, European Finnish people. I can't pronounce your last name. I think it's the <laughs> Inh- In- Inhalen is his name. He is the owner of Bull Farm Gym. So when I went over there in 2016, they had the Nordic Fit Expo, and I did a uh, bench press meet only. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And um, he had 15 grand, 16 grand for first place. So I remember I did one bench press and won 16 grand in Finland. And so that guy has partnered up with Wayne. And they're going to run uh, 2024. They're doing a bench bash in Finland. Uh, and Yanni's going to help run that one. So the, it, it's just starting to expand and getting bigger. I think what slowed all this stuff down looking back it was the pandemic. Because uh, I remember they, they were talking to me about, like, that's the direction they wanted to go. And, dude, the pandemic literally threw everything off two years. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, the whole year was just kind of like a fuck all year. And then the next year was like recovery year. And then, like, year three is like, okay, we're back to normal. Kind of here we go. So um, I think a lot of the new stuff you're going to see is uh, you're going to see more money come into it. I know that there's a lot of uh, sponsors from Europe that are really interested in it, that want to pump into the WPO. So I think things like prize money are going to get better. I think the level of competition will get better. The number of lifters will get better. Um, so, yeah, just cool stuff. You're going to have a bench bash. Uh, and if you're scared, real bench press if you're meet. scared, you should go to church and not show up. Yep, and I know the bench bash meet is a uh, is is real bench press shirts. So if you want to wear a real bench press shirt and go to Finland, I invite everybody, <laughs> every single last one of you. <laughs> we're not oh. subtle. No, oh. we're not subtle. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it's gonna be it. awesome. It shit takes time, dude. And yeah. they've, they've done a really good job putting it together. And I think that, like, there's people kind of don't understand what it's like to put together. a Like, when you have people who have never put together a single local meet complaining about how the WPO is run, it's fucking goofball shit. Because it's like, bro, running a local meet is it's a fucking still here, dude. And nightmare. Yeah. And it's still, think about the Power Station pro for a second. They were around two or three years gone. Yes. You know what I mean? We're in year, I'm in year six. So this will be belt number six if I can get this one. And, uh, this is my sixth uh, or whatever. I've done every single one. Six of them. finals. That's super finals. And then there was two semifinals. So yeah. there's been like eight or nine WPO meets. So that's kind of what I'm passing on to people. It's still here and it's not going anywhere. Um, so get on board or get ran over. How many weeks out are you now? Uh, 16. I was going to say 18. Yeah, something like that. 16. 16 weeks? Yeah, 16. So it's, 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 it's it'll come good, quick, yeah. dude. This came quick because, you know, after I was telling you I was in Power Shack doing a lot of stuff, and before I knew it, it was like, oh, my God, it's time to train. It's got to do stuff. Mm-hmm. Then I come visit around. I'm like, I'm strong. I remember. It's like, let's, let's do <laughs> it. I told all the homies back 
back home because we just came back from Utah at APF Nationals and traveling out there. You know how it is. It's a yeah. fucking nightmare. We're there for a week and I had a bunch of lifters out there from the gym and it was sick. But I told him, I was like, all right, <clears throat> I'm doing this. Came back, trained for like two days and then I'm, I, we drove out here. And I was like, when I get back, it's fucking, the pedal is down. Because I got a, one of the kids in our group, or one of the guys in our group is, um, he's doing the meet with us, this dude, Connor. Um, and I'm like, when I get back, like, it's go time. So this is my last little, like, we're going to bench tonight and, it's, you know, nothing crazy. And then it's, when I get back on Friday, it's like, it's The time stakes to get, go get yeah, higher the yeah. closer time you get. It's time to fucking you know? go. So it's time to set the alarms to go to bed early and eat and all that shit. Train. I'm excited. Yeah. Real thing. Anything else you guys want to promote? Can I pump some of my stuff? Yeah. yeah so uh, I have a subscription website that does uh, programming and stuff. It's uh, just patreon.com slash trigger warning conjugate. It's on my Instagram, uh, trigger underscore warning underscore conjugate. And uh, we started doing this thing where <clears throat> uh, we do vlogs for uh, the New Hampshire night crew where we... Uh, my wife does a fucking awesome job editing all these videos down and we do, um, like goes over the training. I do voiceovers for everything and shows everybody what we're doing. And more importantly, it shows them why I have different guys do different things. So I think it's a good teaching point for people and you can get access to that for like fucking four bucks a month or something. It's really cheap. Um, so the links in, in that and, uh, and then also we started doing a, um, like an email drop for people. You can get it at TWC state eight twcstayhated.com um and if you sign up for the email list uh all the content gets email it's free it's not scammy it seems so fucking weird to say email like it just seems like this weird thing it's not it's like uh all of the mental monday and workout wednesdays all get shot directly to you and you also get early access to all of the apparel drops so you don't have to message me pissed off because i'm out of xls because you'll get there in time. <laughs> uh and so that's really cool and i'm still taking on uh i've kind of stopped taking on um my mid-range uh clients so it's basically either the patreon page or the the high level and if anybody has any questions just holler at me i fucking really excited uh in the direction that trigger warning is going it's all powerlifting has given me everything in my life that's worth having I, I like the fucking that's how i met my wife that's how i bought my business that's how i've paid my bills that's how i've met almost all of my best friends i owe everything to this sport so i'm trying to do my best to not only like support myself and my family because i got to pay my bills but also give back in a way that's um productive so that the next generation of lifters knows what the fuck's going on and, and knows who people are and they hear the names like you know the gestures and rogeria and, and smith and all the, and they know who the you know grandic and all these they hear this content and they get to to learn about the people who kind of la laid the groundwork for them that aren't the super huge names like louis and yourself and hoff and all this and so i think it's important to uh, kind of pass that stuff along and other than that, man, I just want to thank you for having me on again, man, because it's still it's crazy that I'm here. It still feels no, wild. Thank you, guys. So your links are in the description, by the way, for those guys. I yeah, I don't, it. I don't have anything cool. I don't sell. I don't have. You any do cool. You, you make a cool post stuff. every four months. Yes, <laughs> well, I do that so people, so people know that they're not going to win the meet. You know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe if Hoff True has a, if Hoff has a bad day and I have the best day of all time then maybe I'll win. It's like, I try to tell people that it wasn't always like that. I had to like get here to be able mm -hmm. to waste people like that. Like that, <laughs> like that didn't happen overnight. I, I'm sorry. Like, so I'm not going anywhere. I'm still training. Uh, if you want to talk to me, n social media is probably not a good place to find me because I don't. If yeah. you want to get to Hoff, you need to come to the gym or, like, or or message the Oracle. Yeah, the, I call yeah. the Oracle. If you want to come visit me in Ohio, message him in New Hampshire, and he will give you. We can do okay. some. We can figure some something out if I feel like co-signing you. Yeah, I don't mind visitors. So if, you know, the best way to get in front of me is to just come visit. Like the, I'm, I'm kind of like Louis in that aspect. I don't, I don't really like typing mm -hmm. on a computer and making posts and stuff. It's just not really, I kind of make like a, Hey, I'm still here and you're not going to win post. <laughs> but uh, well, but other right. than that, and, you know, all right. And that works. Thank you guys for coming out. Yeah, man. Thanks. Um, time we'll have you back out after the meet to be able to recap. Yeah, I'll bring you the new belt and show, so, yeah, show you the new, new one. So it'll be what? Five, right? six, six, six. six. And we're done. Hell yeah. Yeah.